The Mystery Playhouse, a rebroadcast for the service men and women of the United Nations. Good evening. This is Peter Lauren. The circumstances leading up to horror and tragedy are many times as innocent seeming as a Sunday school picnic and the perpetrators of evil appear often as ordinary, normal human beings. Yes, but they are capable of conceiving acts of diabolic destruction, as you will hear tonight in the Mystery Playhouse. Listen now to Mr. Boris Karloff in Those Who Walk in Darkness. We look in on a scene taking place in a private room at Bayside Hospital. A man with heavily bandaged eyes lies restlessly in a bed. At his bedside are his wife, Valerie, a nurse, and a famous eye surgeon, Dr. Paul Wade. Dr. Wade looks strangely and intently that is patient before he speaks. The dressings at midnight and again in the morning, nurse. Yes, doctor. Well, doctor, what did you find? Will I be blind? Is it very bad? Now, now, take it easy, Mr. Denton. There's nothing to worry about. Nothing at all. You... You're sure? You aren't just saying that. I'm quite sure. Valerie... Valerie, did you hear that? I... I'm not going to be blind. Valerie? Valerie, where are you? Right here, darling. Did you hear? I won't be blind. Isn't that wonderful? Yes, darling, it's marvelous. You... You don't sound very excited. Valerie, don't you realize I'm going to see again? She doesn't sound excited because I don't want you to be excited, Mr. Denton. You've got to relax. Try to sleep. Sleep? With this ungodly pain? My eyes feel as though they were on fire. That will stop as soon as the opiate I gave you takes hold. You'll be comfortable, I'm sure. Now, good night. You're going now, Doctor? Yes, I'll... I'll look in on... on your husband in the morning. Stephen. Yes, Valerie? Do you mind if I step out into the corridor for a moment? But you... you promise not to leave me. I, I'm afraid, Valerie. Everything's so dark, I... The nurse will be here, dear, if you want anything. I just want to ask Dr. Wade some questions. Questions? But he's already told us that... Yes, you... Stephen, I know. But I'd like to find out about the treatment and how I'm to take care of you when we get you home, you know. Just little things. All right. But... but hurry back, I... I want you near me. I will, dear. Uh, good night, Mr. Denton. Good night, Doctor. And thank you. You're quite welcome. After you, Mrs. Denton. Thank you. I suggest we step into the consultation room across the hall. We'll have more privacy. All right. Here we are. Thank you. Well, it's been a long time, Valerie. Yes, Paul, it has. Almost ten years, isn't it? About that. 
strange that you should have called me, of all people, to treat your husband's eyes? Oh, I, I was panicky, Paul. I didn't know what to do. It all happened so suddenly. Stephen was working in his laboratory at the house when suddenly I heard a violent explosion. I ran in and found him clutching his eyes and screaming, I'm blind. First thing I thought of was an ambulance. Then you... Why didn't you think of me ten years ago? It's not fair, Paul. Was it fair to turn your back on me and then to marry a man almost twice your age? Paul, please, why bring up ancient history? It isn't ancient history to me. I've never forgotten you. Paul... About Stephen's eyes. What about them? I have a feeling that you weren't telling him the truth. You're right. Oh, you mean he's not going to regain his sight? He's going to be blind? Oh, Paul. You don't expect me to be to be terribly concerned, do you, Valerie? After all, he did take you away from me. Don't be vindictive, Paul. It wasn't Stephen's fault. He didn't even know of your existence. And you never told him that we were on the point of being married? No, never. <laughs> it's rather ironic that we should meet again at the bedside of my rival, your husband, a man who may forever walk in darkness. Don't say that, Paul. It's horrible. But unfortunately true. A moment ago, you told me not to be vindictive. I'm not, really. But if I were, I could have my fill of vengeance if I told him about us. And then told him that he'll be blind forever. You wouldn't, Paul. Or I might take another form of revenge. I could tell you that an operation is called for. A very delicate operation. Are you trying to say that there might be a chance? Yes. But supposing I refuse to perform the operation. Paul, you're joking. You can't mean that. Perhaps not. But you call me vindictive. Suppose I operate. And my scalpel slips. What if he dies? That would be murder. You're not a murderer, Paul. You wouldn't risk your professional reputation. Why must you torment me this way? You really love him, don't you? Yes, I do. Then forget the things that I've been saying. I want you to think of me as a friend. I want you to trust me. I do trust you, Paul. Thank you. Now as to the possibility of surgery. Here is the situation. The transparent film over your husband's eyes, the corneas, were burned and torn with the explosion. They've been so damaged that blindness will result, even though the eyes heal. But you think an operation would cure that? Possibly, although it's a very delicate job. The injured cornea must be peeled away and replaced by a fresh, healthy one. Where can you get healthy corneas? From the eyes of the dead. Oh. It isn't quite as horrible as it sounds, Valerie. You know, dying peace, people often will their eyes for just this purpose. We maintain what we call a corneal bank. It's much the same as a blood bank, only but there's this difference. Corneal tissue can't be stored more than 48 hours. It must be fresh. Or it's no good. You have some available in the bank? No, that's the trouble. I'm afraid we haven't. But there's got to be some, Paul. I don't know where, Valerie. Unless... Unless what? I was just thinking. Last night, one of the interns asked me to look at a charity case that puzzled him. He lives in a dirty little shack near the waterfront. Yes, Paul? I stopped by and examined him. I found an incurable condition. There's no way to save him. He won't live more than a day or two, but his eyes are healthy. You mean, you think he might... I don't know. You'd have to have his consent, of course. Take me to him, Paul. I'm sure I can make him understand. Oh, it may not be so easy, Valerie. He's a strange person. A mystic and a spiritualist. Let me try. Just take me to him. All right. We can go there now. live down here, Paul. Wet streets and fog rolling in from the river. And shudder. You'd be surprised where people are forced to live. 
That's the house over there. That, that gray shack. Does he live alone? No. There's a toothless old woman, I don't know where he picked her up, who keeps house for him. She's rather hideous and, I suspect, a bit demented. So don't be frightened when you see her. I'll try not to be. Here we are. There's no bell. Those fog horns are giving me cold shivers. Yes, they do sound eerie. Here comes the old woman. We'd like to see Chandra, please. You can't. He's getting ready to go away. Chandra's going on a long journey. Yes, we know. We'd like to see him before he leaves. We are friends of his. Eh? I said we are friends of Chandra. I was here last night. Don't you remember? All right. Come in. His room's at the end of the hall. You know the way. I have to stay here by the stove. I'm cooking something. Yes. Something for Chandra's journey. I see. Come, Valerie. <laughs> Something for Chandra's journey. Paul, oh, she's ghastly. But harmless, I'm sure. Here. This is the room. Hmm. Dark in there. Yes, but there's a lap burning. But the wick is dark. I'll turn it up. There, that's better. Paul, there on the cart. Is he alive? Yes, still alive. Chandra. Chandra. Who calls Chandra? It's Dr. Way. You remember me? I was here last night. Yes. Chandra remembers, but it is too late. I am going away on a journey. I know. That's why I've come. I've brought a young lady with me, Chandra. She has a favor to ask. Chandra has no favors to grant. Soon I will start to the other side. Let her tell you what she wants, Chandra. Now go ahead, Valerie. Chandra? Well? Chandra, my husband suffered an accident. An explosion. His eyes. Oh, Paul, I can't. You tell him, please. All right. Can you hear me, Chandra? I hear you. Now, this young lady's husband just lost the sight of both his eyes. He'll be completely blind unless I perform an immediate operation. Unless I take parts of two healthy eyes and place them on him. He's asking... That you give her your eye. Do you understand? I understand I am visited by those who would rob me. But you're going to die anyway. Die? No, you are wrong. There is no death. I am going on a journey. Please. Please help me, Chandra. No. I will need my eyes. I will need them to see into the great beyond. To guide me through eternity. The eyes are the windows of the soul. I'll give you anything you ask. I'll... No. No, I said no. No, I... Oh. Oh. Something's happened. He's dead. Then it's all right. You can take his eyes. No, I can't. He refused you. Paul, listen to me. A doctor's first duty is to the living. To heal them, to make them whole. What responsibility have you to this... this lifeless thing? It's a matter of professional ethics, Valerie. Paul, you've got to do it. For me. Blindness would drive Stephen out of his mind. He's always hated the dark, like a little boy. Paul, please. It wouldn't be right, Valerie. It's a matter of life and death, not right or wrong. Paul. Paul, you have your surgical kit with you. Yes, but... Paul. Paul, please. I beg you. All right. Close the door. Oh, 
Well, it's good to be home again, Valerie. That hospital room was beginning to get me down. It's going to be even better once the bandages are taken off. Yes. Just another week, that's what Wade said. Oh, he's a good doctor, Valerie. I I like him. I'm glad. Imagine being able to see again after all these weeks of darkness. I've never liked the dark. (laughs) Why, it will be like coming into a new world. Yes. Tell me, what sort of an operation was it, Valerie? Well, I... I don't know. You don't... You sound like you're trying to hide something. Oh, don't be silly, Stephen. Uh, oh, that must be Paul. <laughs> Dr. Wade, no. I, I'd better let him in, Stephen. I think Jenny's in bed. Good evening, uh... Mrs. Denton. Good evening, Doctor. Sorry I'm so late, but I had an emergency call. Oh, it's quite all right. Hello, Doctor. Well, how is the patient? Oh, fine, fine, thank you. And anxious to get these bandages off. Patience is a virtue. Yes. But blindness is a curse. Don't be so morbid, Stephen. You're very lucky. Yes. I know I am. Uh, it, it's a warm night, isn't it, Doctor? Yes, a lovely night. Stars and a new moon. They say a new moon's a good omen if you look at it over your left shoulder. Did you know I was superstitious, Doctor? Well, I guess we all are in one way or another. Yes. Oh, would it be all right if we took a short walk in the garden while Valerie makes some coffee? That is, if you have the time, Doctor. Yes, plenty of time. Well, can't I come along? Oh, no, this is a stag party. You, you, you fix some coffee for us like a good girl, and we'll be back shortly. All right. Here, we can go out through the terrace. Here, let me take your arm. Thank you, Doctor. Ah. What a gorgeous night. Yes, isn't it? See how the moon is... I... Oh, sorry, old fellow. I forgot for a moment. That's all right. I, I'll be seeing it soon enough, thanks to you. And now you're seeing it for me. Over my left shoulder, I hope. Why, uh, no. It's the right one. That's bad luck. I... Oh, but you couldn't possibly bring me bad luck, Dr. Wade. Not after giving me back my sight. You'll never know what you've done for me. No? No. You can't possibly know how much it was because you're not in love with Valerie. Uh, Valerie is my life, Doctor. So young, so beautiful. Without eyes, how can I see her beauty? I, I'm getting on in years, you know, and there, there'd be very little left for me if I couldn't look at Valerie and see the warmth of a smile. Oh, I don't expect you to understand that. Nobody can understand it except the one who's in love. Perhaps you're right. It must be very pleasant to see with the eyes of love, even though the eyes are borrowed. Borrowed? What do you mean? Oh, well, nothing. Nothing, really. That's not the truth, Doctor. Shall we keep no, walking? No, no, I want you to explain what you meant when you said my eyes are borrowed. It had something to do with the operation you performed, did it not? Now, look, I won't me. be put off. I told you I was superstitious. Give me back my eyes. <gasps> Who said that? Dr. Wade? Who said what? Give me back my eyes. There. A strange voice. I didn't hear anything. Yes, yes, I heard a voice saying, give me back my eyes. Give me back my eyes. There. There it is again, Doctor. Oh, for the love of heaven, whose voice is it? Tell me. Tell me, I'm blind. I can't see. I think perhaps we'd better go in. Mr. No, Dandy. no, no. I tell you, I heard a voice. Oh, but you're tired. Now, come. But I... Uh... All right. I... I can't understand it. I swear I heard a strange, no other hollow voice. There was no voice, at least. None that I heard. Here we are. Step up. 
That's fine. Back so soon? I think you'd better go right to bed, Mr. Denton. You're tired and unnerved. Yes. Yes, I will. Coffee will be ready in just a few minutes. Oh, I... I think I'll retire, Valerie. Is something wrong, Stephen? He's tired. Oh, Oh, here, let me help you. No, no, don't bother, please. I can find my own way. You stay with Dr. Wade. Doctor, are you sure we didn't hear? I'm positive. I see. Well, good night. Good night. I'll be in shortly, Stephen. All right. What happened, Paul? I'd rather not discuss it. Please, you must tell me. Well, it's... It's something I've been worried about. What do you mean? I haven't brought this up before because... I was hoping against hope... that the thing I feared was not true. Paul, you don't have to hide anything from me. Is something wrong with Stephen? I'm afraid so. I'm afraid the explosion injured his brain as well as his eye. Paul... It isn't going to be easy to take, Valerie. What happened in the garden? He said he heard a strange voice saying, Give me back my eye. Oh, I, I shouldn't be telling you this, Valerie. You're trembling. Oh. I'm thinking of that Hindu, Chandra. You said he was a mystic, a spiritualist. Do you think it's possible that... Oh, no, it couldn't be. No, Valerie. I'm afraid Stephen's brain has been affected. And the horrible part of it is that I'm convinced the complete insanity will set in eventually. Stephen! I heard what you said, Doctor. Oh, Stephen! It's all right, dear. Stephen, darling. Come back into the bedroom, Mr. Denton. I want to talk with you. No, Valerie. You stay out here. Or better yet... Go and get me some hot water. Hot water? Yes, I, I think I'll change these bandages and uh, I'll want the water boiled. So watch it for at least six minutes. Very well. I'll, I'll go to the kitchen. Now, Mr. Denton, shall we go into your room? It's no use, Doctor. Let me guide you. There. That's fine. I know you're trying to cheer me up, but I tell you it's no use, Dr. Wade. I understand. I'm going mad. I'm sorry you overheard. After all, I, I could be wrong. Although... Although you know it's true. I may as well be frank with you, Mr. Denton. Give me back my <gasps> eyes. That voice... I tell you, Doctor, I keep hearing that voice. I <laughs> Your imagination is working overtime. Now, I'll get you a sedative. <laughs> Valerie! Oh. Oh, here you are. I thought you were in the kitchen getting some water for me. No, I didn't go. You didn't fool me asking for hot water. Fool you? I'm afraid I don't understand. You monster. You horrible monster. What are you talking about? Get away from that door. Let me go into my husband. Let me tell him. Just a moment. Get your hands off me. Let me go. I should have known right from the beginning. Instead, I trusted you. Had faith in Valerie. Me. Holding me. Make my skin crawl. Valerie, I demand an explanation. You'll get it all the explanation you want. I suspected something wrong when you sent me for hot water. That was just to get rid of me. Get me out of the way for six minutes. But I didn't leave this front room. Now listen. I did listen. The bedroom door didn't quite latch. I saw what you did. He couldn't see you because his poor eyes are bandaged. He's blind. But I saw your lips move, and I heard you say the word. Give me back my eyes. Valerie, will you please let me... If you don't get your hands off me. You unspeakable monster. Trying to drive Stephen mad. Playing on his superstitions, his fear of the dark, of the unknown. To turn him into a raving maniac. Valerie, be quiet. Quiet? Why, you filthy, desperate... <laughs> what was that? Stephen! Stephen! He shot himself. He's dead. Oh, oh, Stephen. <laughs> Valerie. Go away. Go away. Valerie. 
Valerie, it was all for the best. Best? Let me talk to you, Valerie. I can explain everything. You murdered him. I did it for you, darling, for us. Come into the living room and let me explain. You murdered him. Just as if you'd held that gun to his head and pulled the trigger yourself. Please, darling. Wait, leave me alone. Valerie, believe me. I did it to free you from a man who didn't deserve you. I did it so that you could know happiness with me. You're young, Valerie. You have years ahead of you. You're entitled to everything in life. You understand? (laughs) Come into the living room. There. That's it. We're going to be so happy together. Let me close the door and shut out the last memory of what has gone before. Now, our life is before us. Here. Sit down. My head, Paul. I I have a terrible headache. I'll get you some aspirin. Where is it? In Stephen's laboratory. I'll get it. Let me help you. There. I think it's on the middle shelf. Turn the light on, Paul. The switch is on the right. I have it. Let me get the aspirin for you. Uh, I can find them more easily. I've been thinking, Valerie. After this is all over, we're going away on a trip. Perhaps somewhere off in the mountains or... You've got the wrong bottle, dear. That's not the aspirin. No. It's one of Stephen's chemicals. It's acid, Paul. Sulfuric acid. Valerie, put it back on the shelf. That stuff will burn. No, Paul. No, you cold-blooded murderer. You're going to know what Stephen knew before you forced him to take his life. You're going to know what it is to walk in darkness. Valerie. Forever. Down my eyes! Dear my friend, is a young lady who takes literally the old adage, an eye for an eye. Thank you, Boris Karloff and Cast, for keeping our growing reputation for horror quite intact. And now, ladies and gentlemen, if you'll follow me, please, I want you to visit the green room. The players are rehearsing our next performance. Come. Come, come. What do you know about this man, Damery? 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 What Damery? Lord Damery, of course. He's been taking his photograph in all the society weeklies. Well, naturally, the fellow's a household word in society. Mm, yes. He's a man of the world with a natural turn for diplomacy, and he's asked me for a 4.30 appointment, which I've granted. You mean that uh, Lord Damery's coming here, but it's 4.30 now. Look at the message. Oh, yes. Sherlock Holmes and the elementary Dr. Watson, played by Basil Rathbone, and Idle Bruce, respectively, will appear in our next tale of mystery. This is Peter Lorry closing the doors of the Mystery Playhouse. Good night. Sleep tight. This is the Armed Forces Radio Service. International star of stage and screen, 
the master of mystery, Boris Karloff, in Creeps by Night. How do you do? This is Boris Karloff inviting you to join with us for another dramatic exploration into the unknown darkness of the human mind. Our theme tonight is revenge. We have chosen for you a story that plumbs the very depths of one of man's primary emotions. The eternal seeking of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. This is the story of a man who waited 20 long and heartbreaking years before the opportunity came to seek vengeance. But when it did... He stalked his prey with the cold and horrible stealth of a black panther. Creep by Night presents Boris Karloff as George Miller in The Final Reckoning. Our scene is the warden's office at the state penitentiary. A middle-aged man his shoulders hunched and his hair prematurely gray, stands before the warden's desk, clothed in an ill-fitting prison-made suit. His face is yellowed with the pallor of long confinement, but his eyes, set deeply in dark, shadowed hollows, are bright and clear. Looking at him, the warden speaks. Well, I wish you'd reconsider, George. I don't like to see you walk out of here in your condition. I'll be all right, Gordon. I'll be a fool. You've just gotten over a bad case of pneumonia. Why not spend an extra week or so in the hospital? Let Doc Reed put you back on your feet. My time is up at noon today, isn't it? Yes, but we'd glad to. That's when I'm leaving. The moment that noon whistle blows. You're in no shape to travel. Look at you. You're still sick, man. Deathly sick. I've been sick for almost 20 years, Warden. Ever since those iron gates out there closed behind me. I've waited a lifetime for the cure. Planned for it. Now I'm going to get it. You're just being stubborn, George. I don't understand it. You've been a model prisoner in every way. In the entire history of the penitentiary, only three men have had life sentences commuted. And you're one of them. And yet, in a matter that concerns your well-being, you act like an obstinate fool. Why? Because I've got something to do. Something very important. Hmm. What's more important than your health? The thing I've got to do. Wait a minute. Are you going to do something that uh, might land you back in here? Is that it? Don't worry, Warden. You know, come to think of it, George... There's something I've always wanted to ask you. Something personal. Go ahead. In all the years you've been here, why have you refused to see visitors or mail? Why did you completely cut yourself off from the outside world? Well, it... It all boils down to this. A man ages a lot in 20 years. His voice changes and his way of talking. His features change. He becomes an entirely different person. Especially in a place like this. Just knowing that you're hemmed in by four walls. It does something to you. Something... Well, that's the answer. It's no answer at all. Yes, it is. I didn't want anyone to see me age. To see the changes that were coming over me. The way it is now, the George Miller who is walking out of here at 44 is nothing like the George Miller who was brought in at 25. They're two different people. No one outside this prison will ever recognize me. Hmm. And is that what you want? That's exactly what I want. Why? You've got nothing to be ashamed of. You've paid your debt to society. There's another debt I have to pay to myself. It's been owing for a long time. Uh, I don't like the way you're talking, George. What's behind all this? 
20 years, Warden. The best part of my life. A minute ago, you asked me to look at myself. I don't have to look. I can feel it down inside. I'm an old man. An old man at 44. Self-pity is a bad thing, George. I'm not pitying myself. I'm thinking about what brought me here. You've got the record right there in front of you. I said I was innocent then, and it still holds. I'm innocent now. That's a closed book. Why not let it stay closed? Because there's an unfinished chapter still to be written. Remember, you haven't served your full term. You'll be on probation for five years. I'll remember. I've had a long time to think it over. Hmm. Incidentally, while we're at it, there's one more thing that's been puzzling me. You'd better hurry. It's almost noon. Six months ago, when it seemed pretty certain that your commutation was coming through, you made a strange request. You asked to be relieved of the job of running the prison library. A job you'd held as far back as I can remember. And you asked me to assign you uh, as an apprentice to the prison barber. I granted that request, but I, I wondered about it at the time. Would you care to tell me why you suddenly decided to become a barber? I thought it might be a good idea to learn a trade. That's not true, George. The afternoon was hot. That means I'm a free man, doesn't it? Yes. Goodbye, Warden. Take care of yourself. You haven't answered my question, George. You mean... Why did I suddenly decide to become a barber? Yes. I told you. I wanted to learn a trade. And I told you that's not the truth. You're right, Warden. It isn't. George Miller's out. No kidding. Yeah, got his sentence commuted. Did they know? If he does, he better start moving. Charlie, this is Duke. I just got tipped off. George Miller's out. Wonder what Ace will do. You want to hear something, honey? George Miller's out. Boy, would I like to see Ace when he gets on those. Well, what'd you learn? It's two ways. They commuted his sentence. He got out yesterday. Uh, what did I tell you? I spend a hundred grand a year on smart lawyers. And where do I get my information? From a hophead. A bar fly. But Ace. Oh, sure, sure. I'm out of my mind. I don't know what I'm talking about. George Miller's dead. He died in prison ten years ago. Ah. Eh? Well, that's what they told us. Who told you? Our sources of information. Your sources of information. <laughs> don't make me laugh. Now, look at And I'll get out before I lose my temper. If you don't even... out, I said... His sources of information. Barry, get me a drink. Oh, hey, Sonny, don't get yourself all upset. Shut up. Hey, Shut Sonny. up and stay out of this. None of your business. Is that a nice way to talk? Who is this George Miller? I said it's none of your business. What's that? Just a doorbell. I'll answer it. Wait a minute. Now what? Don't open that door till you find out who it is. A ball that... You heard me. Find out who it is first. Okay. Who is it? Who is it? No answer, Ace. Damn. Miller, trying to trick me. Ace, why is the sheet? Take it easy. Keep your voice down. Now listen to me. In case anything happens, he threatened me. I had to protect myself. Do you understand? Yeah, but... Hey, what are you doing with that gun? Never mind. You just follow orders. All right. Open the door. Slowly. Hey, it's coming. Open it, I said. There's nobody here. What's that on the floor? No! What is it? A rat. A dead rat. <laughs> Yeah, somebody left.
left a dead rat outside his door. No, that was yesterday. I mean today. What about today? You got another one? Yeah. It came in a box. In the mail. Holy smoke. Ace is ducking out of town. He's scared stiff. Where's he going? Up to his hideout in the mountains. <laughs> Take the car out of the back, Chuck. Okay, boss. What about the bag, Dave? Chuck, I'll bring them. Come on. How long have you had this place in the mountains, Dave? Oh, a couple of years. Mm. Sure is gloomy looking. Hell, what did you expect? A summer resort? All I want is a place to hold up. Lay low, the boys get Miller. Well, there should be a bell around here. Somebody in the house? Don't you ever get tired of asking questions, Vera? I told you on the way up there's a caretaker. Ah, the bell doesn't work. Well, if you ask me, this is all a lot of crazy... Nobody's asking you. Ace and Nelly running away from a stir bomb. Pipe down. Somebody's coming. Uh, good evening, Mr. Donnelly. Oh, good evening. Is everything all set? Yes, sir. The master bedroom is ready. Now yeah, we'll go right up. This is Miss Carroll. How do you do? Hello. You're not the same man who was here last year, are you? No, sir. That was Edward, my cousin. He's been ill, and I've been substituting for him. My name is... is Walter. Okay. Bring up a couple of brandies. We'll be upstairs. Yes, sir. I sure hate to be holed up in a place like this for the rest of my life. I'll just say the word, and Chuck will drive you back into town. I just kid me, honey. Well, stop it. Right now, I'm not in a kid mood. Okay. Now, there. What's wrong with this room? Well, it's... Very nice. Plenty of space, four closets, double exposure... What more do you want? Nothing, darling. Just the kiss. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Close the door. Since when were you bashful? Now, look, Vera. Get one thing straight. I came up here to play safe. There's a guy gunning for me. Until he's out of the way, I'm not taking any chances. Oh, sure, I understand, honey. What I don't get is why you're so afraid of this George Miller, whoever he is. What did you do to him? Yeah. I think I sent him up, put him behind bars. Did you? You know, one of these days, Barry, you're going to ask the wrong question. I know. It's none of my business. That's the ticket. Did you tell me one thing, Ace? What? Those, um, those dead rats. The one we found outside the apartment door, and the one that came by parcel post in that little wooden coffin. What do they mean? What do you think they mean? I don't know. It's got something to do with George Miller, I guess. Yeah, well, you guessed right. Miller's trying to get me jittery. He knows I've got a bad heart. Planning these things to tell me you think I'm a rat. A dead one if he has anything to do with it. Hey, now, don't worry. I'm safe up here. The boys will get Miller. Yeah? It's Walter, sir, with your brandy. Okay, okay, come in. Uh, just just put the tray down on the table. Yes, sir. Will that be all, sir? I guess so. What about our luggage, Ace? Oh, yes. Did my man bring the bags up? Yes, sir. They're in the hallway, sir. Well, bring them in, will you? Yes, sir. So the water, Ace. Yeah, I'll take it straight. Where shall I put the bags, sir? Oh, just set them down any place. Yes, sir. Will that be all, sir? Yeah. And uh, don't forget to lock up. I won't, sir. Good night. 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 Oh, that yes or no, sir, routine is going to drive me nuts. He talks like one of those fancy movie butlers. Looks like a zombie. <laughs> Here's your drink, honey. Yeah. How about you? No, I better get the bags unpacked first. Oh, the stuff would be wrinkled. Well, here's how. I needed that drink. Now, yeah. oh, maybe I can relax. Sit down and take it easy, honey. You know, it's not going to be so bad staying up here for a week or two. Hey, how do you open this bag, Ace? Which one? Yours. Black leather. Oh, there's a little gadget on the lock. Just press it and it snaps open. You got it? Uh-huh. And we'll get a good rest. Woo! What's the matter? Look! The bag. What? Another dead rat! Talk 
Chuck. Talk, you double-dealing skunk, or I'll spit your skull. Please believe me. I, I didn't do it. I'm sorry. Talk, I said. Spell it. I, I ain't got nothing to spell. Now listen, Chuck. No. I know your kind. No. I know them from way back. You tell your mother for cash on the line. George Miller got to you. No. He paid you to slip that dead rat into my suitcase. No. No. Get out. I don't trust you either. I don't trust anybody. You're all a bunch of blood-sucking double-crossers. Boy. You heard me. You'd like to see me dead, wouldn't you? Get out of your mind. Now get out, both of you. No. Get out, I said. Get out of the house. I stay out. Yeah, who is it? It's Walter, sir, with your brandy. Oh, bring it in. This is the last bottle, sir. Yeah, put it down. Yes, sir. Will that be all, sir? Yeah, yeah, that's all. Who is it? It's Walter, sir. Come in. I thought perhaps you'd like something to eat, sir. It's been three days since you've taken any solid food. Yeah, three days. I brought an omelette and some toast. Oh, thanks, thanks, Walter. Quite all right, sir. Hey, wait a minute. Yes, sir? You were pretty nice to me, Waller. Thank you, sir. Yeah, pretty nice. And I'm the kind of a guy who don't forget. I don't forget if a guy's nice to me. And I don't forget if he stabs me in the back. Neither do I, sir. Come in. I'm sorry to disturb you, sir. Ah, it's all right, it's all right. Come on in and close the door. Yes, sir. What do you got there, Walla? Well, I thought now that you're feeling a little better, sir, that perhaps you'd like to be shaved. It's been almost a week, you know. <laughs> yeah, don't tell me you're a barber, too. I have been a barber, sir. Well, I could use a shave, I guess, all right. If I may say so, sir, I think you'll find it very refreshing. Okay, go ahead. Where do you want me? The chair you're sitting in will be all right, sir. I'll get some warm water in the bathroom. You know, Walter, I've been thinking. When I go back into town, I'm going to take you with me. Yeah, I could use a man like you. That's very kind of you, sir. I like people like you around me. People who don't ask questions of getting your hair. Take care of what you're supposed to, and that's the end of it. I try to keep my place, sir. <laughs> You've got the right idea. Yeah, what well, I do? Lean back? In just a moment, sir. I'll have to fasten the strop to the back of the chair. I want the razor good and sharp. <laughs> well, you'll need it sharp for this beer. Yes, sir. You must have been wondering about me these last few days, Warren. No, sir. Not particularly. You mean you wouldn't like to know why I've been hiding out here in the mountains? I'm sure you must have a good reason, sir. Yeah, you can say that again. Someone's gunning for me. Gunning for you? Uh-huh. Somebody trying to get me. Guy named Miller. George Miller. The name sounds familiar. He got a life sentence for murder about 20 years ago. Yeah, there's quite a story on other papers. He killed a girl. Did he? That's what the jury thought. They gave him first degree with a recommendation for mercy. That saved him from the chair. What did you think? What did I think about what? Lean back, sir. I'm almost ready for you. Hey, isn't that razor sharp enough yet? Not quite. I haven't used it in some time. What did you think about George Miller's conviction, sir? Yeah, what's the difference what I thought? The jury cooked his goose. Did they? Yep. Yeah. Oh, come on, come on. What are you going to shave me get to it? I'm ready now. Lean back, sir. I'll soap you up. Okay. 
I assume this this George Miller is out of prison now. Yeah. Got a commutation. Hey, you sure you don't need a lawnmower to get this beard off? I can do very well with a razor, sir. You know, I'm going to feel like a new man when you get through. Yes, a completely new man. <laughs> ah, you're a funny guy, Walla. You talk like a college professor. I've had a lot of time to read and study in the past 20 years. A lot of time. Yeah? That's enough soap. Now just relax, sir. Does the razor pull? Nope. Feels all right. That's fine. Nothing like a good, sharp razor. Yeah. Now don't move. It's rather difficult shaving you in this chair. If you move, I may cut your throat. That's not funny. It wasn't meant to be funny, Ace. What did you say? Sit back, Ace. One slip and you're finished. You're a dead rat. George Miller. That's right. It's been a long time, hasn't it, Ace? George. George, you wouldn't kill me in cold blood, would you? This isn't cold blood, Ace. This is hot blood, heated for 20 years. That's how long I've waited. Feel how sharp the razor is. No. No, George. Be careful. It doesn't take much to slit a throat from ear to ear. You know that. Yeah, George. George, I'll give you anything you want. Name your price. You couldn't meet it. Only one thing can pay for those 20 years. Hey, George, I've got a bad heart, you know. Yes, so I've heard. All I'm asking for is a break. Did you give me a break when you framed me and set me up for life? I figured you'd beat the rap. I never thought they'd convict you. Then you admit framing me. Yeah, yeah, but I never figured you admit that you killed the Maguire girl because she knew too much, because you wanted her out of the way. Yeah, yeah, but that's I... nothing. It's more than enough. Now feel the razor on your throat. Cutting. No, George. No. Cutting deeper. Down. Deeper. You said you'd be a new man when this was over. But you're wrong, Ace. You're only a dead rat. Who is it? It's there, Ace. I've come back. Come in, Miss Carroll. Oh, hello, Walter. Is Mr. Ginelli... Oh, there he is. You're shaking. Ace, darling... I couldn't stand being away from you. I had to come back. I, cu- I couldn't... Walter, what's the matter with him? Is he asleep or something? I'm afraid not, Miss Callum. Why is he slumped in the chair? Why is his eyes staring that way? Why doesn't he move? He can't move. He's dead. Oh, no. Walter. Yes, he's dead. And my name isn't Walter, Miss Carroll. My name is George Miller. George Miller? George Miller? Yes. Then you... You... You killed him? No, Miss Carroll, I did not kill him. You don't see any blood, do you? But he's dead. He said he was dead. I'm afraid I played rather a gruesome joke on him. You see, I was shaving him with a very sharp razor. After I told him who I was, I held the back of the blade, the dull side, against his throat. (laughs) As you know, he he had a bad heart. Unfortunately, it it couldn't stand the strain. You murdered him? You got the chair for this. You're wrong, Miss Carroll. Quite wrong. Ace Janelli died of a heart attack. That's what a medical autopsy will show. You caused it. You brought it on. That would be very difficult to prove. I figured this out so carefully, Miss Carroll. I paid with 20 years of my life for a murder I did not commit. And now there's nothing the law can do to me. The one that I did commit. Creeps by night, a 
has just brought you Boris Karloff in the final reckoning. Be with us again next Tuesday night at the same time over most of these stations when Mr. Karloff will present another weird mystery of the mind, The Hunt. Night is directed by Dave Drummond. Original music is composed and conducted by Al Sachs. The entire production is under the supervision of Robert Maxwell. We bring you Creeps by Night. International star of stage and screen, the mastery of mystery, Boris Karloff in Creep by Night. How do you do? This is Boris Karloff joining with you once again for another exploration into the unknown darkness of the human mind. Tonight, our story illustrates in terrifying terms the oft-repeated theme of this program. There is no mystery greater than the mystery of the mind. It is for you to decide whether these weird and ghastly happenings were a figment of man's imagination or a tragic reality beyond man's understanding. by night presents Boris Karloff as Loomis Horton in The Hunt. Our scene is the Horton Farm, 50 acres of rich grazing pasture almost on the edge of the Louisiana bayous, a legendary swampland that for centuries was the spawning ground of black magic and voodoo. The night is warm and dark, its heavy silence broken only by the hum of insects, the chirping of crickets, and the occasional deep-throated croak of a bullfrog off in the swamp. Suddenly, the shadowed outline of a human figure appears at the edge of a cypress grove behind the weather-beaten Horton house, and a soft, whistled signal rides the still night air. For a long moment, there is no response. Then, a door at the rear of the house opens quietly, and a girl crosses to the cypress grove. Her eyes searching the darkness. Yes? Right here, Julie. Jeff, you shouldn't have come. He didn't want his black moods tonight. I've got to go right back in. He'll kill me if he finds me here. He won't kill nobody. I'm getting fed up with him ruining your life, Julie. Got a mind to tell him a thing or two. It won't do any good, Jeff. What rights he got keeping you from getting some fun out of living? That's what I want to know. He's my brother. That don't give him no right to pin you up. You ain't one of his stinking sheep. Jeff, please, not so loud. He'll hear you. I don't much care if he does. Please, Jeff. I'll be the one to suffer. Oh, I'm sorry, Julie. When it makes me mad clean through when I think of him treating you the way he does. I want to marry you, Julie, and take you away from here. There's stories going around the village. What do you mean, Jeff? I don't like to say it, Julie, but... The folks are talking about your brother, Loomis. Talking? I don't understand. Well, Buck Peebley and Bill Mason come through here night four last hunting coon. Said they saw Loomis out in the east pasture, digging a grave. A grave? Yeah. He's burying something. You know what it was, Julie? Got any idea? No. I don't, Jeff. But... But what? Oh, I shouldn't be telling you this, Jeff. We won't go no further, Julie. Promise. Hope to die. Well, I... I heard Loomis talking with the hired man. I heard him say something comes out of the swamp at night. Out of the swamp? Yes. 
They don't know what it is. But come dark, Loomis hardly never goes without his shotgun. Uh, Sounds like voodoo to me, Julie. I gotta take you away from here. It ain't healthy. Oh, you can't, dear. Not till I'm 18. Not for two months yet. How am I gonna sit around for two months thinking about you shut up in a house with that crazy man? You got no right to say that, Jeff. I got every right. Digging graves at night. Burying Lord knows what and talking about things coming out of the swamp. I ought to say something to him about all this. You can say it right now. Oh. Uh, Eden, Miss Horton. Get back into the house, Julie. Hold on a minute, Mr. Horton. Get into the house. I'm going, Loomis. Bye, Jeff. Julie, wait. Let her go. You got no right treating her like you do. I got a right to do as I please. She's my sister and she's underage. Now get off my land and don't come back. If I catch you here again, I'll horsewhip you. I don't scare easy, Mr. Horton. No. Perhaps I got something in the house that may change your mind. I'll give you five minutes to get off my land. I'll leave when I'm good and ready and not before. I'm going back indoors for a shotgun. And if you're still here when I come out again, you'll get a load of buckshot. Remember that. Down skunk. Just let me catch him once off his own land. Just once. I'll beat his ugly head off. What the? Sounds like a wolf from me. Well, there ain't no wolves out here. No. I need a wolf crowd. Closer. I'm sneaking through the cypress grove. I wonder what it is. Maybe I better... I'm afraid there's not much I can tell you, Professor Taylor, except that it happened five weeks ago. State police moved in on the case right after the boy's body was found. Frankly, we didn't get very far. It's still an unsolved mystery. I see. Uh, you know, of course, why I'm here, Sergeant. Well, all I know is we had a letter from the state university saying you were coming down to do some research on the case. Yes, yes, exactly. Now, as I understand it, Sergeant, uh, the boy's throat was considerably lacerated. Worse than that. There wasn't any throat left. You're convinced it was an animal? Well, what else could it be? No human could rip a throat open like that. Were there any tracks? No, and the ground was pretty hard. And what stopped us cold was our bloodhound couldn't pick up a trace of scent. No animal scent anyhow. Well, how about human? Well, only the Hortons and the hired man, Andrew. They don't count. Thing happened on Horton land, so naturally you'd expect it. Yes, 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 of course. Uh, tell me, uh, this Horton you mentioned... Uh, Loomis Horton, his name is. Uh, does he keep a dog? A savage dog? No, he won't allow one on the place. We investigated the dog angle, but there uh, isn't one like that in the whole parish. Uh, curious. Very curious. Uh, where is the Horton Farm located, Sergeant? About seven miles out of town. County Road. Did the boy live or work there? No, no. According to Horton's story, Jeff Tuttle was calling on young Julie. Uh, she's Horton's sister. Jeff left about 9.30, and a few minutes later, Horton heard him screaming for help. Horton ran out the back of the house, found Jeff at the edge of a cypress grove. Still in bed. Mm-hmm. I'd like a little talk with this Horton, uh, Sergeant. Well, no, I don't know. He's a queer duck. Doesn't take much to strangers. It doesn't take much to anybody, as a matter of fact. Really? Well, he puts in most of his time looking after his farm and his sheep. Keeps one hired man. Between the two of them, they manage pretty well. Then there's his young sister, the girl Jeff Tuttle was calling on. He doesn't let her out of his sight. Keeps pretty much cooped up in the house. Uh, nice looking girl, too. Mm-hmm. Uh, would it be possible to drive out to the Horton farm tonight, Sergeant? Well, let's see. Uh, ten minutes to eight. It'll be dark by the time we get there. Well, you're not afraid of the dark, are you? I'm not afraid of anything I can see. Let's go. Let's uh-huh. go. Uh, 
Is it much farther, Sergeant? Oh, about a mile. Professor, look at that. Look at what? They're ahead crossing the road. Is that a dog? Good grief. Speed up, Sergeant. Hurry before it's gone. Look how its eyes gleam in our headlights. A yellow fire. That's a dog. It's the biggest one I ever saw. I'm afraid it's no dog, Sergeant. Quick, swing to the left. Keep your lights on it. Ah, you notice anything? Starting to run, heading for the Sappers Grove. Yes, but notice the color, that peculiar gray. Has it gone? And the fangs, the pointed ears, the way it moved. Didn't it remind you of a wolf? Let's go after it. Uh, no, no, no. Wait, Sergeant. No use. Not in this darkness. We can never find it in that thick grove. Uh, guess you're right. You really think it was a wolf? I said it reminded me of one. Well, we don't we don't have wolves in this section, Professor. Uh, yes, yes, I know. Uh, Sergeant, I think it's time I told you the kind of research I intend doing. Uh, do you know what lycanthropy is? Uh, no, can't say I do. Well, it's a form of madness, a disease of the mind. Those who are afflicted with it imagine they've turned into wild animals. Uh. They develop a taste for blood and often commit violence when the spasm seizes them. Once the seizure is over, they return to normalcy, with no knowledge of what occurred. Sounds pretty horrible. Yes, it is horrible. You understand there's no physical change except the deepening of the voice, as far as we know. Uh, what do you mean, as far as you know? Well, some authorities believe the disease may be so deeply rooted in certain human beings that when the spasm seizes them, their actual physical appearance is altered. They take on the form as well as the habits of wild beasts. They're called werewolves, men who turn into wolves. Well, what's the matter, Sergeant? Why did you jump? It uh, just kind of hit me. Bloodhounds not finding any animal scent, and, and, and that gray thing we just saw running across the road. Well, we mustn't leap to conclusions, Sergeant. No true werewolf has ever been found, although there are many alleged eyewitness accounts claiming that such creatures have been seen particularly in the Balkan countries of Europe. Thus far, though, we have no positive scientific proof that werewolves really exist. Mm -hmm. Hope they don't. So do I, Sergeant. I devoutly hope so. But the case of this young man whose throat was uh, torn out presents some aspects I'd like to investigate. I'm uh, beginning to see what you're thinking about. I suggest we drive on to the Horton Farm, Sergeant. <laughs> Disturbing, Mr. Horton, but uh, what do you want? This is uh, Professor Taylor of the State University. Oh, I'm pleased to meet you, Mr. Horton. Yes. What is it? Uh, may we come in? I was just going to bed. Well, uh, we'll be just a few minutes. After you, Professor. Thank you. Professor Taylor came down from the university to do a little investigating on Jeff Tuttle's case, Mr. Horton. I'd like to ask you a few questions. Sick and tired of answering questions. I've told you all I know. What more do you want? Um, you can explain it better than I can, Professor. Go ahead. Uh, uh, yes, of course. Uh, well, you see, uh, Mr. Horton, my investigation is purely scientific. It has nothing whatsoever to do with the police. No? I'm merely trying to determine whether the brutal attack on the young man was made by a human or an animal. Or perhaps a combination of both. I don't know what you're talking about. Well, you've heard of werewolves, haven't you, Mr. Horton? No, and I'm not interested. I told you I've had enough of questions. Hasn't a, hasn't a man a right to a little privacy? Well, there's no need to get sore about it, Horton. I don't like being questioned. I don't like to have people barging in on me at all hours of the night. This is my house, and I'm going to live in it the way I see fit, which means without uninvited visitors. Uh, of course, Mr. Horton. It isn't my intention. And to... another thing. I own the property from the county road to the bayou and north to Kurt Silvis' pasture. If you took the time to notice, the land's posted. Now, this is a warning. 
the next person, man, woman, or child, who sets foot on my land is going to get a load of buckshot. Is that clear? You're in a bad humor tonight, Horton. Never mind my bad humor. Get out. Both of you. Get out and stay out. Julie, what are you doing in the kitchen? Didn't I tell you to stay up in your room? But, no, mister, I... Don't tell you dare come down that rear stairway with my back's turned. I just wanted to find out if you'd ask Andrew about my land. How many were killed? Get upstairs to your room or I'll... I'll go and no, miss, don't be angry. I, uh, presume that was your sister, Mr. Horton? Lovely girl. Good night, gentlemen. Get off my property and don't come back unless you're invited. I'm sorry, Professor. Uh, looks like we're being asked to leave. Oh, it's quite all right. Uh, thank you anyway, Mr. Horton. Perhaps some other evening you'll grant me a few minutes of your time. Uh, now you know what sort of a job we had with him. Uh, I must say he isn't very sociable. Uh, watch the steps. They're not too solid. Oh, yeah. uh, his sister doesn't resemble him in the least. Oh, he's rather pretty. You hear how he screamed at her? Yes. Poor child. Might as well head back to town, I guess. Horton didn't rise to your bait when you mentioned werewolves, so... Looks like a hunt will be the next best thing. A hunt, Sergeant? Yes. Get a bunch of men together and beat the cypress crows for that... that animal we saw crossing the road. Might even risk going into the swamp. Wolf or whatever it is, I won't be satisfied unless killed. Uh, I'm afraid I feel the same way, Sergeant. But before you organize a hunt, I wonder if it's safe to do a little snooping around here first. What do you mean? Something the girl said disturbed me. Something about lambs being killed. That's right. She did say she wanted to know if Horton's hired man had told him how many of her lambs were killed. Yes, and that may be significant. Werewolves are supposedly fond of slaughtering sheep. Uh... Do you think we might talk with the hired man? Well, chances are he's over in the barn. He's got a room there built out of a horse stall. You can take a look. Uh, it might be a good idea. It's over this way. Keep an eye out for Horton. He may come gunning for us. I don't trust him. Uh, I wouldn't be too concerned. Men who rant and roar are rarely dangerous. Wait a minute, Professor. Hold up. What is it? Somebody's hiding behind that bush on your left. All right. Come up with your hands up or I'll shoot. Won't you, Sergeant? Yes, I your flash on him, Professor. Yes, yes, certainly. There. What? Andrew. The hired man. I ain't doing nothing. Oh, Mr. I ain't. Why were you hiding behind that bush? I, I got scared. I heard voices in, in the graveling. What were you doing out here? Burying the sheep and the lambs. What was that? Since when do you bury sheep and lambs? Well, oh, these got to be. Mr. Holton said so. They run afoul of the critter. What critter? Only the Lord knows. We got strange goings on round here. Mighty strange. Always said it was too close to the bayou. Tain't healthy. Them swamps is full of things. Uh, where are you burying the sheep, Andrew? Right over there. Put them in the truck guard, Mr. Horton said. Good and deep. Uh, let's have a look at them, Sergeant. All right. There they are. Four ewes and two of Miss Julie's baby lambs. All with their throats torn out. Yeah. It's the critter from the swamps. Same one got Jeff Tuttle. Uh, when did this happen, Andrew? Mm, the lambs got took night before last. We lost three ewes on Sunday and one last night. Has it ever happened before? Been going on most two years. Not regular, though. Oh, months will go by and the critter don't show up. Uh, took a shot at him once, it did. When was this? Last spring. Seen him behind the pump house. Like to skip me half to death. The way his eyes glowed like a swamp fire. Wasn't trying to draw no bead. Missed him, I guess. Uh, what did he look like, Andrew? Couldn't tell. Too dark. All I seen was his eyes glowing yellow. Might have been a sheep-killing collar, though. Uh, one of them wild ones. Uh, I very much doubt it. You're thinking of what we saw on the road tonight, a Professor? That uh, animal, whatever it was. Yes, if it was an animal. Why do you say that? Just look at these dead sheep. See where I'm flashing my light? Their back legs, there. Eh? An ordinary animal would have nipped the legs and torn at their rumps. 
There's not a mark on them, except at their throats. Somebody's coming. The gravel's crunching. Must be Horton. Back behind the bush, Professor. We don't want him to catch us here. Don't say anything, Andrew. Keep low. Here comes. Bush. How long is it going to take you to get those carcasses buried? All night? It ain't too easy in the dark. So do better with a lantern. I told you, no light. Hand me the other spade. I'll help you. Start shoveling. Hmm. Kind of like a shame to be putting good meat underground. How many times must I tell you it isn't good meat? It's poison. Don't look poison. I say it is. And I'm warning you, shut your mouth about it. You hear that, Sergeant? Yes. I'm going to try to sneak back to the house and talk to the girl. You better come with me. All right. Keep down and follow the path. But stay off the gravel. I've got a hunch we're going to uncover something tonight. Yes. Perhaps more than we realize. Don't let him find you here. Now, don't worry about us, Julie. We want to help you. Why does your brother keep you locked in the house? He says it's for my own good. But that's not true. I know why he does it. Why? There's something going on. Something he doesn't want me to see. Something that... that isn't human. What do you mean, Miss Horton? I can't explain it, but... Well, I'm sure he murdered Jeff. I'm sure of it. Well, there, there, now. What, uh, what makes you so sure, Julie? That night. The night Jeff was killed. Yes, go on. He sent me into the house. He was out there alone with Jeff. It was dark. Pitch dark. Go ahead, Julie. I heard their voices. My brother was shot in a chair. He said he'd kill him if he didn't get off the property. Uh, I think we'd better get her out of here, Sergeant. No, no, I can't go. I can't. Why not, Julie? He'll follow me. He'll do to me what he did to Jeff. Sergeant, someone's coming, huh? I hear footsteps on the front porch. I could get her out the back way. Take her to the car and wait for me there. You know where it's parked. On the county road right at the entrance of the farm. Yes, yes. Well, come, my dear. No, no. No, I'm afraid. Well, there's nothing to be afraid of. Everything's going to be all right. Julie. Julie, where are you? She's gone, Horton. What are you doing here? I want to talk to you. Where's my sister? What have you done with her? I told you she's gone. Where is she? Answer me, where is she? You don't have to worry. She's safe. Safe? Safe? Tell me where she is. Take it easy, Horton. Take it easy. She's with Professor Taylor. We're... Going to take her away from here. You're going to take her away. <laughs> You're going to take her away. Over my dead body. Don't be a fool, Horton. Put that face down. Put it. Jolie. Jolie. Jolie! things is happening. Oh, oh, Sergeant. Oh. Please, please wake up. I hear it. I hear it, I tell you. I hear the critter. It's come from the swamp again. Oh, what happened? Sergeant, it's me, Andrew. We, we gotta go after it. After what? The critter. I hear it howling for blood. You... Where? Where'd you hear? Out near the county road. Good Lord. Help me up. Hurry. Are you sure Horton came this way, Andrew? Yep. I seen him running crazy like. Then I heard the howling, like a wolf howl it was. All it was. Never heard nothing escape me so. Close my blood. How much further do we have to go? Gates up ahead. 
road just beyond there. Right here. You take the flashlight out, handle the gun. Keep looking sharp. Don't worry. Uh, there's the gate. It's open. Swing your light. Yeah. Wait. Hold it. No. To mercy. What? It's Professor Taylor. Lying in the road and Horton's bending over him. He's all covered with blood. Horton. Horton, get away from him. Get away or I'll let you have it. No. No, no. No. You got him. Professor. Professor, are you all right? Yes, I'm all right. Horton. He's dead. You're bleeding, Professor. Better get your doctor. No, no, wait, wait. Across the road in the bushes near the Cypress Grove. What? Is it? It's the swamp critter. Shoot, Sergeant. Shoot into the brush. Don't let it get away. I think you got it. Good. Come on, Andrew. We'll take a look. Coming. Flash your light. There. In the bushes. Lord to mercy. What is it? An animal with a human face. Must be a werewolf. Dead, ain't it? Shot through the head. Yes. Come on back. You were right, Professor. Looks like a werewolf. Yeah. That's what it is. It attacked me. Horton fought it off. What? You mean he had nothing to do with it? No. But he knew all the time. He'd known for years. What did he know? The werewolf was his sister, Julie. again next Tuesday night at the same time over many of these stations when Mr. Karloff will present another mystery of the mind. Directed by Dave Drummond. Original music is composed and conducted by Albert Sack. The entire production is under the supervision of Robert Maxwell. Once again, we introduce the man who has agreed to serve as your guide and companion on these sometimes terrifying pilgrimages into the world beyond the realm of human understanding. The man who, for reasons that cannot be presently explained, must keep his identity a secret. Creeps by night, 
brings you its anonymous master of mystery, Dr. X. Good evening. This is Dr. X. Joining with you for further research into the shadowy darkness of the unexplored. The darkness of the human mind. I wish first, however, to thank you for your letters commenting on last week's broadcast, The Walking Dead. Many of you requested that I reveal my identity, and a few of you hazarded a guess as to who I am. In due time, perhaps, I will be able to step out from under my cloak of mystery. But for the present, I ask you to bear with me, since I shall have to be known only as Dr. X. Tonight, I have a rare treat in store for you. Mr. Edmund Gwen, the celebrated English actor, is our guest. The story I have chosen is drawn from the casebook of medical science and concerns itself with the often ghastly power of fear. Yes, we are all slaves to fear in one form or another. But the fear that forms the basis for our dramatization tonight is undoubtedly the most horrible of them all. It is the fear of... But wait... Let me draw aside the curtain and bring you Mr. Edmund Gwen as Ramsey in The Strange Burial of Alexander Jordan. For more than a century, the old Jordan house has stood on a gentle slope, mistress of the surrounding 400 acres of birch woods and pasture land. And now, inevitably, death seems near to the last of the strong men who have always owned it. Aged, irascible Alexander Jordan. In his faded, musty bedroom, the shades are drawn against the hot morning sun. And in the half-darkness, his pale, hollow cheeks blend into the color of the pillowcase. He stirs as the door opens and his doctor enters. That you, Rutledge? Yes. Come in and sit down. Close the door. What's the trouble, Alex? Had one of my cataleptic fits last night. A bad one. I'm going to die pretty soon, Rutledge. I suppose you let me do the guessing. Don't one. interrupt. I'm not afraid to die, mind you. I've never told anyone this, but my greatest fear is that it won't be death. And they'll bury me alive. Oh, I think we can be pretty sure if it comes to that. Don't be so positive. Thirty-eight years ago, a young butcher who called himself a doctor pronounced me dead when I had a cataleptic fit. Near got me buried, too, if I hadn't come out of it on time. That was thirty-eight years ago. Could happen again. Rutledge, I don't care if I sound like an old fool. All my life, that scared me. The idea of somebody mistaking one of those fits for death... The only nightmares I ever have, I wake up in a coffin. I put my hands up and I feel the lid there. Sometimes it's wood, sometimes it's cold glass. But there's no room to turn around. I put my hands down and I can feel the silk lining. They have me dressed in a swallowtail. They have a stiff collar on me. I reach up to tear it away. I can't breathe. I have to have air. Panic grips me. I try to shout, but no one can hear me. I... I beat on the coffin lid with my fists. I try to break the glass, but I can't do it. I haven't enough room. And pretty soon I know that I'm dying. Really dying. In the cold horror of the grave. Because somebody mistook one of my cataleptic fits for death. I don't want that to happen, Rutledge. And that's why I called you. Oh, you're just getting worked up over nothing, Alex. Listen to me. When the day comes and my nephew, Ramsey, or his wife, Martha, calls you, I want nobody but you to come, Rutledge. I don't want any other doctor to pronounce me dead. Is that clear? Don't worry. I want you to go over me very carefully. If you are absolutely satisfied that I'm dead, you can go ahead with the funeral. But I don't want my body embalmed. I don't want anything done to me except to put me in a coffin. And... Getting a lawyer here to write all this down this afternoon, Rutledge. But I wanted you to hear it too. I want my coffin put in the vault down by the birch woods. 
That's why I built the vault right on this property, so that nobody would ever bury me underground. It's all right. It'll be done just as you say. Now, wait a minute. I'm not finished. This is the most important part. I want a large brass bell placed on the wall over the bed where Ramsay and Martha sleep. I want wires connected from that bell to the vault. Electric wires. What for? I want a push button attached to the ends of those wires, and I want the button placed in my hands as I lie in the coffin, so that in case I'm not dead, in case I awaken, I can ring the bell and let them know. Well, I must say, Alex... I don't care what you say. I don't care what anyone says. That's the way I want it. All right, Alex. That's the way you'll get it. Yeah. Make sure I do. Well, I've got to run over to the Pritchards. Nor is having another baby. Taking that digitalis faithfully? Yeah. Foolishness. But I'm taking sure, it. That's good. Goodbye, Alex. Get out and soak up some of that sunshine. I'll see you Thursday. Send Martha in. Lord. All right. Just a minute there, Dr. Rutledge. Oh. Hello, Ramsey. I'd like to know why you came this morning, Doctor. I came because I was sent for. Why doesn't somebody tell me when the doctor's been sent for? Is my uncle all right? He's not dead, if that's what you want to know. Not quite yet. Hmm. See that he keeps on taking that prescription I left. He wants to see your wife. Alone. Martha? You heard me. Goodbye, Ramsey. I know the way out without your help. Goodbye, Dr. Rutledge. Mother, wipe your hands. He wants to see you. What did you say, dear? I said wipe your hands. He wants to see you. Is the doctor still in there? Is he all right? The doctor's gone. He wants you in there, alone. Oh, for goodness sake. Now what? Just a minute. Why is he asking to see you alone? Why, Ramsey, how should I know? Something's up. Rutledge was in there a long time. Why wasn't I told he was sent for? Why, he... Well, you were in the fields this morning when he asked me to call the doctor. Next time you tell me when he sends for people. And listen, when you get in there, watch what you say. Why, Ramsey, I don't know what you mean. You know very well what I mean. Just listen and don't babble. He mightn't like my ideas about what to do with this place after he's dead. Go on in there now. You've already wiped your hands six times. Yes, Ramsey, dear. You want me, Uncle Alex? Yes, come in and shut the door, Martha. Yes, Uncle Alex. Was the coffee all right this morning? Yes, fine. Miss Ramsey. He's, uh, he's in the kitchen. Sit down, Martha. Yes, Uncle Alex. I want to talk to you, Martha. Lawyer Gaines will be here sometime this afternoon to fix up my will. Oh, Uncle Alex. I've got a feeling my time is drawing near, Martha. And I just want to make sure that worthless nephew of mine doesn't get his hands on the Jordan place. I never made you marry him, Martha. I, I, I... Ah, never mind. None of my business. But I could have told you he was no good. Never has been. I wouldn't trust him with the farm. He'd sell it before my body turned cold. But I trust you, Martha. Thank you, Uncle Alex. Yes, I've thought it all over. I'm going to leave the place to you. At least you'll have a roof over your head and some land you can call your own. You like it here, don't you? Oh, yes, I do. I'd be perfectly happy to stay here the rest of my life. And well, that's fine, because it's going to be yours, all of it. Oh, Uncle Alex, you make me want to cry. No, no, none of that. I'm sorry. There's one more thing, Martha. One important thing. Yes, Uncle Alex. I've given Dr. Rutledge some very careful instructions about my burial. Oh, please, Uncle Alex. Nothing to be afraid of, Martha. When it comes, it'll come, and that's all. Rutledge knows what to do. He'll tell you. And I want you to promise me that you'll follow the instructions. Yes, of course, Uncle Alex, on my word of honor. As God is my witness. Thank you, Martha. 
Well, by Job, you've made me feel a good deal better knowing I have someone around I can trust. Matter of fact, I think I'll get up for supper tonight. Tell Ramsey to come in and help me dress after Lawyer Gaines leaves. Tell him I don't want him in here before then. Yes, Uncle Alex. And uh, don't breathe a word about this to Ramsey. I won't. If you need anything, Uncle Alex, call me. Yes, I will. Well, what did the old buzzard want? His lawyer's coming this afternoon. You're to go in and help him dress after the lawyer leaves. He's having supper at the table? Yes. Bring in one of the special hams. I'll bake it with pineapple. Did it take you ten minutes in there to decide on baked ham with pineapple for supper? What we decided is none of your business. What do you mean, what you decided? I said it was none of your business. Better get out and feed the chickens. When did you start giving me orders? Oh, go on out of my kitchen. I've got work to do. What did you talk about in there? Ramsey, you're hurting my arm. I'll hurt more than that before I'm through. What's the lawyer coming for? Would you like me to tell him you haven't fed the chickens yet? Something suddenly made you awfully cocky, it seems to me. Tell me what it is. Right now. Ramsey. Tell me, I said. Ramsey. Let go of her, Ramsey. Oh. I was only... Uh... Get out of the house before I lose my temper. Go oh. on, get... I'm going. <clears throat> if this ever happens again, Martha, you let me know. Yes, Uncle Alex, but... You shouldn't have gotten out of bed this way. Oh, don't worry about me, Martha. I'm all right. Bacon and eggs for his breakfast. And why not? Did you fix the fence post over on the west pasture? Never mind the fence post. Give me that tray. You tend to your own business. I'll take the tray into him. <laughs> your breakfast, Uncle Alex. Hmm. That's funny. Uncle Alex. Uncle Alex. Oh, my Lord. Ramsey. Call Dr. Rutledge. Ramsey. Let's pause for a moment. We'll return to Edmund Gwynn in Creeps by Night right after these messages. Stan Freeberg here. The Radio Spirits Catalog features thousands of cassettes and CDs of old-time radio. Call right now and Radio Spirits will send you their latest catalog absolutely free. Call Radio Spirits right now at 1-800-RADIO-48. That's 1-800-723-4648. And now, let's return to Edmund Gwynn in The Strange Burial of Alexander Jordan on Creeps by Night. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he have everlasting life. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. What's the matter with Martha, Doctor? The funeral was evidently too much for her. Oh. I gave her a sedative and put her to bed upstairs. Where's the undertaker? Down at the vault with the electrician. They're waiting for you so they can close the coffin. Of all the stupid things, he's dead, isn't he? Yes, but we're observing his wishes to the letter. Brass bells and electric push buttons rot. Perhaps it is, but that's how he wanted it. And incidentally, as administrator of the estate, let me remind you that according to the terms of the will, either you or Martha must remain within earshot of that bell upstairs for seven days. You understand that? Yes, to my life. I'm beholden to a woman, a 
fat. You could do worse, Ramsey. <laughs> this is a nice place. I wish it were mine. If I had my way, you could bite in a minute. Well, that's neither here nor there. See that Martha gets some rest. I left a bottle of medicine on the small table beside the bed. She's to take it according to directions if she has trouble sleeping. Good Lord, what's that? Her uncle wanted a bell loud enough to be heard. He certainly got it. Doctor, do you suppose... Take it easy. The undertaker or the electrician at the crypt touched the push button. Ramsey! Ramsey! Good Lord, I forgot. The bell sounded right above the bed where she was asleep. Come on. Oh, Ramsey! Dr. Rutledge, the bell! Oh, it doesn't mean anything, Martha. Don't be frightened. Oh, thank goodness. I was asleep and it hit me like a blow when it rang. For a moment, I couldn't even move. I felt paralyzed like in a dream. There, there, that's all right. Go on back to bed. You fall asleep again with the stuff I gave you. The bell won't ring anymore. I'll go right on down to the vault and see if the coffin is closed. Get her back into bed, Ramsey, and better have another teaspoonful of that medicine tonight. You just get over to the vault and stop there monkeying. I'll tend to her. See that you do. And remember, don't leave this place for seven days. been able to get into town and get anything fresh, Ramsey, and you know it. It's just that you're nervous and not sleeping. I'll drive into town. No, Ramsey. We've still got five days to go. Four o'clock. Why can't I sleep? Why... Three nights of it now. Three nights with that bell hanging over my head. Oh. Martha, you asleep? It must be that stuff Rutledge gave her. I'll take some. I can't stand it any longer. I... Now, maybe. Maybe I'll sleep. <laughs> Tell you, Martha, there's only one thing to do with the place. Sell it. You're wasting your time, Ramsey. I will not sell it. Oh. I'm not getting any younger. I want a roof over my head. That's what Uncle Alex intended. But now's the time to sell farmers. We can get a good price. To begin with, Ramsey, it doesn't even belong to me. Well, it will in two more days, won't it? Yes. If that bell doesn't ring. <laughs> Last night. Tomorrow, the place is ours. I'll take some of that medicine that worked before. I won't sell the place, Randy. I won't sell. Talking in her sleep. I won't sell. She's dreaming. Having a nightmare. Too much of this dope, maybe. Your mother, wake up. Not there. Uh, uh, oh. She's dead to the world. The stuff Ruggins gave her must be powerful. Uh, that gives me an idea. Don't trust you, then. No, dear. You won't have to trust me much longer, you dried up old fool. Uh, Let's have a look at this uh, bottle. Uh, I guess it's all right to turn the lamp on. She won't wake up. Uh, uh. There. Now let's see what the label says. Maximum dose, one teaspoonful every 12 hours. Caution. Overdosing may be fatal. 
overdosing may be fatal, eh? Uh, so that you're in place. No. Mm, we'll see about that. <laughs> Maximum dose, one teaspoonful. I could put three in her coffee tomorrow morning. She'd never know the difference. That stale coffee's bitter as gall anywhere, and that it fits everything. Yes, I'm her only relative. If she dies, I get the place. Ah, oh, why didn't I think of this before? Why did I wait six days and nights with that bell hanging over my head? Why did I? Oh, good Lord. Am I dreaming? No, no, it can't be. It can't. Stop. Stop that ringing. Fancy. Fancy. The bell. I can hear it, you fool. Quick. Fancy. Stay where you are. I'll stop it. Fancy. What did you do? What do you think I did? The wires. You pulled out the wires. Get back into bed. Are you out of your mind? The key to the vault. Where is it? What? The key. Uncle Alex must be You're alive. You're crazy. He rang the bell, didn't he? You were dreaming. Get back to bed. Give me that vault key, Ramsey. Give it to me. Now, take it easy. Don't stand there telling me to take it easy. Uncle Alex may be fighting for breath. Breathing against the coffin. Get the key. All right, all right. I'll go down there. I'll go with you. Doesn't need two people. Just let me get into my clothes. I don't trust you, Ramsey. You've got no right to say a thing like that, Martha. What difference does it make to me whether Alex is alive or dead? I don't stand against anything. He left the Jordan place to you. Ah, oh, now where did I put that key? Must be in this drawer. Hurry, Ramsey. I'm hurrying. There, here it is. You took something else out of that drawer, Ramsey. I did not. Just the key. What's the matter with you anyway? Where are my shoes? Under the bed. I'll be watching from the window, Ramsey. If Uncle Alex is alive, yell to me. And I'll phone Dr. Rutledge. <laughs> Let's take a short break. We'll return to Creeps by Night in a moment. To find out more about old-time radio, old-time video, and the pleasures of listening to audiobooks, visit the Audiobook Club website, www.audiobookclub.com, where you can get four audiobooks for just one penny. MediaBay.com And now, let's return to Edmund Gwynn in the conclusion of The Strange Burial of Alexander Jordan on Creeps by Night. There's a storm coming up. That wind's from the east. Now, let's see if this key fits. Fits all right, but... But it won't turn. Ah, here we are. Now, where's that light switch? Here it is. Yeah, that's better. Oh, it's foul in here. Even smells dead. There's the coffin. I hope they didn't screw down the lid. No. No, it comes right up. Yeah. He hasn't moved. He's dead. Yes, just the way he was when they put him in there. With his hands folded over the bell button. He didn't ring that bell. Who did? Oh, now I know. The storm. Lightning shorted the wire. Sure, that's what it was. It must have been. Still, I... I think I'd better make sure while I'm down here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, Martha almost caught me taking this darning needle out of the drawer. I'll work it under his shirt and jab it through his heart. You're going to stay dead, Uncle Alex, no matter what happens. Bandy! Martha! You followed me. I told you I didn't trust you. What are you doing with that darning needle in your hand? Nothing. Get out of the way. Let me look at him. Dead. Stone dead. Who rang the bell? Well, how did I know? Maybe his ghost. You were about to do something with that needle. What? You really want to know? All right. I'll tell you. I was going to jab it through his black heart. I was going to make sure he was dead. And I'm still going to do it. Brandon, see, you're out of your mind. Am I? We'll see. Keep away from that coffin. Shut up. I'll scream, Randy. The will hear me. No, you won't. Yes, I will. Help! 
Oh, so that's how it is. Wait till I close this door. Now. Now, scream your lungs out. Ramsey, don't do anything you'll regret. Regret? Don't touch that. Why waste this needle on old dead Alex? I might do much better using it on you. Jab it into your heart. Ramsey! Why not? Then I get to own the place and sell it. Ramsey! Listen to me. I've listened to you plenty these last few weeks. Ever since he made you the high and mighty boss. But now, it's my turn. Ramsey! I'll never find you down here. No. No, you'll dry up and rot. Just like he's rotting in that coffin. Ramsey! No! Ramsey! Fainted before I could touch her. Wait a minute. That gives me an idea. There's a better way of doing it. Carry her up to the house. Pour that medicine down her throat. Give her an overdose. She'll be dead by morning. And no one can put it on me. Oh, oh this is beautiful. Everything's working out fine. You're going to be rich, Ramsey. You're rich. Get the door open first. And then... Lord. The key's on the outside. And it's a snap lock. No. No. Oh, what am I going to do? I'm locked in here. I can't get out. The door is solid open. Six inches thick. There are no windows. No air. Well, the push button's in his hands. I keep ringing it. Yes. Sooner or later, someone will hear it. Yeah. Yeah, this should do it. The president or the McCarthy, they're bound to hear it and investigate. I'll keep bringing it all night. I'll, I'll... Oh, the wires. Wires in the bedroom. I ripped them out. The bell. Won't ring. Oh, God. A trap. A trap in here. A trap. Trap. was The Strange Burial of Alexander Jordan, starring Mr. Edmund Gwen. For our next exploration into the darkness of the human mind, I have invited the celebrated exponent of the Mysterioso, Peter Laura, to be our guest. So join with us when once again we raise the shadowy curtain of the unknown and look deep into the souls of men. Until then, this is your master of mystery, Dr. X, leaving you with creeps by night. Creeps by Night is produced by Robert Maxwell. Original music composed by Paul Creston, conducted by Joseph Stopak. Supporting Mr. Gwen in tonight's presentation were Everett Sloan as Alexander Jordan, Abby Lewis as Martha, Gregory Morton as Dr. Rutledge, and Dr. X as himself. Edmund Gwen appeared to the courtesy of Metro-Golden-Mayer, whose 20-year anniversary picture, The White Cliffs of Dover, is currently being released. George Gunn, speaking. This... Good evening. This is Peter Lawrence. Man kills passionately out of hunger or anger, out of fear or love. But man also destroys life coldly and impersonally, without rancor, unemotionally and with but one purpose, to gain. It is of greed and murder that you hear tonight in a mystery playhouse. <laughs> Gil 
root has been known to lie heavily on the soul of the coarsest and unregenerate of human beings. And conscience is an unseen but terrible demon to those whose hearts are set in evil, exerting a grim and unrelenting power over their minds. Tonight our story concerns itself with a price of greed and revolves about a strange and almost fateful phenomenon that forced a man to stand ghastly trial before a jury of the dead. Listen as we tell you of Captain Boo Harrison and the six who did not die. Far below the equator, where the blinding sun beats with fierce hatred on the endless surface of the sea, lie the lonely islands of the Gambier Archipelago. There is no movement in the white, hot expanse of sand and ocean, no movement save the brief, fluttering excursions of flying fish and the few palm fronds that wave languidly above precarious footholds in the scanty soil. Barren and lonely are the Gambiers. And lonelier than most is the atoll of Mangareva, a strip of sand and gray coral rising from the sea like something foul and festering. For at high water, the tide sweeps over it, and retreating, leaves on its sloping beach all manner of snails and shellfish that helpless broil and putrefy under the blazing sun. No trader has ever visited Mangareva, for there is no one with whom to trade. And the gunboats of the Australian Territorial Patrol give it wide berth, for there is no one to watch. Only an occasional pearling vessel with its crew of native divers ventures within sight of Mangareva. Such a vessel is the sloop Nancy Hale, four days out of Sydney. A weather-beaten hulk with caulking oozing from her open seams, she lies at anchor in the lee of the island. It is sundown, and her small boat is returning from a day of pearl diving. The oars stroked by six dark-skinned natives, the cockney mate standing in the bow. As the boat swings broadside to the sloop, the mate clambers aboard. All right, Kamali. Make her fast to the stern cleat. And mind you don't lose one of those oars overside. Me, not ten. Now it is ten. Me do some work all time. No, blimey, stop your even babbling. I don't care whose turn it is. Make her fast and ship them oars. If it ain't done by the time I get back from seeing the captain, I'll take the eyes off you. And you mind what I say. Beggars always getting their ends up about something. It ain't one thing, it's another. I give ten pounds right here and now to be lifting a pint down in the red dragon cold blimey I would instead of sweating my blood out in a, a million miles from civilization. Hi, Captain. Uh, like it's not these three sheets in the wind. I'll take a look. Who's there? Now keep your shirt on, bull. It's nobody but me, Foggy. Oh, back already? Well, it's been ten hours under that blasted sun. Ain't that enough? Close the door. How'd you make out? Yeah, not bad. But, <laughs> uh, you might invite a chap to have a nip of that there gin sitting on the table. Go ahead. That's the last of it. Oh, blimey. The last of 60 bottles we took on at Sydney. <laughs> You ain't been bashful about drinking it, have you? You got any objections? Oh, no, no, don't be getting your end up, Bull. No offense. Why are you drinking? Let's see what you got for your ten hours. Well, no, I think we've done pretty fair at that. Here's one, your eye. Ah, ha, <laughs> uh, ha. Nothing like a spot of Dutch gin to set a chat right. Oh, good at that. Too bad there ain't more of it for the old back to Sydney. What makes you think we're hauling back? I think we are, Mr. Addison. Fast as the old trouble takers. I think we are. Come on out with it. What'd you get? A handful of stinking seed pearls? Seed pearls? Is it not on your life? Give an eye to these, if you please. Good Lord. Not bad, eh, Mr. Addison? Where'd you get these, Foggy? Fifty yards southeast of Mangareva in two fathoms of water. You know what they're worth? God, they must weigh fifty grains apiece. How many are there? One, two, three, four, Eight five, by my six. count. That's right. Eight times fifty. 
Four hundred grains. All perfect, too. Hardly need peeling. There's a thousand pounds here, Foggy. Maybe more the way the market is today. By heaven, you're right. We are hauling back. I can do a lot with a thousand pounds. <laughs> Ain't you forgetting something, Captain? How's about me and the natives? What do you mean? Well, the natives get half the catch according to the agreement with their chief, and I get ten percent. Well, figuring rapid and not intending to be accurate, I should say that leaves you four hundred pounds, not a thousand. <laughs> Trouble with you, Foggy, is you don't know how to figure. Now, listen. When we took on this batch of divers, we never dreamed we'd run into a hall like this, did we? Can't say as we did. All right. We figured maybe we'd come back with fifty or a hundred grains, not four hundred. What are you leading up to? How far can I trust you, Foggy? Well, now, I'd say that all depends on how much it's worth to be trusted. If we get what I think we should for those eight beauties, your cut will be 300 pounds, $1,500. Go blimey, enough to take me back to England in style, ain't it? More than enough. Well, it sounds most attractive. Uh, how do you plan to work it? Right now, eight people know about this catch. You and me and the six divers. Chances are there are plenty more pearls where these came from. Must be a natural bed. We got to fix it so it's only you and me know the location of that bed. Savvy? I ain't interested in the bed. All I'm thinking about is getting enough to ship back to England. Okay, this is how to get it. You still ain't giving me no details like this, if you understand what I mean. There's nothing to it. We lay over here tonight. Tomorrow morning we tell the boys we're making one last dive and hauling back. I'll go along with you in the small boat so I can mark the spot. I'll take a belay and pin with me. They'll all dive in pronto because they've been there before. And when they come up one at a time like they always do... Whack! You get me, Foggy? I get you, bull. <laughs> To it, eat to it. We ain't going to no tea party. You say no more dive. You say we go back. Mind your babbling tongues, you even. We got the captain with us today. He wants to see how you dive. Ain't that right, Mr. Addison? That's right, boys. This is the last dive, and then we haul back. Good catch this trip. Plenty gin. For the likes of them, as he's left to drink it. Shut up, you fool. We make only one dive, then we go back. How about that, Mr. Addison? Yeah, one dive. Then you're through. Oh, yeah, they like that. They're poor beggars. What in your lip, Foggy, and tender business? Through the southeast of Manga River, about 50 yards off. This is the spot. Close enough, I'd say. Shippers! Eat that anchor, Taro. Over with it. Sure, this is the spot, Foggy. As near as I can come to it. She holding, Taru? Yes, she holds. All right, let her swing with the tide. What there is of it? Water slack. Okay, get him over, Foggy. Here we go, boys. You first, Kamuli. Me, no dive. Me, ear hurt. He's got a dive. Here, let's have a look at your ear. No, can see. Hurt deep inside. Why'd you say something about it before we left the sloop? Wait a minute, Foggy. I'll handle this. Come on, Lee. Ear hurt bad, Captain. Very bad. One dive won't do it no harm. I come out here special to see you and your boys go down. Tell you what I'll do. Anything you bring up this dive belongs to you. No split. All pearls yours. How's that? Well, what about it, Kamali? No dive. Stand up in the boat. Stand up, I said. Now for the last time, Kamali. You're going to dive or not? No, no dive. You hurt the bad. Well, maybe this will cure it. Now the rest of you get over and make it fast. Go ahead. Oh, 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 oh. Ah, that does it. They're over. Hold the boat steady, Foggy. I'll work the belaying pin as they come up. What about this one, you slug? Leave him be till we get rid of the rest. Hold steady now. They won't be staying down there long, I can promise you. I got a funny feeling no good's going to come of this. Throw your feelings and keep the boat steady. That's all you got to do. I'll take care of the rest. One little tap of this belaying pin as they come up will be enough. Here comes one. Right aside the boat. Steady. Steady. Ah, that does for him. Went down like a rock. 
two more coming up. I see them. Ah, that's my string. See the others? Not yet. Water got roughed up, am I? Hold on. Here they come. Two together. That'll make it easy. Steady now. <coughs> Blimey, did you see the way them two's eyes rolled up? <sighs> like the sin of shivers through me. Give me a hand with this one and stole the gab. What you gonna do with it? Heave him over. Wait till I tap his skull to make sure he don't come to. <clears throat> there ain't nothing finicky about you, is there, boy? Grab his feet. <laughs> Lift him now. <laughs> You're all right. Heave. Now, uh, get that anchor up. The job's done. All neat and clean. It ain't done for me. I'll be seeing them poor beggars' eyes rolling up for a long time to come. You'll forget about it once we hit Sydney. There'll be plenty of gin and rooms in the best hotel in town. All I want is to book passage on the first boat back to England. Don't worry about that, Foggy. You'll go back to England a rich man. I got another idea. The money we get for those pearls is gonna be nothing compared to what we end up with. Now what's on your mind? You'll find out. Get that anchor up. All set? Right. Bend two on the oars. We're gonna be rich men, Foggy, you and me. Plenty rich. hundred pounds you got for them pearls and me supposed to get my share and I ain't seen a shilling and I'm not going to now. Shut up and open the door. You got the key? No, I ain't got nothing. Nothing for killing six men. Right down, you stupid fool. Like to get us hanged? Here's the key. Open the door. We're going to be rich men, Foggy, you and me. How's about that, Mr. Harrison? Open the door, I said. Twelve hundred pounds and now we ain't got nothing. Close the door. Twelve hundred pounds lost. Stop talking about it. I've heard all I want to hear. Oh, you have? It don't bother you that I ain't got no passage money, does it? You think I figured on losing it? I had a system to beat that roulette wheel. Something happened. Didn't work. I told you to stop. You told me. What do you know about it? All I was trying to do was to build that stake up, make us some real money. Yeah, now we ain't got nothing. Gamble it away, you did. There's more where that came from. I've got 20 pounds left. Enough to pay for this hotel room, dock charges on the sloop and provisions. We'll go back to Mangareva and get ourselves some more of them big pearls. I ain't going nowhere near Mangareva. Not on your life, I ain't. Why not? Because it ain't got pleasant memories, that's why. I'm quitting. I know a rum deal when I see one. Ah. Twelve hundred pounds left in a gambling house. So you're quitting, huh? What makes you think I'll let you quit? You ain't got no right to stop me? No, I got a right to see that you don't open that big blabbing mouth of yours. I got that right. I knows when I'm well off. I ain't doing no talking. Maybe I'd better make sure of that. <laughs> yeah, always one for making jokes, aren't you? This don't happen to be no joke. We murdered six men back at Mangareva, you and me. We're the only ones knows about it. I think you better ship with me when the Nancy Hale pulls out in the morning. Yeah... I think you better. I ain't shipping on no more pearl boats, and I ain't going nowhere near Mangareva. Now, that's final. All right, Foggy. That's how you feel about it. Open the window, will you? It's hot in here. It ain't a bit hot. You've been drinking too much. Open it anyway. Thanks. Yeah. Nice view of the harbor from there, Foggy. Pretty with all them lights blinking. Uh, Bull, how's about giving me half the 20 pounds you've got left? Sure. Why not? Here. Yeah. Two five-pound notes. Ah, uh, much obliged, Bull. If I wasn't so set on going home, I... What, what, what are you holding my wrist for? You're going out the window, Foggy. You're going to fall out. No, I ain't got nothing. I want to make sure you won't do it. Let go of me, Bull. Let go. So long, Foggy. Bull. Bull. Ah! 
12 stories to the street. <laughs> you won't talk now, Foggy. Not at all. Ease off on that jib halyard, Dave. More! More! Okay, reefer up. Stand by to heave anchor. Hey, right. You, Manu, lend a hand with that winch. All right, let her go. Anchor down and holding, sir. Make her fast. Hey, aye, aye, sir. Make her fast, Manu. What, sir? Yeah, this is it. We stole the I.I. I. and the sir business, Dave. We ain't formal on the Nancy Hale. That suits me all right. So that's Manga Riva, is it? Ain't much to look at. Best pearl bed in the South Seas right under us. Won't even bother with a small boat today. Work right from the sloop. Get the divers over. Okay. Hello. Hello. Yes, boss. Get your boys over. Oh, no, good for me. Headman, go first. you learn, Dave. First dive's taken by the head man. These boys are new to this spot and won't go under till he comes up and says it looks clear. All right. All right, Manu. Got eight beauties out of here last trip, Dave. You're going to be real glad you shipped with me. Uh, I'm a new cup. Uh, I'm a new cup. Give him a hand. Uh, here you are. Uh, 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 uh. Pick, pick what out of here. Huh? Pick. Bad water. Shut up! What's the matter with you, Manu? Me, dive. Go to bottom. Six men down there. Dead. You're crazy. No, crazy. Six dead men. They stand up like they live. My boys, no dive here. Bad water. Hey, wait a minute, Manu. What do you mean there's six dead men down there standing up? Like live, they're standing up. But they dead. I shut up from you. Shut up. Now, the rest of you will listen to me. You'll die, or I'll know the reason why. I came here to get pearls, and you're going to get them. There'll be no acting up on my boat. Uh, 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 Dave! Dave, there's a diving helmet and lead shoes in one of the starboard lockers. Get them out. Test the air hose in the pump. Know anything about diving equipment? Plenty, but I never went down myself. You won't have to. I'm going down. I'll prove to these beggars there's nothing wrong down there. Everything okay, Captain? Yeah, just about touching bottom. Ease up on the rope a little. Let the rope go, Manu. Easy. Easy. Take a bite in it. That better, Bull? Yeah, much better. Keep that air pump and hand generator going. Don't worry. Yeah, how's it look down there? Can't see much yet. Gotta get used to it. Lean forward when you walk. You need more rope? Oh, it's okay. I ain't doing any walking. All I want to do is stay down here a couple of minutes and prove to those native beggars that... Captain, what is it? Hold me up! Hold on that rope! What is it, Bull? What happened? Get me up, Dave! Get me up! Then I'll come near me. Rope duck. No can pull. It can't be duck. Lay on it, all of you! Dave! Dave! Hold me up! We're doing our best, Bull. What's down there? Six men. One who's right. They're standing in the water and turning at me. For the love of heaven, get me up! We're trying to pull, but something's holding you. What is it? I don't know. My feet are sinking down. Maybe it's this one. Oh, no. Lash that rope to the window. Move past. They got me. They can't get away. We're lashing the rope to the window, Bull. We'll get you up now. Hold on. No, no. They don't. They don't. You can't. No oh. can do. Rope stuck. Get back to that air pump. Air. Gotta have air. Oh, no. Man the pump. No. Cut them bad. Stay in bad water. Hey, you. Bull. They won't man the pump. We can't budge it. Bull! You're stuck just the same as I am, aren't you? Stuck in the asphalt. That's why you're standing there grinning at me. You can't move. Bull! Bull, listen to me! Sure, I killed you. And I killed Foggy, too. I wanted it all for myself, and I'm gonna get it. Pearls, the biggest pearls you ever saw. 
that town here all around me. I'm not afraid of you. You're dead. Dead, do you hear me? Oh, for the love of heaven, listen to me! Pearls all around. Big ones. Go ahead, bring your dirty devil's grin. You can't beat me. You can't. <laughs> in the watery courtroom, facing his jury. The jury with good reason to pronounce him guilty of murder and greed. Oh, poor bull. Down there were the pearls he wanted so much, and the men he murdered to get them. <laughs> Funny, isn't it? Or is it? Please don't go Come with me to the green room where the players are rehearsing our next performance. Come. <laughs> Come. Come. Hello? No, I'm not Pamela North. I... Hmm. You hung up, as usual. Maybe I better practice up on my falsetto. In a hurry this time. Hello? I am not... Dead. Oh, hold the door. Maybe he didn't believe me. No, I'm not Pamela North. I... Well, of course not. I am. <laughs> Hello, Pam. <laughs> oh, I'm glad to be home, darling. Wasn't the reunion fun? It was awful. Everybody sat around noticing how much older everybody else looked. Post-mortems, huh? Mm-hmm. Uh, darling, is there a man in your life? Of course, dear. You. There must be somebody else. Because I'm pretty sure I haven't been calling myself up and asking me if I weren't Pamela North. Darling, you're not well. I'm in perfect health. Listen, some goon has been phoning every hour and asking for you. As soon as I convince him that I'm not you, he hangs up. Well, that's funny. Well, it's reasonable enough, I but... I wonder uh... if it has anything to do with the little man. What little man? The one who followed me home. Maybe I should have asked you about the men in your life. Frighten me, darling. The street was so dark, and he was so uh, gray, sort of, and indistinct. I ran. Did he run after you? I don't know. I would have. You did. Mm -hmm. But you slowed up for me. Oh. Uh, you answer it. I wouldn't want to disappoint him again. All right, darling. Hello? Yes, this is Pamela North. Uh, what you... Uh, hello? Jimmy. I know, he hung up. Probably thinks it's good, clean fun. You know, darling, I am getting scared. Yeah, nothing to get scared about. You're beautiful. I... Come here to the window. All right, darling. Wait. Is that your little man coming down the street? Yes, Jerry. He's looking up at the house numbers. I thought he was only a nasty little old man, but... Come away from the window. What are you going to do? Call the police. Oh, uh, I may just be imagining things, Jerry. My imagination can't be that vivid. It may have been a car backfiring. I know those were shots. I'll take a look. Jerry, don't you go near that window. All right, darling, no one could see me up here. Funny. What is? It's deserted. The little man? He's gone, too. Maybe that was a car backfiring. At any rate, most people would think so. Darling, we've heard guns being fired too often. Well, whoever fired those shots isn't there anymore. Neither is your little man. I sort of suspect he's disappeared from our lives. I hope. That was our doorbell. Uh-huh. Let's make believe we're not home, Jerry. It might be important. That's what I mean. I'd better see who that is. It's silly being terrified by, by nothing, Pam. You can answer the door if you wish, darling, but I'm going to keep right on being terrified. Well, if you insist. Oh, no. No, I'm going with you. I want to be terrified in company. All right, but get over to one side. I'm going to open the door. All right, darling. It's the little man. So it is. Won't you uh, come in, please? Thank you. Shut the door, darling. Uh-huh. Are you come on, North? Yes, I am. Jerry, he's ill. Not ill. Please, let me speak. They will kill you, Pamela. You need a doctor. You better not bring yourself by speaking. Must speak. Don't need doctors. Must speak. I had them red line bar. Kill Pamela North. That. That. Uh, oh, I'm done. He collapsed oh. suddenly. Hot wraps up. I'll lay him down here on the sofa. 
Get his coat open. Shall I phone for a doctor, darling? No. There's nothing a doctor can do for him. Dead? Chest full of bullets. Yes, he's dead. Oh, the poor little man. But who... He came here to warn you against a murderer, darling. But the murderer got to him first. <laughs> What is all this, do you suppose? Why do you think anyone would want to kill Mrs. Pamela North? She seems to be a perfectly harmless young woman, don't you think? But there must be a reason. Well, I'm afraid we'll have to wait for our next performance. And our guests will be the famous amateur detectives, Mr. and Mrs. North. Oh, uh, incidentally, we are interested in your reaction to our shows. So why don't you ride to the Mystery Playhouse, Armed Forces Radio, Los Angeles, USA, telling us what you like or don't like or anything you care to say. If you do that, we'd appreciate hearing from you very much. This is Peter Laurie closing the doors of the Mystery Playhouse. Good night. Sleep tight. Tonight, two tales by Edgar Allan Poe. First, a story about a phantom that you might see in your own city streets at any time. Here is Bernard Mays to tell you about the man in the crowd.
There are some secrets which do not permit themselves to be told. Men die nightly in their beds, wringing the hands of ghostly confessors and looking them piteously in the eyes. Die of despair of heart and convulsion of throat on account of the hideousness of mysteries which will not suffer themselves to be revealed. Now and then, alas, the conscience of man takes up a burden so heavy in horror that it can be thrown down only into the grave. And thus, the essence of all crime is undivulged. Not long ago, about the closing in of an evening in autumn, I sat at the large bay window of a coffee house in London, peering through the smoky panes into the street, one of the principal thoroughfares of the city. As the darkness came on, the throng momentarily increased. Two dense and continuous tides of population were rushing past the door. At first, I looked at the passengers in masses. Soon, however, I descended to details and regarded with minute interest the innumerable varieties. The greater number had a satisfied, business-like demeanor, Others, restless, talking to themselves. The tribe of clerks, one breed wearing the cast-off graces of the gentry, another, the affectation of respectability. Descending the scale of what is termed gentility, darker and deeper themes, beggars, ghastly and feeble invalids, drunkards. As the night deepened, the late hour brought forth every species of infamy from its den, and deepened in me also the interest of the scene. With my brow to the glass, I was thus occupied in scrutinizing the mob, when suddenly there came into view a countenance, that of a decrepit old man, some 65 or 70 years of age, a countenance which at once arrested and absorbed my whole attention. There arose within my mind the ideas of vast mental power, of caution, of penuriousness, of avarice, coolness, malice, of bloodthirstiness, of triumph, of merriment, of excess terror, of intense, of extreme despair. I felt singularly aroused and fascinated. Then came a craving desire to keep the man in view, to know more of him. I made my way into the street and pushed through the crowd in the direction which I had seen him take. I had left him up with inside of him, approached and followed him closely, yet cautiously, so as not to attract his attention. He was short in stature, very thin, and apparently very feeble. His clothes generally were filthy and ragged. It was now fully nightfall, and the humid fog had ended in a settled, heavy rain. For half an hour, the old man held his way with difficulty along the great thoroughfare, and I walked close at his elbow through fear of losing sight of him. Never once turning his head to look back, he didn't observe me. By and by, he passed into a cross street, not quite so much strong as the one he quitted. He walked more slowly, more hesitated. He crossed and recrossed the way repeatedly without apparent aim. The street was a narrow and long one, and his course lay within it for nearly an hour, during which the passengers had gradually diminished. A turn brought us into a square, brilliantly lighted and overflowing with life. He urged his way steadily and perseveringly. I was surprised, however, to find, upon his having made the circuit of the square, that he turned and retraced his steps repeating the same walk several times, once nearly detecting me as he came round with a sudden movement. In this exercise, he spent another hour. The rain fell fast, the air grew cool, and the people were retiring to their homes. With a gesture of impatience, the wanderer passed into a by street comparatively deserted. And down this some quarter of a mile long, he rushed with an activity I couldn't have dreamed of seeing in one so aged. A few moments later, 
brought us into a large and busy bazaar, and he forced his way to and fro without aim among the host of buyers and sellers. At no moment did he see me that I watched him. He entered shop after shop, priced nothing, spoke no word, looked at all objects with a wild and vacant stare. I was now utterly amazed at his behavior. I was resolved to follow him wherever he went. And we should not part until I had satisfied myself in some measure respecting him. fast deserting the bazaar. A shopkeeper, in putting up a shutter, jostled the old man. He shuddered and hurried into the street, looked anxiously around him for an instant, and then ran with incredible swiftness through many crooked and peopled lanes. Until we emerged once more upon the great thoroughfare whence we had started. It was still brilliant with gas, but the rain fell fiercely, and there were few persons to be seen. Stranger grew pale, then with a heavy sigh, turned in the direction of the river, and plunging through a great variety of devious ways, came out at length in view of one of the principal theatres. The audience were thronging from the doors. The old man gasped as if for breath and threw himself into the crowd. Eventually the company grew more scattered, and his old uneasiness and vacillation were resumed. For some time, he followed closely a party of some ten or twelve roisterers. And one by one, they dropped off. In a narrow and gloomy lane, the stranger paused, and for a moment seemed lost in thought. And then, with every mark of agitation, pursued rapidly a route which brought us to the most noisome quarter of London. Everything wore the worst impress of the most deplorable poverty and crime. Tall, antique, worm-eaten, wooden tenements, horrible, filthy, fested in the damned-up gutters. The whole atmosphere teemed with desolation. Yet, as we proceeded, the sounds of human life revived. Large bands of the most abandoned London populace were seen reeling to and fro. The spirits of the old man again flickered up, as a lamp which is near its death's hour. Once more he strode onward. Suddenly a corner was turned A blaze of light burst upon our sight And we stood before one of the huge suburban temples of intemperance It was now nearly daybreak And a number of wretched inebriates were still pressing in and out With half a shriek of joy the old man forced a passage within He stalked backward and forward Without apparent object among the throng when finally they were gone, it was something even more intense than despair that I then observed. Yet he didn't hesitate, but with a mad energy, he retraced his steps at once to the heart of the mighty London. Long and swiftly he fled, while I followed him in the wildest amazement, resolute not to abandon the scrutiny in which I now felt an interest all-absorbing. The sun arose while we proceeded... And when we had reached the most thronged part of the populous town, it presented an appearance of human bustle and activity scarcely inferior to what I had seen on the evening before. And here, long among the increasing confusion, did I persist in my pursuit of the stranger. But, as usual, he walked to and fro, and during the day didn't pass out from the turmoil of the street. As the shades of the second evening passed on, I grew wearied unto death. And stopping, full in front of the wanderer, gazed at him steadfastly in the face. He noticed me not, but resumed his solemn walk. This old man is the type and genius of deep crime. He refuses to be alone. He's the man of the crowd. It will be in vain to follow. I shall learn no more of him nor of his deeds. For he doesn't permit himself to be read.
That was Bernard Mays in The Man in the Crowd by Edgar Allan Poe. Our second story by Poe is also about a phantom, this one on the high seas. Here is Edgar Allan Poe's M.S. found in a bottle. Of my country and of my family, I have little to say. Ill usage and length of years have driven me from the one and estranged me from the other. Hereditary wealth afforded me a life spent mainly in foreign travel. Terminated, finally, by the incredible events here related. I had set out from the port of Batavia on a voyage to the archipelago islands. And I went as passenger, having no other inducement than a kind of nervous restlessness which haunted me as a fiend. We got underway with a mere breath of wind and for many days stood along the eastern coast of Java. One evening, leaning against the taffrail, I observed a very singular isolated cloud to the northwest. At sunset it spread, girding the horizon like a long line of low beach. My notice was soon after attracted by the dusky red appearance of the moon and the very peculiar character of the sea. The water seemed more than usually transparent. The air became intolerably hot, and as night came on, every breath of wind died away. A more entire calm it is impossible to conceive. The flame of a candle burned upon the poop without the least perceptible motion. The crew, consisting principally of Malays, stretched themselves deliberately upon the deck. I went below, not without a full presentment of evil. My uneasiness, however, prevented me from sleeping, and about midnight I decided to go up upon deck. As I placed my foot upon the upper step of the companion ladder, I found the ship quivering, quivering to its very center. And in the next instant, a wilderness of foam hurled us upon our beam ends. And rushing over us, fore and aft, swept the entire deck from stem to stern. The extreme fury of the blast proved the salvation of the ship. She rose after a minute heavily from the sea and staggering a while beneath the immense pressure of the tempest, finally righted. By what miracle I, I escaped destruction, it is impossible to say. Stunned by the shock of the water, I found myself upon recovery, jammed in between the stern post and the rudder. Uh, I, I regained my feet. It seemed we were among breakers so terrible. Beyond the wildest imagination was the whirlpool of, of mountainous and foaming ocean within which we were engulfed. Oh. Oh. He, he, it was the old Swede. Uh, he came reeling aft. Oh. Oh, God. Oh, God. All on deck, with the exception of ourselves, had been swept overboard. And those below must have perished while they slept. For the cabins were deluged with water. The main fury of the blast had already blown over, 
and we apprehended little danger from the violence of the wind. For five entire days and nights, during which our only subsistence was a small quantity of jaggery procured with great difficulty from the forecastle. For five entire days and nights, the Hulk flew at a rate defying computation before rapidly succeeding flaws of the wind. Uh, our course for the first four days was southeast by south. Uh, on the fifth day, the cold became extreme. The sun arose with a, a sickly yellow luster, clambered a very few degrees above the horizon, emitting no decisive light. There were no clouds apparent. Yet the wind was upon the increase uh, and blew with a fitful and unsteady fury. Uh, about, about noon, our attention was again arrested by the appearance of the sun. Well, sun, light all gone too. It gave out no light, properly so called, but a dull and sullen glow without reflection as if its rays were polarized. And just before sinking, its central powers suddenly went out, as if hurriedly extinguished by some unaccountable power. It was a dim, silver-like rim alone as it rushed down the unfathomable sea. Gone, gone down the sea. We waited in vain for the arrival of the sixth day. That day to me has not yet arrived. To the Swede, it never did arrive. Thenceforward, we were enshrouded in pitchy darkness, so that we could not have seen an object twenty paces from the ship. Eternal night continued to envelop us. All around us were horror. Horror and thick gloom. A black, sweltering desert of ebony. Superstitious terror crept by degrees into the spirit of the old Swede. We had no means of calculating time. We were aware of having made far to the south. Every mountainous billow hurried to overwhelm us. The swell surpassed anything I, I had imagined possible. The swelling of the black, stupendous seas became more dismally appalling. At, at times we, we gasped for breath at an elevation beyond the albatross. At times became dizzy with the velocity of our descent into some watery hell. Uh, we were at the bottom of one of these abysses when... Oh! Oh, see, see, almighty God, see! A, a dull, sullen glare of red light streamed down the sides of the vast chasm where we lay, at a terrific height above us, and on the very verge of the precipitous descent, over it, a gigantic ship, a huge hose of a deep, dingy black, and she bore up under a press of sail in the very teeth of that supernatural sea. For a moment of intense terror, she paused upon the giddy pinnacle as if in contemplation of our own sublimity. Then, then trembled and tottered and came down! Ah! Uh, uh, the, the, the shock of the descending mass had struck us. Ah, ah. I had been hurled here, here upon the rigging of the stranger. Uh, and finally, dizzy, in a dream, I was on the deck. I staggered to the main hatchway. Then, secreted myself in the hole. Why? 
I can hardly tell. An indefinite sense of awe had taken hold of my mind. for which I have no name has taken possession of my soul. A sensation which will admit of no analysis, to which the lessons of bygone time are inadequate, and for which I fear futurity will offer me no key. To a mind constituted like my own, the latter consideration is an evil I shall never, I shall never be satisfied with regard to the nature of my conceptions. Yet, yet is it not wonderful that these conceptions are indefinite, since they have their origin in sources so utterly novel. A new sense, a new entity is added to my soul. It is long since I first trod the decks of this terrible ship. Incomprehensible men, wrapped up in meditations of a kind which I cannot divine, they pass me by unnoticed. Concealment is utter folly on my part, for the people will not see. Just now I, I pass directly before the eyes of the mate. I ventured into the captain's own private cabin and took thence the materials with which I write. I shall from time to time continue this journal. It is true that I may not find an opportunity of transmitting it to the world. But I will not fail to make the endeavor. At the last moment, I will enclose the manuscript in a bottle and cast it within the sea. An incident occurred. I had thrown myself down upon the deck, and while musing upon the singularity of my fate, I unwittingly daubed with a tar brush the edges of a neatly folded studding sail, which lay near me. Now, the sail is rigged, and I look up and see the thoughtless touches of the brush spread out in the wind, spelling the word discovery. I have made observations upon the structure of the ship. What she is, I fear it is impossible to say. A huge size and overgrown suits of canvas. Simple bow, antiquated stern. There flashes across my mind a sensation of familiar things. Indistinct shadows of recollection. There is a peculiar character about the wood which strikes me as rendering it unfit for the purpose to which it has been applied. I mean its extreme porousness. It would have every characteristic of Spanish oak if Spanish oak were distended by any unnatural means. A curious apothem comes full upon my recollection. It is as sure as as sure as there is a sea where the ship itself will grow in bulk like the living body of the seamen. I stood among a group of the crew. They paid me no manner of attention. They all bore about them the marks of a hoary old age. Their knees trembled, their shoulders bent. Their shriveled skins rattled in the wind. Their eyes glistened with the room of years. Around them, on every part of the deck, lay mathematical instruments of the most quaint and obsolete construction. I see the captain face to face in his own cabin. 
and I regard him with a feeling of irrepressible reverence and awe and wonder. The singularity of the expression which reigns upon the face, the intense, the thrilling evidence of old age, so utter, so extreme. His gray hairs are records of the past. His grayer eyes are symbols of the future. His head was bowed down upon his hands, and it poured with a fiery, unquiet eye over a paper which I took to be a commission. He murmured to himself, and his voice seemed to reach my ears from a great distance. The ship continues her course due south, and colossal waters rear their heads above us like demons of the deep, but like demons forbidden to destroy. All in the immediate vicinity of the ship is the blackness of eternal night and the chaos of foamless water. But now... About a league on either side of us may be seen, indistinctly and at intervals, stupendous ramparts of ice. Ice towering away into the desolate sky, looking like the walls of the universe. The ship proves to be within the influence of some strong current or impetuous undertow, which... Now, howling and shrieking by the white ice, thunders on to the southward with a velocity like the headlong dashing of a cataract. To conceive the horror of my sensations is utterly impossible. Yet a curiosity to penetrate the mysteries of these awful regions predominates even over my despair and will reconcile me to the most hideous aspect of death. It is evident that we are hurrying onward to some exciting knowledge some never-to-be-imparted secret whose attainment is destruction. Uh, 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 the, the ship is at times lifted bodily from out of the sea. Uh, 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 the ice opens suddenly to the right and to the left, and we are whirling dizzily in immense concentric circles. Round and round the borders of a gigantic amphitheater, the summit of whose walls is lost in the darkness and the distance. But little time will be left to me to ponder upon my destiny. The circles rapidly grow small, smaller and smaller. We are plunging madly within the grasp of the whirlpool. The ship is quivering, oh God, and going down, going down. That was M.S. Found in a Bottle by Edgar Allan Poe. The technical production was by John Whiting, and the story was adapted and performed by your host of the Black Mass, Eric Bowersfeld. And now, good night. A country doctor. should be starting on an urgent journey. A seriously ill patient is waiting for me in a village ten miles away. But maybe 
between him and me, a thick blizzard fills all the wide spaces. I have a gig, a light gig with big wheels, exactly right for our country roads. Muffled in furs. My, my bag of instruments in my hand. I'm in the courtyard all ready for the journey, but there's no horse to be had, no horse. My own horse died in the night, worn out by the fatigues of this icy winter. My servant girl, Rose, is running around the village trying to borrow a horse. But it's hopeless. I know it. I know it. And I stand here. Snow gathering more and more thickly upon me. More and more unable to move. Hello? Oh, there's the girl now, uh, waving her lantern. Horse who would lend a horse at this hour for such a journey. Oh, I can see no way out. What good is walking about here? Now, there's the pigsty. Pigsty. Empty for over a year. A damned old door almost off its hinges. <laughs> Inside, uh, uh, steam and smell of, of horses. Dim stable lanterns swinging from a rope. A man, uh, a man crouching. An open, uh, blue-eyed face uh, crawling out uh, on all fours. Shall I up? Uh, what else is in the sty, I wonder? Well, you never know what you're going to find in your own house, oh, do you? Yes, that's a good one. <laughs> you, you never know what you're going to find in your own house. <laughs> oh, oh, look, look. Oh, look at this uh, thing. Enormous creatures. Uh, uh, how can they get out? They're, they're beauties. Oh, I think they'll make it. Uh, see, see, they're squeezing out of the door. Sheer strength. Oh, yes. oh, what, what did you say? Ah. Uh, Oh, that did it. Sear and clear. Sear and clear. Oh, yeah. I need some help in the harnessing. Uh, Rose. Rose, give him a hand. Hurry. Uh, yes, Rose. Uh, you give me a hand. All right. <laughs> what shall I do, then? Come on. Come on. Oh! Hey, hey, here. Watch this. Watch oh. this. Oh! Hey. Me. Look at my cheek. Oh, you brute. Uh, let me see, Rose. Let me see. Oh, yes. The two rows of teeth. Blood prints clearly defined. Uh, you brute! Uh, do you want a whipping, do you? Uh, well, on the other hand, uh, the man is a stranger. I cannot imagine where he's come from. Yet, of his own free will, he's helping me out when everyone else has failed me. There he is tying the horses up with the gig. Uh, no offense there. Oh, no, no offense there. Uh, a magnificent pair of horses. Fine. Fine. Here, help help me up. Uh, but but I'll drive. Uh, you don't know the way. Of course you'll drive. I'm not coming with you. I'm going to stay here. Oh, Rosie. Oh, oh, no. Rose. Rose, wait, wait, wait. No. Listen, you're coming with me or I won't go. Urgent as my journey is, I'm certainly not going to pay for it by handing the girl over to you. Oh, uh, wait. You let her alone, you hear? Hey, stop, stop! Uh, stop! Uh, I can't, can't see him through this door. This snow, we're almost blind. The snow is blinding all my senses. It seemed as if my, my patient's farmhouse had opened out just before my, my courtyard gate. Well, I'm already there. Uh, the blizzard has uh, stopped. Uh, moonlight. Moonlight all around. Uh, the patient's parents, uh, I can't understand a word they say. Uh, uh, oh, the sick room. Oh, the air, the, the air is almost unbreathable. 
It's stifling. The stove is smoking. Why doesn't someone open a window? Stupid people. Oh, oh, oh but, but there. Ah, there's my patient. Ah, ah, oh, a boy. A young fellow. No clothes on. Gaunt, vacant eyes. Hmm. But, but without any fever. Not cold. Not warm. Doctor. Uh, uh, oh, he, he, he heaves himself up from the feather bedding and throws his arms around my neck. Uh, uh, let me die. Uh, Please, let me die. Uh, no one heard, I think. The, the, the parents are all leaning forward silently, waiting for my verdict. Uh, boy, don't clutch at me so. Please, please let me die. Please. Ah, yes. In cases like this, the guards are helpful. Send the missing horse. Add to it a second because of the urgency. And to crown it all, provide also a groom. Oh, Rose. Oh, with that brute. Oh, what can I do? How can I rescue her? How can I possibly pull her away from under that brute ten miles away with a team of horses I can't control? <laughs> ah! Someone must have, must have loosed them from the gig. How could they have opened the windows, I suppose? There they are. Each one at a window. Their, their, their heads stuck through. Mm, watching the patient. Or oh, maybe they're summoning me. Maybe they're summoning me. I, I'd better go back at once. Wait. Huh? You're dazed by the heat. Let me take oh. your coat. Just wait. Hey, let me pour you a glass of rum. Uh, no, thank you. Not now. Oh. Stupid old man. How, how does he get the nerve to be so familiar? Uh, I suppose he, he thinks that just because he's, he's offered his treasured rum. Uh, now, now he thinks I'm sick. The narrow confines of his silly thoughts is the only possible reason for refusing, ah. Uh, and that, that woman. Uh, I suppose that's the mother. Why is she beckoning? Uh, she wants me to look at her son. Well. <coughs> now listen. Uh, his breast shivers under my wet beard. Well, uh, just as I thought, young man, you're quite sound. Uh, something a little wrong with your circulation. Uh, your mother's been filling you with coffee, eh? Uh, well, you're quite sound and you ought to be shoved out of bed. But I'm no world reformer. So I, I can only let you die. I'm only the district doctor and do my duties as well as I can. Uh, to the point where it becomes almost too much. I'm badly paid, and yet generous and helpful to the poor. Ah, oh, I must still see that Rose is all right. And then the boy can have his way. Ah, oh, and I, ah, oh, I want to die too. What am I doing here in this endless winter? My, my horse is dead, and, and not a single person in the village will lend me another. I have to get my team out of the pigsty. If they hadn't chanced to be horses, I would have had to travel with swine. That's how it is. That's how it is. And this silly family. Oh, they know nothing about it, and if they did know, they wouldn't believe it. To write prescriptions is easy, but to come to an understanding with people, that's hard. Ah. Well, this should be the end of my visit. I've once more been called out needlessly. But I'm used to that. I'm used to that with my night bell. The whole district has made my life a torment with that bell. But that I should have to sacrifice Rose this time as well. Lovely, lovely Rose. Oh, she's lived in my house for years, almost without my noticing her. That sacrifice is too much to ask. Oh, this stupid family, this stupid family... Well, with the best intentions in the world, they couldn't restore Rose to me. So what's the use of blaming them? Look at them. Oh, what a sight. 
Oh, what's, what's the matter with that mother? I suppose she's disappointed in me. Why? What do people expect? And a sister with her blood-soaked towel. Well, what am I to do? Uh, maybe, maybe uh, I should admit that the boy is ill after all. Uh, poor lad. Look at him. Smiling a welcome. As if I were bringing him the most nourishing invalid broth. <coughs> oh, those stupid horses. I, I suppose that noise was ordained by heaven to assist my examination of the patient. Uh, let's see, lad. Let's have another look at you. Uh, oh, wait a minute. W wait a minute. I, I was wrong. You are indeed ill. Uh, an open wound. Your right side, near the hip. Uh, an open wound uh, as big as the palm of my hand. Hmm. Uh, rose red. Many, many variations of shade. Uh, dark in the hollows and uh, lighter at the edges. Uh, softly granulated. Irregular clots of blood. Uh, open as a mine to the daylight. Ah, uh, but, but, but now that, that I look closer. Ah, uh, further complication. Oh, poor boy. Poor boy. Oh, worms. Worms uh, as thick and as long as my little finger. Uh, rose red and blood spotted. Wriggling from their fastness in the interior of the wound uh, towards the light. Worms. With little white heads and many little legs. Oh, poor boy. Poor boy, you, you are past helping. You are past helping. I, I have discovered your great wound. This blossom in your side has been destroying you. Poor boy. Poor boy. Uh, your family at least is pleased. They see me busy here. Your sister tells your mother, and, and your mother tells your father. Your, your father is, is telling several guests who are coming in. Look at them, look at them, walking on tiptoe, trying to keep their balance by, by stretching out their arms. <laughs> fools, fools, what, what a family, what a family. Doctor. Oh, yes, boy. Doctor, will you save me? Oh, poor boy. You are blinded by the life within your wound. Oh, that is what people are like in my district. Always expecting the impossible from the doctor. They have lost their ancient beliefs. The parson sits at home and unravels his vestments one after another. But the doctor, ah, the doctor is supposed to be omnipotent with his merciful surgeon's hands. Well, as it pleases them. I have not thrust my services upon them. If they misuse me for sacred ends, I let that happen to me, too. But... Better do I want, old country doctor that I am, bereft even of my servant girl. Uh, uh, and the family and the village elders surround me. Uh, they strip my clothes off me. Uh, What's that? Oh, outside, a school choir has gathered with the teacher at the head of it. What are they singing? Listen to them. Strip his clothes off. Then he'll heal us. If he doesn't, kill him dead. Only a doctor. Only a doctor. The family stares at me, standing here naked before them. But I am composed. I look back at them. My, my, my fingers in my beard, my head slanted to one side. I am altogether composed and equal to the situation. 
but it seems to have done me no good. They, they take me by the hands and feet and carry me to the bed. They lay me down in it next to the wall on the side of the wound and leave the room. Oh, oh, the bedding is warm around me. The, the horses' heads in the open window waver like shadows. You know, I have very little confidence in you. Why, you were only blown in here. You didn't come on your own feet. Instead of helping me, you're cramping me on my deathbed. I'd really like to scratch your eyes out. Uh, you're right. It is a shame. And yet I am a doctor. I am a doctor. What am I to do? Believe me, it is not easy for me either. Oh, come now. Am I supposed to be satisfied with this apology? Uh, I suppose I must be. There's nothing I can do about it. I always have to put up with things. A beautiful wound is all I have brought into the world. That was my sole endowment. My young fellow, your mistake is you have not a wide enough view. I have been in all the sick rooms far and wide. And let me tell you, your wound is not so bad. Done in a tight corner with two strokes of an axe. Uh, many a one prophets his side and can hardly hear the axe in the forest, far less that, that it is coming nearer to him. Is that really the truth? Or are you deluding me in my fever? Oh, oh it's the truth. It's really the truth. Uh, you can take my word of honor as an official doctor. All right. I'll take your word for it. I'll take your word for it. Oh, poor boy. Ah, poor boy. Ah, oh, but, but now it's time for me to think of escaping. Ah, the horses, the horses. Uh, uh, my clothes, uh, my, my fur coat, uh, my, my my bag. Oh, I'd better not waste time dressing now. Now I'm only going from this bed to my own, so to speak, if the horses get me home as fast as they got me here. Uh, uh, yeah, into the gig with my stuff. Oops, oh, 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 my, my fur coat is only hooked on by the sleeve. Oh, well, good enough, good enough, good enough. Uh, I'll get onto the horse. Uh, Ah, oh, now, now, gee up. Come on, gee up, gee up. Come on. Oh, uh, come on, gee up. Uh, come on. Uh, gee up. Come on. Uh, you're crawling along. Slowly. Slowly, like old, old men. Through all this snowy waste. Uh, oh, what are they singing? What are they singing? Oh, be joyful, all you patients. The doctor's laid in bed beside you. The doctor's laid in bed beside you. No. Oh. Never shall I reach home at this rate. My flourishing practice is done for. My successor is robbing me. But in vain, in vain, for he cannot take my place. Oh, in my house, that disgusting groom is carrying on with Rose, his victim. Oh, I don't want to think about it anymore. I don't want to think about it anymore. Oh, naked. Exposed to the frost of this most unhappy of ages. With an earthly vehicle. Unearthly horses. Old man that I am. I wander astray. My fur coat is hanging from the back of the king. But I cannot reach it. And none of my limber pack of patience lifts a finger. Betrayed! Betrayed! A 
false alarm on the night bell once answered. It cannot be made good. Not ever. It cannot be made That was a country doctor, a reading based on the story by Franz Kafka. Eric Bowersfeld was the principal reader with Larry Maiden, technical work by John Whiting. This program is one in a series of readings uh, which were originally produced for the Black Mass series on Cape. Welcome to the Black Mass. Tonight, a story about television by J. Anthony West, appropriately called Atrophy. to relieve pain, so relax tension, calm nerves. This message can save you hours and hours of pain, headache pain, pain, depression, pain. Oh, tension, pain, what's the matter? Anxiety, Foot's pain, gone to sleep, that's all. Oh. Pain, oh. Pain. Oh. It tells that today's tablet George, is... George, cut it out. George, you're making an image <laughs> jump. Oh, sorry, dear, I must have been sitting in the same position too long. More of this pain oh. reliever than any leading headache tablet. George, dear, you don't have to make quite such a fuss about it. I can't help it. Depression. Have to wake up. Tension. Anxiety. Fatigue. Everybody's foot forward to sleep. My foot to sleep right now. Ten minutes headache pain is gone. So depression's gone. The least you can do if you must hop, dear, is to hop out in the hall. I'll be damned if I'll hop out in the hall just to wake up my foot. You are being childish again. Childish? What's childish? What's childish about waking my foot up? It's your attitude that's childish. Attitude? I'm trying to wake up my foot. If you just sit down, dear, and forget it, it'll pass. All right. All right, I'm going to do that. George. What? Oh. Do you think you're doing? Can't I take off my shoes? Suppose someone comes. I suppose they do. You're sitting there with your shoe off. Well, can't I take off my shoes in my own house? But you only took off one shoe. I'm afraid I don't see the difference. Well, you're completely insensitive. All right, we'll watch the program. I'd have had <coughs> one more dollar. <coughs> I know, I know, I'm being silly. I can't watch the program when my foot's asleep. Other men could. You have no intestinal fortitude, George. Indeed, for you to say it isn't your foot. And if it were, I wouldn't make a fuss about it. Men are all big babies. What kind of work? Any kind that'll pay us wages. Marjorie, my foot isn't asleep. Then why make all this fuss about it? Well, there's something wrong with it. 
sure. I'm serious. Look, I can't move it. My foot's stiff somehow. Uh, See, it's so that it won't move. You're holding it that way on purpose. Don't take your sock off. There, will you pay attention to me? Just look at that. Now, now, do believe me, look. See, I can't flex my toes even. My whole foot's rigid. You're doing it on purpose. You just want my sympathy. Marjorie, darling, please listen to me. Look, look, see there? I can't move it. Well, you're not trying. I know when I'm trying and when I'm not, I'm trying. Try to move it yourself. I don't want to play games with your sweaty foot. My foot isn't sweaty? In this weather? All right, my foot's sweaty. You try and move it, though. Go on. I believe you. You can't move your foot. You don't believe me? I can tell by the tone of your voice. You're fully asleep, but you can't move it. No, I believe it you. It is not asleep. There's something wrong with it. Sleeping foot doesn't just go rigid, just like that. <sighs> You're such a hypochondriac, George. Oh. Every little thing. Just like the time you thought you had an appendicitis and it was gas pain. And what was I supposed to think? I was lying on the bed in agony. It might have been appendicitis. Well, it wasn't. And you're not lying in agony right now. Your foot is asleep. And why you have to make such a fuss about it, I, I just don't know. A sleeping foot doesn't just go stiff. It does, when it's very soundly asleep. Maybe you sprained it walking around. Uh, how would I do that? Oh, I don't know. When did you walk today? Oh, my usual walking, what do you think? I walked from the subway to the office. And I walked to the water cooler twice. Mm, no, it was three times. You see? Usually you only go to the water cooler twice. Yes, but I went to the men's room once. That makes up for it. You're always talking about things you don't know the first thing about. How am I supposed to know? Usually you go twice. That's precisely what I mean. Let's forget the whole thing. Still, you can overexert a tendon and not know it. Remember Geraldine Roberts? Yeah. She fell down the subway stairs and broke three ribs and didn't know a thing about it for a week. I didn't fall down the subway stairs. I didn't well, overexert a tendon and Geraldine Roberts was stewed to the ears when she fell. So what? Your friend Walter is a complete lush. We weren't talking Not about Walter. Juice product. <clears throat> Does it hurt? With no. You walk like a war hero, George. Only hurts when I laugh. I am not a war hero, and I don't want to walk like one. Don't be such a milkshake, George. You, save you could have been a war hero. How could I have been a war hero? I was in Jersey training recruits the whole time. Yes. Your, your, your training recruit and a nervous private drops a hand grenade. In another second, you see the whole regiment will be blown to smithereens and you, and you leap on top of it. Oh, and my it... God, all of which results in a stiffened foot, I suppose. Besides, I was training them to use a calculating machine. And if someone dropped a hand grenade near me, you can bet that... Oh. Marjorie, Marjorie, my, my other foot's gone stiff. I, I can't move it. You mustn't get this excited. Now, now, come and sit down, and it will pass in a moment. Your, your other foot's gone to sleep, that's all. Don't make such a fuss about every little Don't thing. Don't make such a fuss. Great Christ, you think I was just anybody? Me? George, your husband? Suddenly I'm paralyzed and I can't walk, and, and you say of that I... Of course I'm... you can walk. God. You were just walking. You call this hobble walking? Look, is this walking? There are millions of people who would give their right arm to walk that well. And what the hell do I care about them? It's me, George, who can't walk right now. I've got leprosy or something, and you just sit there. You don't have leprosy, George. If you had leprosy, your feet wouldn't stiffen. They'd fall up. Oh, my God. Leprosy, t'was all over leprosy. <sighs> da -dee -dee -dee. Shut up, shut up. Can't you see I'm frightened? <laughs> I was just trying to cheer you up, dear. Now, now look at it this way. Hmm. It can't be anything serious. If it were something serious, there'd have to be symptoms. Right? Now, now, there's no serious disease without symptoms. I think you should just go off to bed now and put the whole thing out of your mind. Your feet will be back to normal tomorrow morning. Oh. Oh. You have no idea, dear, how foolish you are. Do you think are. I care? Do I care about appearance at a time like this? You might at least try to behave like a gentleman. Oh, appearances, always appearances with you. All women are the same. Intrinsic value means nothing to you at all, as long as it looks nice. That's not true, George, and you know it. Nothing was ever more true. You'd eat horse manure if it came served with parsley. I would not. You would. I wouldn't. You would. Wouldn't. Would. Wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't. Would, would, would. Wouldn't, 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 oh, wouldn't, wouldn't. Oh, we sit here talking as though nothing was wrong and my feet are paralyzed. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? The first thing, George, is to relax. You mustn't let yourself get so excited. 
If you were a professional tennis star or something, I could <laughs> understand. But all you have to do yes, is... Yes, I it... suppose get to the office. As long as I bring home the bacon, it doesn't matter how I get there. President <laughs> Roosevelt had to go around in a wheelchair, and that oh. didn't stop him from becoming the... You pre... don't understand, Chris. You just don't understand. I understand, George. Believe me, I do. In a week, you'll get the hang of it. Really, you will. Besides, it'll be all better in the morning. You know it won't. You'll just find it cheer me up. No one's ever had this before. Nobody's feet ever stiffened. No, they're just like, not just like that. You always think you're better than everyone else. It happens to lots of people, dear. Oh, name one. I don't know any personally. That's just it. That's why I'm worried. If we just knew what it was. Oh, I suppose you're right. There's no point in getting excited. Better watch the program. There's nothing wrong with you when you go running to the doctor. Do you want me to call the doctor at this hour? I didn't say that. Glass for glass. If it's no better than more, we'll call him then. All right? Yeah, you know. You know, I think that's a little bit. Stop! Marjorie! Marjorie, my knee. It's my knee. I can't move my knee. Uh, look, look, will you look, please? Oh, for God's sake. Look here. My knee's completely stiff. George, dear, relax. Please relax. I'll go and call the doctor. Please relax, Doc. Oh. Hello? 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 Oh, hello. Oh, hello. Oh, he's not in. Marjorie, what's taking so long? The doctor wasn't in, dear. I'm calling another one. Oh, my God. Hello? Oh. Marjorie? Marjorie, for the love of God, my, my other knee. My other knee's paralyzed. Tell, tell him to hurry. I really can't carry on two conversations at once, dear. Marjorie, my knee. <sighs> well? Well? Well, what? Well, what do you think? What is it? What did he say? Just what I told you. Nothing serious. Huh. Well, did he know what it was? Of course he knew. Did uh, you think you were the only one? I told all right, you. All right, no sermons. Tell me what he said. What is it? Atrophy. Atrophy? Atrophy? Plain, common, atrophy. Just atrophy? So that's it, atrophy. Well, at least we know what it is. I told you. I told you. Wasn't knowing that scared me. Well, now, what do we do about it? Hmm? Well, nothing. Nothing? Nothing? You mean to tell me that I have a fatal disease... I have a fatal disease, and you sit there calmly and tell me there's nothing we can do? George, get hold of me. There's nothing fatal about the disease. The doctor said not to worry. Nothing can be done about it. But there are absolutely no dangerous effects. Oh, well, I suppose that's a relief. Nothing we can do. But there are no dangerous effects. Right. You can do anything you would do normally, except move. Well, that's at least something. We should be grateful for that. Ruth, hmm. you'll have to have courage, George. We have to have courage. We have to sure. fashion a whole new life for ourselves. Won't be easy. Mm. No, I can't face it. it. Happened too quickly. This evening I was a man in my prime. I could have done anything I wanted. Now... Well, we can start from scratch, George, dear. We'll start a new life. I can't walk anymore. I, I can't go for a simple stroll. You never went for walks, dear. When did you ever take a walk? That isn't the question. It's that now I can't even if I wanted to, and I, I was planning on taking a walk, actually. When? Well, this Sunday. I was going to walk around the block. You have to stop thinking this way, George. You, you can't give in to self-pity. It's such a simple thing, a stroll around the block. Stop it, George. You know you wouldn't have gone. I was planning to. There's nothing on the other side of the block, anyhow. How do you know? I've been there. And there's nothing? Nothing. Well, hardly That's what I mean. You see, I wanted to see for myself. George, you must take my word for it. There's nothing interesting to be seen. Well, I suppose I've just got to get used to the whole idea. <clears throat> my thighs. My thighs just went. I, I can't move them. Have courage, darling, please. For your sake, for mine, have courage. Good well, I suppose things could have been worse. <laughs> I suppose it hadn't happened at home, eh? <clears throat> <laughs> <laughs> yes. I mean, it might have happened in the subway or tying my shoelace or painting the ceiling. <laughs> you are wonderful, darling. Mm. I don't like this any better than you do. I can't go bowling anymore or fishing or play ball, nothing. George, darling, you never went bowling. 
You never did any of those things. No, true. But I'm still young. I could have done them. I can't think wrong. You never played ping pong. I always wanted to. Well, we have to make a living. You can't go to work. What will we live on? We have to eat. No, I hadn't thought of that. I'll work, George. I don't care. We'll get along, don't you worry. I'll do anything. I'll take in washing, I'll scrub floors, no. I'll, I'll work in a millinery shop, don't you worry. Oh, I'll keep us going. Now, maybe we can get back that modelling, shall we? George. Now, let's see now, you know, where we need money. With our social security, community benefits, disability, all our policies. Ten, twenty-five, twenty-five. You know, I think we... I figure forty a week. Yes. Yeah. Hmm. Well, the price we have to pay... Well, it's not so bad, not so bad at all. But, you know, we'll have more money. We can buy the things you've always wanted. My own needs will be less. Uh, just let me have... Uh, don't do that, dear. Don't do what? Reach for the peanut. Who knows? Any minute now and you'll be reaching for peanuts the rest of your life. No, Marjorie. I'm serious. If you want something, dear, ask me for it. Is there anything you want? You can still move from the waist. <coughs> my waist. The uh, atrophy hit my waist. Well, oh. stop, George. Why won't it stop, George? Won't it stop? Why us? Why not someone else? That's uh, selfish thinking, dear. Sitting around is so awful. It's awful sitting. What can happen? It's different if I, I went out to a, to, a, to, a, to a cinema and came back and found you atrophied and... Dying by inches. You know I'm not dying, and please don't get emotional. Oh, don't lift your arm. Don't do that. Tell me what you want, and I'll do it for you. Well, it's only a small thing. Anything, George, no matter how small. Yeah, uh, would you uh, scratch my nose for me? A little higher. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, life ahead of you, and you'll never be able to scratch yourself. Oh, George. I'll have to be beside you always. The scratch for you. No, when the atrophy is set in, there's no sensation at all. After just a few moments. That's the worst part of all. A whole life to live, and you'll never know what it is to eat. Oh, my dear. Oh. You know what I'll miss? I'll miss making my little snacks for the late show. I'll make you marvellous snacks, George. No, it won't be quite the same thing. Don't quite understand. You see, when you go to bed early, I stay up for the late show and the late, late show, and in between the two, I get a little hungry. House is completely quiet. Sometimes I hear buses down the avenue. Once in a while, a fire engine. Yeah, looks like there isn't a bit of food in the place. And I go to the refrigerator and open it, and a whole world of midnight snacks lights up there before my eyes. Herring and sour cream. Herring and wine sauce, sods and ends of cheddar. <sighs> Mento olives. Bed, quarter of cantaloupe. Ah, in the blue tree. Go through everything. Look around, pick out one, put it back. There are dishes, and dishes with covers on them, and little things that were left over we've forgotten about. One by one, take off the covers. There's meat, Paul. Two slices of roast beef. Look at everything. Don't choose. No, don't choose. Go to the bed box. Half a loaf of rye, three or four kinds of crackers. Don't you? Go to the pantry. Peanut butter. <laughs> Peanut butter. All kinds of jam. Hmm. Maybe during the day you bought some sardines. New brand, maybe. Hmm. Have some tuna fish, salmon. No, so I don't choose. Go to the cabin with the sugar and the flour and the breakfast cereals. Cornflakes. You know, there weren't any cornflakes yesterday. Hmm? Cornflakes. Hmm. Did I see peaches in the refrigerator? No. Yes, oh, I don't remember. I run to the refrigerator and if there are peaches, I'll have peaches. Cornflakes. More peaches. Cream. Uh, no, no, George, there aren't any peaches, dear, but there are strawberries. Hmm, not nice big ones. You can have cornflakes with strawberries instead. Oh, well. I never knew it meant so much to you. I never dreamed. Oh, it was only something small. Small things are the most important. Really, darling, it doesn't matter. Oh. I can... 
Oh, the arm just went. Oh. You know those roses? George. Ah, made it. <laughs> Peanut. Oh, you mustn't do that. You want to give me heart failure. George, you know what could happen. Just one more second. Yes, but I did make it, you know. There's nothing to worry about. Promise me you won't do that again. All right, I promise. But I had to reach for my last handful of peanuts, you know. You have more courage than most men, George. No one will ever tell me that my husband was a coward. Oh, don't be silly. It was now, don't be modest, George. You know perfectly well that most men would have just sat there. Men with less character would have hesitated. <coughs> the other arm. Look, look, see? You, you see? That split second was all. Other men would have been less decisive. And in that time... But you, George, you defeated. By fate. Oh. oh, I go all week inside when I think of it, George. I really do. I... George! What's it now, dear? Our lives, darling. Our lives are ruined. No, please don't start that over again. You have to stay in that chair the whole rest of your life. Well, we both know that, Madge, do I? don't. I don't think you know what that means. You can't ever leave, ever. Forever you'll always be sitting there. Of course. I know that. It's perfectly clear. You don't understand. You don't see. You all have to bring me my food. And that'll be a bother, I suppose. You'll have to vacuum around me. Well, I still don't see why you have to get so excited about it. You can't come to bed, George. Oh, that's so. I suppose I hadn't thought of that. Oh, with a couple of extra blankets, I'll be warm here. It won't be as bad as all that. And me, George? I'll have to get between the cold sheets alone. Oh. I'll do a couple of extra blankets and warm enough. We can't make love anymore. We aren't husband and wife. We aren't lovers anymore. Mm, I hadn't thought of that. Not another chance. Never again. Oh, George. That's the best part, George. I, I love most, then. Always in your arms and the little light glowing. You always said such silly little things. I loved you most, then, George. It's my fault, George. All my fault. If I'd been a little more understanding before, if I'd listened to my intuition just a while ago, when it was just your foot, we could have had one last chance. Just one last time in your arms. Well, we just didn't think of it, Marge. I didn't, and you didn't. Anyway, it isn't Wednesday. And it's no use crying over still. Our quarrels are made up there, George. The nights were all soft and tender. In your arms, I was a, a princess at dawn, George, beside my sleeping prince. It was marvellous. It was perfect, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. We were passionate. Yeah. Each day was an experience, wasn't it, George? Every night, eight hours out of paradise. We were happy. So very happy, weren't we, George? Yes. Yeah. We did things together. What lives we led. Everyone envied us. We made life so exciting. We never fought, never bickered like other couples. We were happy, weren't we? Mom? Oh, yes, I said we were. We were very happy. Good night, George. How will I get through the long nights alone? We're so young, George. Our lives were all before us. So young. I'm 32, George. A girl. A young girl. And you? 34. Your life has just begun. Mm. Uh, Mom? Yes, dear? Are you sure I'm, I'm 34? Certain. I'm certain. No, oh, George. Funny, I always thought of myself as much older than that. <sighs> It affects your mind, darling. That, too. No, 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 really. Um, well, you know how it is. I suppose one day is like the next. A year goes by and you don't notice it. <laughs> then fire. Oh! My neck. Oh, it's all over, George. Our lives are finished. There's nothing left for us. No, that's not true, Marge. We can still talk. Yes. Yes, we can still talk. That's right, George. We can still talk. Talk to me, darling. Well, I can't just talk. I... I have to have something to say. Well, of course. And when you think of something, you'll talk to me, won't you, George? Promise me. You mustn't worry, darling. I'll always be beside you whenever you need me. Oh. I'll stay by your side always. I'll never leave you for another. No. I'll refuse all invitations. Oh. I won't let myself be tempted. Oh. George. George, look at me. What? What? I can't, you know. My eyes are focused straight ahead. At the television. I didn't even know. Well, it's almost over. Thank God for that. George, are you blind? Can you see? Yes, I, I can see all right. Aren't you afraid, George? No, 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 I'm 
George, that's not your normal voice. Not that, too. George, George, talk to me. I'm frightened. Say something. Some last thing. Don't leave me like this. Tell me what it's like. What do you feel? I've got to know, George. It's, it's not, not so bad. It's not, not bad. Not bad at all, Ray. I, 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 I quite, quite like it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That was Atrophy, adopted by Richard Rowland from a story by J. Anthony West. The part of George was played by Bernard Mays, and Pat Franklin was Marjorie. The technical production was by Fred Seiden. And now, good night. Welcome to the Black Mass. Our story tonight was written nearly a century before psychotherapy was invented. If it had been the other way round, our hero might have suffered a little more, and we a little less. Here is Eric Bowersfeld and Bernard Mays as the madman, and Pat Franklin as the women in The Diary of a Madman. By Nikolai Gogol. October the third. An extraordinary thing happened today. Uh, first of all, I got up rather late. Uh, here, here are your boots, sir. Ah, Martha. Uh, what time is it? Just ten o'clock, sir. Ten o'clock? Impossible. I heard the clock strike ten hours ago, hours ago. Yes, sir. Just ten, sir. Oh, I must say. I'd as soon have skipped the office altogether, altogether. That cheap of my division. Oh, the way he uh, treats Tell me, my good man, uh, why is it you're always in such a muddle? Uh, you dart around like a hen on a hot griddle and get your work in such a mess the uh, devil himself couldn't straighten it out. It's just like you to start a new heading with a small letter. Uh, Look at that. No. Give no date, no reference mm. number. Oh, you're muddle-headed. Muddle-headed. Uh, this is old Crane. I know what it is, too. He envies me. He envies me. He envies me because I sit in the director's office and sharpen his quill. Oh, if it weren't for the prestige, I really would have left that department long ago.
Well, it was port. So I wore my old overcoat and took an umbrella and hurried along the avenue. Stop it. Look, there at the carriage. Just stopped in front of the store. Don't you recognize it? It's the director? Yes. Well, how can he possibly meet here? It must be his daughter. Ah, his daughter. Oh, quick, get to the wall. Is Oh, look at her fluttering out of the carriage like a bird, like a bird. Oh, God, I'm lost. Lost. Hide. Why? She recognizes your, your coat. What about my coat? Oh, it's stained and out of style. Quick, in the doorway. Oh, never mind. She's gone into the store. Why did she come out in this pouring rain? She tried to deny after this that women have a passion for buying clothes. She left her lapdog in the street. She's called Maggie. Yes. Maggie. Then another dog joined her. It was following two, um, ladies. Uh, well, the two dogs haven't been together for more than one moment when... Hello, Maggie. Hello, Fidel. Well, I'll be damned. Talking. Shame on you, Maggie. You haven't written in weeks. Oh, I've been sick, Fidel. What the devil is going on? Dogs can't talk. So oh, sorry to hear that, Maggie. Well, drop a line, Stu. I've got to run. Uh. Dogs can talk, they can. Oh, it's not so unusual. The world has seen similar occurrences. In England, a fish broke surface and uttered a couple of words. Well, I've never heard of a dog that could write. Oh, of course, not only gentlemen can write. Correctly, anyway. Ah, it was all very surprising. Then I must confess. Cribbling shopkeepers. Lately, I have been hearing things and seeing things that no one else does. But that's no sort of writing. Anyhow, I followed the women and their dog through the rain. No commas, no periods. I recognized the house they entered. Terrible spelling. They went up to the fifth floor. Well, good. I wouldn't go in now. I'd make a note of the place. And wait for the first up. October 4th. Today is Wednesday. And that's why I was at our director's home. In his study. I came in early and sharpened all the quills. Ah, our director must be a very brilliant man. His study is crammed with bookcases. Such erudition all over the place. What importance shines in his eye. Quick, what? The door. Huh? The director, stand up. Have the documents ready. No, 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 no. No, it's... Ah, oh, like a swan. And when she looks at me, it's like the sun. Hasn't the pa been in here? Ah, what a voice. A canary, an absolute canary. Hasn't Papa been in here? Oh, man. Don't have me put to death. But if you do decide that I must die, let it be by your own aristocratic little hand. Hasn't Papa been in here? No, ma'am. Oh, well, thank you. Oh. At home that night, I lay on my bed most of the time... Then I copied an excellent poem. Without you, one hour crept slowly like a year, like a year. Is my life worthwhile? I wept when you're not here. Hmm. Sounds like Pushkin. Sounds like. I put on my overcoat and walked over to the director's house. And waited by the gate for quite a while to see whether she wouldn't come out and get into her carriage. But she didn't. November 6th. I don't know what's wrong with the chief of my division. Well, for instance, yes, for instance yes, when I arrived at the office... Uh, quite today, agree. Mm, now mm. then... What I want to know is, what's the matter with you? Oh, what do you mean? Nothing's the matter with no, me? No, come now, try to understand. Aren't you over 40? Yes. Yes, well, isn't it time for you to wise up a little? Oh. Everybody knows what you're up to. Yeah. Everybody knows you're trying to make the director's make daughter. The... You. Ha! Just look at yourself. Look, look, what are you? Nothing, absolutely nothing. You haven't a penny to your name. Look in the uh, mirror. Look at yourself. Yeah. You haven't a chance in the world. Stop, stop. What do you know? What do you know? Oh, I can see through you. You're jealous. Jealous? 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 <laughs> and then you begin to notice the way the director has been favoring me lately. Oh. <laughs> and who are you anyway? A divisional chief. So what? Uh, I could be promoted to. I'm only 42, an age when one's career is just beginning. Yes. I'll go higher than you yet. I'll go higher than you yet. And God willing, very, very, very much higher. I'll have a social position beyond your dreams. Do you think you're the only one in the world to have dignity? Uh, give me a coat. Give me a coat and tie like yours, and you would be uh, worthy to polish my boots on my boots. And what, my good man, will you use for money? <sighs> yes. 
I like a meat. That's the only trouble. That's the only trouble. November 8th. I uh, went to the theater. Uh, th th there was a vaudeville show full of amusing things. Amusing things. Uh, and uh, making fun of everybody, even lawyers. It's so outspoken. I wondered how it got past the senses. It said plainly that merchants swindle everybody and that we all need protection from the newspaper men. Ah, <laughs> uh, uh, playwrights write very amusing things nowadays. Ah, I love going to the theater. As soon as I get a few cents, I can't help myself. <sighs> oh, one actress sang really well. Uh, what did it remind me of? Yes. Yeah. Who? <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, oh, what a rogue I am. <laughs> oh, never mind, never mind. <laughs> November 9th. Today I sat in the director's study and sharpened 23 the quills. Ah, how brilliant he must be. How I'd like to have a closer look at these people, see how they live, all their subtle innuendos and courtly jokes. Sometimes the door is open and I can see into their drawing room. Oh, you should see how it's decorated. Mirrors, mirrors, mirrors. Fine pieces of porcelain. <laughs> How I'd like to see into her room. Oh, her boudoir. All those little jars and bottles standing there amidst the sort of flowers one doesn't dare breathe. Oh. There's the dress she's thrown off, looking like. Air. Yeah. Her bedroom. Ah, oh, miracles, miracles. To see the little stool upon which her delicate foot descends when she emerges from bed. And see how an incredibly fine, immaculate stocking is pulled up a leg. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> oh, that stupid lapdog came into the room. Oh, oh Matchy, Matchy, well, 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 little Matchy. Uh, listen, listen, Matchy, Matchy, we're, we're, we're alone now. We're alone now, and I'll, I'll even lock the door so that no one will see us. Uh, Matchy, Matchy, tell me everything you know about your mistress. What's she like? What's she like and everything? Oh, I, I swear I won't repeat a thing, not a thing. Oh, but the silly little mutt ran off as if she didn't understand what I was saying. She knew, she knew. And dogs can talk. Most of the time they just choose not to. Because they're stubborn, they're stubborn. Well, anyway, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to that house and find Fidel. And get my hands on those letters that he's been writing to her. Yes, that's what I'm going to do. That's what I'm going to do. November 12th. At 2 p.m., I went out determined to find Fidel and question her. I found the house. I found the house and, and went upstairs. Yes? Uh, excuse me. Uh, do you have a dog by the name of Fidel? Yes. Why? I want to have a talk with her. What? I said I want to have a talk with your dog. What? Uh, the girl was stupid. I could see from the start how stupid she was. <laughs> oh, there's the mutt. There's the mutt. <laughs> now then. Get out. Get out. Leave her alone. <laughs> oh, you repulsive little creature. Bite me, will you? Ah, ah, there's your back. There's your back. It's just what I'm looking for. And underneath. Ah, underneath in the straw. What do I find? What do I find? Ah, <laughs> the letters, the letters. I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. Ah, ah the letters, the letters, the letters. Ah. You're mad. You're mad. Get out before I call the police. Get out. Ah, now at last, now at last, I'll find everything out. All about these intrigues and plots. Oh, plots, plots. I'll find out all the little wheels and springs at the bottom of the ladder. These letters, these letters. That will explain everything, everything. Oh, dogs are a clever race. They know all about intrigues. Everything is bound to be in the letters. But it was too dark when I got home. I can't read too well by candlelight. <sighs> so I lay on my bed and waited until morning.
Hmm. November 13th. Ah, let's see now, let's see now. This, this letter here looks quite legible. Uh, there is something canine about the handwriting. Um, dear Fidel. Dear Fidel, I'm very glad we have decided to write to each hmm. other. Spelling is very good, very good. It's even punctuated correctly. This is considerably better than our traditional chief can do, though he claims to have gone to some university or other. Well, let's see further on. I believe that sharing feelings and impressions with another is one of the main blessings mm. in life. Mm, the thought is stolen from a work translated from the German. The author's name escapes me now. I speak from experience. My young mistress, whom her papa calls Sophie, is crazy about me. Oh, oh, oh Sophie. <laughs> well, never mind, never mind. Papa often pets me, too. I drink tea and coffee with cream. Oh, I must tell you, my dear, that I am not in the least tempted by the bones Fido chews on in the kitchen. I only like the bones of game. And even then, only if the marrow hasn't been sucked out by someone else. Now, uh, what's this? What's this all about? What rubbish, what rubbish? As though there weren't more interesting things to write about. Uh, let's see the next page. There may be something less stupid here. Now I'll tell you with pleasure uh, what goes on in this household. Uh, what goes on? My uh, mistress, uh, Sophie. Oh. She's always very happy when she's going to leave for a ball. But is always very irritable while she's getting dressed for it. <laughs> you know, my dear, I personally can see no pleasure in going to a ball. Sophie usually returns home from balls at 6 a.m. And I can tell by her pale and emaciated features that the poor thing hasn't been given a bite to eat. <laughs> I confess, I could never live such a life. If I had to go without gaming sauce or chicken wing stew, I don't know what would become of me. The style is very jerky. You can see that it's not written by a man. She starts off all right, and then she lapses into dogginess. Well, let's see. Let's see another letter. Hmm. Ah, well, this one looks rather long. Hmm, no date. Oh, my dear. How strongly I feel the approach of spring. Oh, my heart beats as though I were waiting for something. In my ears, there's a constant bite. Very often I listen so intently behind doors that I raise my front paw. And confidentially, I have plenty of suitors. Oh, ho, ho, ho. you should have seen the dashing young lover oh. that came jumping over the fence into our courtyard. His name uh. is... Treasure. And he has <laughs> such a nice face. Oh, damn it, oh, damn it, oh, what rubbish this is. How much of our letters are going to fill up with such stupid stuff? I, I, I'm after people, not dogs, not dogs. I need spiritual food and I'm served these inanities, inanities. Well, let's, let's skip a page. Uh, maybe we'll find something more interesting. Ah. Sophie was sitting at the table sewing something. Uh, Suddenly, uh, the manservant came in and announced someone. Uh, Show him in! Sophie said. Oh, oh. She hugged me hard and murmured, Oh, Mercy, darling, if only you knew who that is. He's a guard officer. Oh, His hair is black, and his eyes are so dark and so light oh. at the same time, like fire. Oh. And Sophie rushed out. A minute later, a young officer with black side whiskers appeared. Sorry. He went to the mirror and smoothed his hair. Then he looked around the room. I growled a little good, good, good. and settled down by my window. Soon, Sophie came back, greeted him gaily mm. while I pretended to be busy looking out of the window. In fact, however, I turned my head sideways a little so that I could catch uh, what they said. What they, what they you said. cannot imagine, Fidel, dear, the silliness <laughs> of that conversation. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I said to myself, this doesn't compare to treasure. <laughs> Evans, what a difference. Really a tremendous difference. I wonder what she finds in her officer. I wonder what she finds. What on earth can she admire in him? Yes, here I tend to agree. Something seems wrong. It is quite unbelievable that this officer, this officer should have swept her off her feet. Well, let's see, let's see here. If she likes the officer, <laughs> I think she'll soon be liking the civil service clerk who sits in Papa's study. That one, my dear, is a real scarecrow. Scarecrow. He looks a bit 
Like a turtle uh, caught in a bag. Uh, which <laughs> clock can that be? Which clock can that be? He has a funny name, and he's always sitting sharpening oh. quills. The air on his head is like straw. Straw. Papa sends him on errands like a servant. Ah, well, that filthy little car seems to be trying to get even. Why is my hair like straw? So we can hardly control her laughter oh. when she sees you. Oh, you wretched lying little dog. What a filthy poisonous tongue. It is if I didn't know. It's all your jealousy, your jealousy. I know whose tricks these are too. I recognize the hand of our divisional chief here. For some reason that man has sworn undying hatred for me. He's trying to harm me. Yes, he is. He's trying to harm me. Harm me every bit of the day and night. Oh, still, let's see. One more letter. It may, it may make it clear. My dear Fidel, forgive me for not writing to you all this time. I've been going around in absolute ecstasy. I agree without reservation with the philosopher who said that love is a second life. Oh, love is a second life. Moreover, a lot of things are changing in our household. Oh, what, what, the officer what? comes here the every officer. day every now. Day now. Sophie is madly in love with you. Papa is very gay. I even heard uh, Gregory say that the wedding wedding is closer than... Because Papa always wanted to see Sophie married to an eye official or to an army Army officer officer. with a brilliant career ahead of you. No, 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 I can't go on. High official, senior officer, they get the best things in this world. You you, you discover a crumb of happiness. You reach out for it and and then along comes a high official or an officer and snatches it away. Oh, damn it, damn it, damn it. I would so much like to become a high official myself. Not just to obtain her hand in marriage, I don't know. Oh, I'd like to be a high official just so that I could watch them jump around on my benefit. I'd listen for a while to their courtly jokes and innuendos, and then I'd tell them what they could do with themselves. Oh, it hurts, though. It hurts. Oh, damn it, damn it, damn it. I'm gonna fight for those little dogs. Let us just, just spread. <laughs> December 3rd. Impossible lies. There can't be a wedding. Well, he has a commission in the guards. So what? So what? Does he have a third eye in the middle of the spotted or a golden nose? Why am I a clerk? Why am I a clerk? Why should I be a clerk? Maybe you only appear to be a clerk. Maybe you're a general. Uh, maybe I don't really know who I am. You know, there are plenty of instances in history when somebody quite ordinary, not necessarily an aristocrat, some middle-class person, even a peasant, suddenly turns out to be a public figure. Maybe even the ruler of a country? Yes. Now, if a peasant can turn into someone so important, where are the limits to the possibilities for a man of reading? Ah. I can see myself entering a room in a general's room. Yes. An epaulette on my right shoulder, an epaulette on my left shoulder, a blue ribbon across my chest. Yes. Oh, how that would be. Well, you can't be promoted to anything like that overnight. What I'd like to know is, why am I a clerk? Yes, why are you a clerk? Why precisely a clerk? December 5th. I read all the papers this morning. Uh, strange mm. things are happening in Spain. I don't understand it at all. They write that the throne has been vacated. Vacated? No, so that the ranking grandees are having difficulty in selecting an heir. Ah, an heir? It seems there's discontent. Sounds mm. very strange to me. How can a throne be empty? They say that some Donya may exceed. Donya? It's absolutely impossible. Of course it's impossible. A Donya can't exceed to a throne. King should sit on a throne. Of course, a king should sit on a throne. They say there is no king. Well, that's impossible. It's impossible that there should be no king. There must be a king. Well, he he might be hidden away somewhere. In an unlimited. Ah, yes. It's even possible that he's around here, you know, being being forced to remain in hiding because of family reasons or for fear of some neighboring country. France. Of course, France. Forced to remain in hiding. Well, there may be other reasons. December 8th. I was on the point of going to the office, but various considerations held me back. I couldn't get those Spanish affairs out of my head. How can a Donya possibly become a ruler? They won't allow it. Of course they won't allow it. In the first place, England won't stand for it. And then they must remember the political situation of the rest of Europe, the Austrian Empire. Our czar, our Of czar. course, our czar. I must admit, I was so worried and hurt by these events, I couldn't do anything all day long. After dinner, I walked the street. Uphill. Hmm. Down to. 
came across nothing of interest. Then mostly lay on my bed and thought about the Spanish question. Year 2000, April 43. This is a day of great jubilation. Spain has a king. They found him? I am the king. Oh, no. I discovered it today. It all came to me in a flash. Oh, it's incredible <laughs> ever to have imagined being a civil service oh, clerk. Such a crazy idea ever have ended by You would thank God no one thought of slapping you into a lunatic oh, asylum. Well, well, now I see a little clearly. But what was happening before? Things... Things loomed at me out of the fog. Uh, but now... Oh, wouldn't you say that all troubles stem from the misconception that human brains are located in the head? Yes. <laughs> well, they're not. The human oh. brains are blown in by the winds from somewhere around the Caspian Sea. Oh! Oh! Give, give away! Give away your man! Martha was the you first are... to whom I revealed my identity. Oh, when she heard I was the King of Spain, she flung oh. up her hand, almost died in terror. Silly woman, she'd never oh. seen a King of Spain before. Oh, carve yourself, Martha, carve yourself. I can assure you of my royal favour. Oh. Come now, bygones are bygones. The masses are so ignorant. True, true. She's probably frightened because she thinks that all kings of Spain are like Philip II. Martha, <gasps> Martha, I'm not at all like Philip II. Oh, the hell with it. Right, the hell with it. Well, I didn't go to the office. I'll never go there again. I'll never again copy those dreadful documents. <laughs> Martoba 86. Between day and night. Uh, you take it. Today the divisional chief sent someone to make you go to the office. Yes. You went? Well, just for the last. The divisional chief expected you to come apologizing to him for not being there for three weeks? Yes. Did you apologize? I did not. I looked at him with indifference. And what did you think as you sat in your usual place and looked around at all these scribbling rabbits? <laughs> oh, I thought that if only they knew who was sitting there among them. What a fuss they make. Uh, they gave you some papers to abstract and you drew the word. I didn't even stir. And when the director came in, what did the rest do? <laughs> they jumped up. They jumped up trying to be noticed. <laughs> did you jump up? Uh, never, never. Who says I should get up for him? He's no cork. Just a cork, the kind they used to stop up a bottle. That's all he is. But the funniest thing of all... Oh, <laughs> when they gave me a paper to sign. Yeah. Do, you know, do you know where they expect me to sign it? In the corner. <laughs> the clerk, such and such. Yes, imagine. <laughs> what did you do? I signed it. <laughs> in the space reserved for the director. <laughs> the, <laughs> the very one. The very one. <laughs> what, what name did you sign? I signed. <laughs> Ferdinand the <laughs> You did <laughs> ah, Yes, I did. Uh, and what, what happened? Oh, it's silent. But I merely waved my hand and said, graciously, the dispense with the manifestation of allegiance and walked out of the room. And what did you do then? I went straight to the director. Was he at home? No, he wasn't. <laughs> and you then proceeded straight to her boudoir? Oh. oh, she was sitting in front of her mirror. And when she saw me... <coughs> did you tell her that you were the King of Spain? Certainly not. I simply told her, Madam, you cannot imagine the happiness awaiting you. And despite all our enemies' intrigue, we will soon be together. Get out, you idiot! Women are such perfidious things, really. I never really understand them. Never really understand them. Who is woman really in love with? The devil, of course. Devil. Of course. You can see it. Just look over there. Do you see uh, in the front tier of the boxes? Uh, she's raising her lorgnette. Yes. Uh, she's looking at the fat man over there with the star. No, she isn't. Nothing of the sort. She's telling at the devil. Uh, where? There. Hiding behind the fat oh. man's back. Look, he's hidden himself in the star. Uh, and he's beckoning to her with his finger. She'll marry him, too. Of course she will. Mm. As for the rest of them, bootlickers. Mm. You know what they all really want? Annuity. Annuity. <laughs> some more annuity. You know, some patriots, they'd sell their mother and father and their god for money. The strutting betrayers of Christ. <laughs> and all this crazy ambition, this vanity. You know where it comes from? <laughs> the little bubble under the top. Of course. <laughs> Tiny worm. About the size of a pinhead in it. I think it's all the work of a barber on peace. Of course. I don't remember his name. You know who the moving force behind all that is? The Sultan of Turkey. Of course it is. <sighs> I bet he pays the barber to spread Mohammedanism all over the world. Of course he does. They say that in France already the majority of the people have embraced the Mohammedan faith. Of course they have. No date. A day without date. Went along Nevsky Avenue in Cognito. There's a Tsar riding past. Everyone's removing his hat. Well, I will too. I don't want to get the least sign that I'm the king of Spain. No, it would be undignified to reveal one's identity here in front of all these people. It would be more proper to be presented in court first. Yes. 
What's prevented me so far is the fact that I haven't yet got a royal sanity high. You know, you should get hold of a royal mantle of some sort. Well, I thought of having one made. You know, they're so stupid. They're not really interested in their trade nowadays. Actually, they go in for speculation. Most of them end up by mending roads. I know what I'll do. I'll make a mantle out of my best coat. Oh, you better do it yourself. Of course I'll do it myself. I'll lock my door so that no one sees me. Now, now I'll have to cut this coat into ribbons with the scissors. Ah, uh, 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 a mantle, after all, has a completely different style. A completely different style. Uh. Can't remember the day, nor the month. Damned if I know what's going on. Well, the mantle is ready. You're still not ready to be presented at court. No, why not? Your retinue hasn't yet arrived from Spain. Ah, that's right, my retinue. The absence of a retinue would be incompatible with my dignity. Yes. I'll wait. I'll wait. They should be here at any time. A first date. I'm puzzled by the unaccountable delay in the arrival of my retinue. What can be holding them up? I went to the post office to inquire whether the Spanish delegates had arrived. Oh, but the postmistress is an utter fool. No. There's uh, no Spanish delegates around here, but mm. if you'd like to mail a letter, no letter. we'd be delighted no. to... A letter? Oh, what the devil is she talking about? What letter? What letter? Letter by foot! Let druggists write letters. February is the 13th. So I'm in Spain. It all happened so quickly that I hardly had time to realize it. Uh, this morning, the Spanish delegation arrived for me, and we all got into a carriage. Ah, it is bewildering how fast we went. We went so fast that within half an hour, we reached the Spanish border. When I entered the first room, I saw a multitude of people with shaven hair. A Dominican or Capuchin monks, no doubt. Uh, they always shave their hair. Come on! The manners of the king's chancellor leading me by the hand were certainly very strange. Now you sit quiet in here and don't call yourself King Ferdinand again or I'll beat the nonsense out of your head. Oh, come now, Chancellor. We're alone now. No, I, I know that I'm being tested. Yeah. And I refuse to submit to this uh, indignity any longer. All right, then I won't. Uh, you? Uh, hey, no! Oh, oh, that, oh, that hurts terribly. But I didn't let out a cry. I contained myself. Remembering that it is customary procedure among knights on initiation into an exalted order. Uh, to this day, they adhere to the chivalric code in Spain. Stupid idiot! <sighs> Left to myself, I, I, I decided to devote some time to affairs of state. Tomorrow, as foreseen by the famous English king, Mr. Wellington, the earth will plant the moon. Yes, I confess I'm deeply worried about that. Uh, particularly when you consider the moon's extraordinary sensitivity and fragility. Ah, yes. The moon, of course, is made in Hamburg. I must say they do a very poor job. Well, England doesn't do something about it. It's a lame Cooper that makes the moon, and it's quite obvious that he has no conception of what the moon should be. He uses tarred rope and olive oil. That's why the stench is so awful all over the earth. We are continually forced to plug our noses. And that's why the moon itself is such a delicate ball that men cannot live there. <laughs> Only noses. Certainly. <laughs> that's why we can't see our own noses. Well, of course, they're all on the moon. And when you think... What a heavy thing the Earth is. That's right. When the Earth mounts the moon, all our noses will be crushed to a powder. Ah, what are we to do? Hurry, we better warn the Capuchin monks. Yes, of course. We must warn them immediately. Immediately. Hurry. Hurry. Gentlemen. Uh, gentlemen. Uh, uh, gentlemen. We must save the moon. Uh, the Earth is preparing to mount it. The, the captain monks were admirable. They rushed at once to execute my royal wish. Uh, many of them tried to climb the wall to reach the moon in time. Uh, but at that moment, the Grand Chancellor entered. Everyone scattered. Uh, I, being the king, uh, remained alone. January of the same year, which happened after Februarius. I still can't make out what sort of a place Spain is. The customs and the etiquette of the court are quite incredible. I, I don't grasp it. It's incomprehensible. They shaved my head. They shaved my head. Even though I shouted with all my might that I did not want to become a monk. They began to drip cold water on my head. 
I've never been through such torture. Who can understand the point of such peculiar oh, customs? But it's senseless. And the irresponsibility of the kings who never oh. got around to outlawing this custom, it's quite incomprehensible. I can't grasp it. There are indications that would make one wonder whether one hasn't fallen into the hands of the Inquisition. Inquisition? That Chancellor, for instance. <gasps> The Grand Inquisitor himself. Yes, but then how could the king be subjected to the Inquisition? Ah, true. Oh, true. Unless this is the work of some other country? Ah, France. Yes, that fellow Polignac. Polignac. That Polignac is an absolute beast. He, he swore to drive me to my death. Oh, there's no end to his maneuvers. Oh. And he is himself being led by the English. Of course, the English are great politicians. Ah, spread the seas of dissension everywhere. Everywhere. Yes, the whole world knows when England takes snuff. <laughs> France sneezes. <laughs> <It> sneezes. <laughs> Inquisitor entered Come my on. room. I, I heard him approaching, and, uh, and I hit on him. Where are you, you idiot? <laughs> uh, I remained silent. He couldn't see Bear me. Come uh, on, out of there. Oh, it's a trick. It's a trick. Oh, no. Oh, come on. They, they won't get me that way. They'll pour water on my head again. Oh, now, where are you? Oh, there you are. Oh, no. You're no. Spain no. hiding no. under a chair. Oh, come out there. Come oh, on. No, no. Come no. on. Oh, 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 he, he beat me terribly. Oh, 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 it's all right. He's gone. Come, come now. Think, think of your latest uh, discovery. Uh, that'll make you feel better. Which discovery? The one about roosters. Ah, oh, yes. Every rooster uh, has his, his own, own spain. <laughs> That's right. Of course he has. But he hides it. He hides it. Of course it. he does. He, he, he hides it under his feathers. Of course his feathers. <laughs> Thirty-four months. Year. 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 A war back. Three, four, nine. Nine. No. No, I have no strength left. I can't stand any more. Oh, oh, God, what they're doing to me. They pour cold water on my head. They don't listen to me. They don't hear me. They don't see me. What have I done to them? Why do they torture me so? What do they want from me? What can I give them? I haven't anything to give. I have no strength. I cannot bear this suffering. My head is on fire, and everything goes round me in circles. Save me. Save me, save me. Take me away from here. Give me a carriage. Give me a carriage with horses swift as wind. Oh, yes. yes. Yes, drive on, coachman. Let the harness bells ring. Soar up, my horses. Carry me away from this world. Father, 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 where I will see nothing. Nothing, nothing. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Ah, there's the sky smoking before me. A star. Twinkles far away. The forest rushes past me with its dark trees and the crescent moon. The violet bark is a carpet underneath me. Oh, I hear something through the fog. On the one side, the sea. On the other, Italy. Russian hut. Ah, Russian hut. Maybe that's my house over there. Looking blue in the distance. Oh, and isn't that my mother sitting by the window? Yes. Mother. 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 Save your wretched son. 
let your tears fall on his sick head. And see how they torture him. Hold me. Hold me in your arms. There's no room for him in this world. They are chasing him, Mother. And by the way, <laughs> have you heard that the day of Algiers has a wart? <laughs> a wart? <laughs> right under his nose. <laughs> right under his nose. That was The Diary of a Madman by Nikolai Gogol. The technical production for this broadcast was by John Whiting. The music was designed by KPFA music director Charles Shear. Eric Bowersfeld played The Madman with Bernard Mays as the alter ego and several other men. And Pat Franklin played the several women in their lives. And now, good night. Present an adaptation for radio of The Jolly Corner by Henry James. I know it's only a detail, Denver, but let's stick to the plan. No harm so far, but it's good we caught it in time. All right. We'll meet in the morning for another look. All right, then. Careful there, Alice. I'm sorry I had to stop, but you know you have to keep watch. I'm impressed. Impressed? The way you stood up. Think of it. All these years, you may have neglected your real gift. Building skyscrapers? Yes. If you had stayed in America, you may have discovered your real genius. <laughs> Adding more awful architecture to all this... this bigness. <laughs> Do you find it all really more awful now? 
Ah, they were ugly enough then, I remember. But with some charm. Now, proportions and values are upside down. The modern is monstrous. But you're here, and that's what you think of everything. <laughs> everything. That's too much. I dodge the question. Everything has somehow been a surprise. But even so, my thoughts are almost altogether about something that concerns only myself. Your property? Yes. <laughs> yes, exactly. I had to come back eventually to look after my property. This new monster is only a renovation. The apartment has flourished all along. I've managed to live for more than 30 years in Europe on the leases. My back turned. Now, now I've had no trouble catching on. Climbing ladders, learning about materials, looking wise. It's actually been charming. Amusing catching on to it this way. Well, you're going to be well off for it, too. Astonishingly much, I should say. You can turn your back again. <laughs> well, I don't know yet. You mean you'll live here, in one of your marble towers? <laughs> oh, never. I have my other property, you know. Oh, yes, the old place, you mean, on the corner. Mm -hmm. I wondered if you kept it. You kept it? Oh, yes, I've kept it. And it's for that, I think, really, that I returned. I yielded to a humor I've had. It hasn't changed. Oh. I've passed now and again. It's still as it was, except that it's empty. The corner has changed, I'm afraid. Ah, yes, the corner. The jolly corner. I called it that, and it was. I was very fond of it as a child. The happy years growing up there. Ah, finally, after my brothers died, the property came wholly into my hands. Yes, I suppose it was to see my house on the jolly corner again, as much as anything that I came back. Are we walking there now? I was hoping you'd show me. Uh, do you mind if we stop for a moment? Uh, would you like to see it? Oh, of course. Is it really empty all this while? Entirely. Except for Mrs. Muldoon, good woman who lives in the neighborhood, she comes by every day to open windows and dust and sweep. Oh, it must have been her I saw once when I passed. Uh, no doubt. Do you pass often? Oh, now and then. To get to the downtown... Uh. You see? Empty. Empty. Vacancy reigns from top to bottom. Oh, who's there? Is it you, Mr. Bryden? Uh, yes, it's me, Mrs. Muldoon. I, I brought a visitor. Oh, you gave me your start, you did. Ma'am? Uh, this is Miss Staverton. Hello, Mrs. Muldoon. Uh, don't let us interrupt, Mrs. Muldoon. We're just going to look about. There's no trouble, Mr. Bryden. I know you usually come later in the day, uh, but let me push back some of the shutters and, uh, and let in some light. Oh, to show you, sir, how little there is to see, I'm afraid. The rooms are enormous. Uh, too large, I'm afraid, for the times. For me. Unless you were a billionaire. Ah, yes. Had I but stayed at home and invented skyscrapers. The dining room is off there. Uh, but if you will, you can look down here later. It's my noonday round before leaving, and I can open up for you upstairs. Oh, don't bother about us, Mrs. Muldoon. We'll just walk about. Oh, no bother at all, Mr. Bryden. I'm only too glad to oblige. There's only one request I hope you never make to me, sir. Oh, well, and what's that? Oh, oh, well, if you should wish for any reason to come in after dark, I would just have to tell you, if you please, mm -hmm. but you must ask it to someone else. You mean there are things to see, then? It's what you might see, miss. And I put it to you that no lady could be expected to, like, scraping up to them top stories in the evil hours, could she? An evil hours? Oh, what with the gas and electricity off, they're evil enough. I've sometimes been late enough to need a taper, and it's been a gruesome march through all them grey rooms. I can imagine it, Mrs. Muldoon. What do you imagine? Ghosts? <laughs> do you imagine my jolly corner is haunted? Well, they'd be nothing to fear. Eh? Maybe. But I'm not of a mind to find that out, Mr. Bryden. Now, I'll go ahead and open things and, and leave you to your own. Then I must go off if you're not be needing anything. Well, thanks, Mrs. Muldoon. I'll lock up when we leave. Oh, uh, ma'am. There used to be a fine view here of the river. There you can still see a slice of it between the buildings. 
Ten stories higher, you'd have your view again. I suppose that's what they want. To pull this place to pieces and start up. Ah, uh, it's exactly what they want. They're at me daily. They can, for their lives, understand a man's liability to decent feelings. There are, after all, other values. In short, you're to make so good a thing of your skyscraper that those ill-gotten gains will afford you to be sentimental here. <laughs> well, yes, exactly. Uh, but is it sentimental? No, it's more. It searches me as I wander about. Oh, you prowl? Mere sight of the walls, shapes of the rooms, sound of the floors. This old silver-plated knob. I hold it and feel the slightest pressure of other palms. Dead ones now. Ah, Seventy years of the past. The ashes of my youth still afloat in the air. Well, I thought I had forgotten. But you can live here again if you decide to stay on. I might have lived here. I might have put in here all these years. Then everything would have been different enough. Ah, but that's another matter. And I can't now. And so the beauty of it, of my perversity, my refusal to tear it down, is the total absence of a reason. If there were reason, it would have to be a matter of dollars. So we'll have none. Not the ghost of one. Are you very sure that the ghost of one doesn't, sir? Oh, ghosts, ghosts. Of course the place must swarm with them. I should be ashamed of it if it didn't. Poor Mrs. Muldoon's right, and it's why I haven't asked her to do more than look in. Well, if it were only furnished and lived in. Ah, for me it is lived in. For me it is furnished. Ah, yes. Well, this old elm lives on. What a charming garden. The memory is so alive. So alive. Mother. Father. My dear sister, that was her room up there with the balcony. I've seen her a thousand times sitting there, looking down, calling. Ah, my brothers. They're all gone, simply having run their course. Having met their end one way or another. And what would have become of you? Ah, yes. All things come back to that. What might I have been? What course would I have run? An absurd, but I must admit, an intense speculation. A morbid obsession? What would it have made of me? What? I keep forever thinking about it. Idiotically, how could I possibly know? Well, you see what it has made of others. Uh, something, something. Would it have made something of me? Well, you're something else. Oh, Alice. I'm nothing. Nothing. Nothing at all. You followed your own preference. That's something. Yes, Europe. Europe running off. I liked it. I loved it. If I'd only the least doubt, I would have stuck it out here. But I was too young, 27. That small, tight bud transplanted to a climate that blighted him once and for all. You wonder about the flower. Uh, so do I. I've been wondering these several weeks. I believe in the flower. It would have been quite splendid. Quite huge and monstrous. Ah, monstrous. Monstrous above all. And I imagine by the same stroke quite hideous and offensive. You don't believe that. Uh, if you did, you wouldn't wonder. You'd know and that would be enough for you. What you feel, and what I feel for you, is that you, you'd you have had power. Ah, uh, you'd have liked me that way. How should I not have liked you? I see, you'd have liked me, preferred me, a billionaire. How should I not have liked you? Well, I know at least what I am. I've not been edifying. I believe I'm thought in a hundred quarters to have been barely decent. I followed strange paths and worshipped strange gods. It must have come to you again and again. In fact, you've admitted as much. That I was leading all these 30 years a selfish, frivolous, scandalous life. <sighs> and you see what it has made of me. You see what it has made of me. Oh, you're a person whom nothing could have altered. You were born to be what you are, anywhere, 
anyway. You've the perfection nothing else could have blighted. If I hadn't left, don't you see how I'd never have waited till now? The great thing to see seems to me to be that it hasn't spoiled anything. It hasn't spoiled your being here at last. It hasn't spoiled this. It, it hasn't spoiled your speaking of... Ah, uh, do you believe then that I am as good as I might have been? Oh, no, far from it. But I don't care. You mean that I'm good enough? Will you believe it if I say so? I mean, will you let that settle the question for you? There's an idea. Some idea which, however absurd, I cannot yet bargain away. Oh, you see, you don't care either. But very differently. You don't care for anything but yourself. Exactly, exactly. But he isn't myself. He's the just so totally other person. But I do want to see him. And I can. And I shall. Yes. You shall. Well, in any case, I've seen him. You? I've seen him in a dream. Oh, a dream. But twice, I saw him as I see you now. You've dreamed the same dream? Twice over. The very same. <laughs> You dream about me at that rate? Ah, about him. Ah. Then you know all about him. Well, what's the wretch like? I'll tell you sometime. Some other time. It was after that visit with Alice that there was most of a virtue for me in surrender to my obsession. I sometimes came twice in the 24 hours. I projected myself all day straight over the bristling line of hard unconscious heads and into the other, the real, the waiting life. The moments I liked best were those of gathering dusk of the short autumn twilight. The time which again and again I found myself hoping most. Listening. Feeling my attention, never before so fine, on the pulse of the great, vague place. I always caught the effect of the steel point of my stick on the old marble of the hall pavement, on the black and white squares, where I played once, long ago. A dim, reverberating tinkle from the depths of the house, of the past of that mystical other world that might have flourished for me had I not abandoned it. I'd put my stick noiselessly away in a corner. Then, feel the place in the lightness of some great glass bowl, all precious concave crystal set delicately humming by the play of a moist finger round its edge. The concave crystal held this mystical other world, and the murmur of its rim was the sigh there, the scarce, audible, pathetic wail of all the baffled, forsworn possibilities. What I did was to wake them. They were shy, all but unappeasably shy, but they weren't really sinister. At least, not before they had taken the form I so yearned to make them take. 
the form I hunted. Hunted. Hunted from room to room. Story to story. Long after midnight, with my glimmering light, moving it slowly, holding it high. And he... Oh, he would roam restlessly too. And when I stopped, I could hear him. He was cautious, shifty. His evasion laying on me finally a rigor to which nothing in my life has been comparable. No pleasure as fine as this tension. No sport demanding the patience and nerve of this stalking a creature more subtle, more formidable than any beast of the forest. I'd place my light on some mantel shelf and step back into a shelter or shade as if a rock or tree. Holding my breath. Living in the joy of the instant. With habit and repetition, I gained to an extraordinary degree the power to penetrate the distances, the darkness of corners, to resolve back into their innocence the treacheries of uncertain light, the evil-looking forms taken in the gloom by mere shadows, by accidents of the air, by shifting effects of perspective. And putting down my light, I could still wander on without it, pass into other rooms, see my way, visually project a comparative clearness. <laughs> it made me feel this acquired faculty like some monstrous stealthy cat. I wondered if I would have glared at these moments with large shining yellow eyes and what it would be for my poor heart-pressed alter ego to be confronted with such a creature. Apparitions. Oh, apparitions. People have been in terror of apparitions, but who had ever before so turned the tables and become himself in the apparitional world an incalculable terror? I like the open shutters. I opened everywhere those Mrs. Muldoon had closed. Closing them as carefully afterwards. I liked, and above all in the upper rooms, the sense of the hard silver of the autumn stars through the window panes. The flare of the street lamps below. <laughs> that was human, actual, social. The world I had lived in. That light supported me mostly in the rooms to the front and the prolonged side though it failed me in the central shades and the parts at the back. There the house was the very jungle of my prey. The place was more subdivided there. Small rooms for servants had been multiplied. Nooks and corners abounded. And there was a, a back staircase over which I leaned many a time to look far down. My whole perception was open to cultivation, bringing it to perfection by practice. Grown already so fine that I could hear. Hear. Well, there was something. Something unmistakable. I felt it as I walked. I was being kept in sight, tracked at a distance so that I should appear less arrogantly to myself merely to pursue. I'd make abrupt turns, wheel about, stop, seek it out. I had kept vistas clear, doors open, so that in the darkness my imagination might almost achieve it, project it, project into it. A refinement, a beauty, I had known fifty times the start of perception that had afterwards dropped. Had fifty times gasped, there. 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 
under some bond brief hallucination. But he'd retreat. Retreat. Though he retreated more reluctantly as time went on. Then, finally, one night, at the top among the more intricate rooms, he was there. He was there waiting, not falling back, waiting at the far end of a series of rooms I had just passed through, waiting, worked up finally to anger, ready to fight. Thus we stood, uh, both terror and, and what, rejoicing. Terror, but also relief that in that other form I could inspire such, such fear. Thus we were one and the same. The door between the rooms was open. And from a second another opened to a third. But there the chain ended. The third door, which had only moments before been indubitably open, had subsequently been closed. I stood before it. The question of danger loomed. And with it as never before the question of courage. For what I knew the blank face of the door to say was, Show us how much you have. Show us how much you have. It stared, glared back at me with that challenge. And he, he behind it shut up, defy and turning the situation. <sighs> oh, discretion. It could take its time. But at the threshold, this hunger so close to being met, it was amazing but also exquisite and rare that insistence should have quite dropped from me. Discretion. Discretion. Could it save the situation? I wouldn't touch the door. I wouldn't touch it. I'd only wait a little to show to prove that I wouldn't. I listened. As if there was something to hear. And this attitude between us while it lasted was its own communication. If you won't, then good, I spare you. I give up. We both should have suffered. I retire, never to try again. So rest forever. Rest and let me. I turned away. I turned away. I turned away and retraced my steps. And finally at the other side of the house I did what I had never done at these hours. I opened half a casement and let in the air of the night. Spell was now broken. And it didn't matter. The empty street. <laughs> its other life, so marked even by the great lamplit vacancy, was within call, within touch. High above I watched, as for some comforting common fact, some vulgar human note, a scavenger, a thief, some night bird, I would have blessed, positively welcomed that sign of life. But nothing. Oh, nothing. A discretion even there. Not the least stir of the great grim hush. The life of the town was itself discreet, under a spell. Great, builded voids. Had they ever spoken so little to any need of the spirit? Great, crowded stillnesses with its sinister mass. It was this large collective negation that proved to me at last what a night I had made of it. I 
thought, of course, of retracing my steps. There was, after all, the whole rest of the house to traverse for me to leave safely. Safely. Unless the door had meanwhile opened and he was once more at large and in possession. But if I saw the door open, if I saw it, it would send me straight to this window and make my way uncontrollably, insanely, fatally to the street. No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't look. That hideous chance I avert only by recoiling in time from assurance. Ah, assurance. Ah, assurance, assurance. I have the whole house now to deal with. <laughs> My instinct is all for mildness, but I ran, ran through the rooms, the passages, to, to finally the top of the stairs. Mildness, mildness, yes, I, I take it all with no rush. No rush, but quite steadily. Steadily. The house seems immense. The scale of space inordinate. They might come in now, the builders, the destroyers, they might come as soon as they want. Do you hear all your rooms, all your steps and flights? The wreckers will have you. The wreckers will have you a splintered pile. I descended as if to the bottom of the sea. The last flight to the lower hall. Oh, oh, there, the marble floor. Squares black and white of my childhood. Only to cross these once more to the door to safety. To safety. The vestibule gaped wide. The inner door had been thrown far back. That one I had closed. Oh, at last, he, he, to me, to touch, to know. The penumbra, dense and dark, was the virtual screen of a figure which stood in it as still as some image erect in a niche. Or as some black visored sentinel guarding a treasure. A treasure. My liberation. Oh, my supreme defeat. Grey, glimmering margin. Central vagueness diminishing, taking form, taking form. It was somebody, somebody, something. What made the face dim was a pair of raised hands that covered it, buried it. The head was bent. The figure wore evening dress of gleaming silk lappet and white linen. Pearl buttons. Gold watch guard. Polished shoes. A pair of thick eyeglasses hung from a string. My revulsion had become immense. He hides his face from seeing. Standing there for the achieved, the enjoyed, the triumphant life, yet he can't bear to be faced. Wasn't the proof in the covering hands? The hands. So spread that I could see that one of the hands had lost two fingers. They were reduced to stumps as if accidentally shot away. But even so, the face was guarded. Guarded and saved. Coward. Coward. Show yourself. Show yourself. Oh. No, no, it isn't mine. It isn't me. It is hideous, monstrous. It fits me at no point. Imposter! Imposter! The face is that of a stranger. It approaches, comes upon me nearer. He is evil, odious, blatant, and vulgar. He advances as for aggression, and I, I, sick with the force of his shock, fall back under this life larger than my own, this rage of personality under which my own collapses, turns to darkness, gives away, is gone, 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 gone.
Mr. Bryden. Mr. Bryden. Oh, ma'am. He's coming round, I think. Mr. Bryden, sir. You think this a scare you did? Mrs. Muldoon, he'll be all right. Uh, would you fix something? Oh, oh yes, ma'am. I, I go to my place for some tea now or broth. Some broth will be better now. I only be a few moments no. now. Mrs. Muldoon, don't bother. She's gone. She'll be right back. Alice. Don't move. Lie here a moment. We found you here in front of the vestibule. You had fallen. Oh, where was I? We thought you were dead. <laughs> it must have been that I was. Oh, yes, I can only have died. You brought me to life. How? And now I shall keep you. Oh, keep me. Keep me. Keep me, Alice. But how did you know to find me? I, I was uneasy. You were to have come. Do you remember? And you sent no word. Oh, yes, I remember. I was still out there in my strange darkness. Where was it? What was it? I must have stayed there so long. So you knew of this, of what has happened. I've known that you've been coming here. Known? Well, I believed it after our talk here. <laughs> that I'd persist. That you'd see him. Ah. But I didn't. There's somebody, some beast that I brought to bay, but it is not me. No, thank heaven, it's not you. Of course, it wasn't to have been. But it was. It was that. I was to have known myself. I, too, saw you. Saw me. Saw him. It, it might have been at the same moment. In my dream again. He came back to me. I knew it for a sign that he had come to you. He didn't come to me. You came to yourself. Now, yes, I've come to myself thanks to you. But this brute, this brute with his awful face, a black stranger, he's none of me, even as I might have been. Isn't the whole point that you'd have been different? Uh, as different as that. Haven't you wanted to know exactly how different? But anyway, you appeared to me... Like him? Yes. A black stranger. <laughs> and how did you know it was I? He told me you had seen him. You liked him. You liked him, that horror. I could have. He was no horror. I had accepted him. Accepted? I didn't disown him. I knew him. You, my dear, so cruelly didn't. You saw only his difference. Well, he was less dreadful to me. It may have pleased him that I pitied him. Pitied? He, he's been unhappy, ravaged. And haven't I been unhappy? Am I not ravaged? Ah, I, I don't say I like him better. But he's grim, he's worn. <laughs> Things have happened to him. His glasses, I recognize the kind for his poor ruined sight. And his poor right hand. And he has a million a year. He has a million a year. But he hasn't you. And he isn't you. He isn't you. Mr. Bryden. Oh, sir, you're all right again, I see. Now, shall I bring the tea to you here, or can you come outside? We'll go outside, Mrs. Muldoon. We're all right now. Go ahead, Mrs. Muldoon. We'll follow. No, he isn't you. He isn't you. That was The Jolly Corner by Henry James.
You heard Eric Bowersfeld as Bryden and Pat Franklin as Alice. The technical production was by John Whiting with music composed by Peter Winkler. The bassoon was performed by Bill Kaufman and the story was adapted for radio by Eric Bowersfeld. And now, good night. Tonight, a story we did on the Black Mass over two years ago. We were just beginning the series then, and compared with some of our later work, you may find this one a little primitive. But it was a favorite at the time, and we'll give it a final run through this evening. Here is The Score by Bram Stoker. My wife and I had been on the second week of our travels through Germany when Elias P. Hutchinson, hailing from Isthmian City, Bleeding Gulch, Maple Tree County, Nebraska, became one of our parties. The train ride from Frankfurt had been enjoyably colored by the racy remarks and observances of our transatlantic friends. His quaint speech and wonderful stock of adventures was sometimes a weird counterpart to a terrain and tradition so remote from his own. His destination, and ours, was the ancient city of Nuremberg. His sole motive was to view at last the device of torture modeled in the form of an iron virgin. This faithful romance had begun years ago in Bleeding Gulf, where Elias C. Hutchison had imagined gory scenes of torture as he poured over a small etched illustration of the famous virgin in Harper's Weekly. On the day appointed for our visit, the three of us strolled around the outer wall of the city by the eastern side. The burg itself is seated on a rock dominating the town and an immensely deep moat guards it on the northern side. The ditch has not been used for centuries, and now its base is spread with tea gardens and orchards. A little to our right rose the towers of the Burg, and nearer still, standing grim, the Torture Tower, which was and is perhaps the most interesting place in the city. For centuries, the tradition of the Iron Virgin has been handed down as an instance of the horrors of cruelty of which man is capable. We had long looked forward to seeing it, and here at last was its home. As we wandered around the wall, we paused now and then to look down into the moat. The garden seemed quite fifty or sixty feet below us. The July sun was hot, 
and we were lazy. We lingered, leaning on the wall. Amelia was the first to catch sight of the great black cat. It was just below us, lying stretched in the sun, while round her played a tiny black kitten. The mother would wave her tail for the kitten to play with, or push playfully with its paw. They were just at the foot of the wall, and Elias P. Hutchison, in order to help the play, stooped and picked from the walk a moderate sized stone. Hey, let's just have a little fun with them, critters. We'll scare them. I'll, I'll drop this stone here, right near the kitten. They, they won't even know where it came from. Well, be careful, Mr. Hutchison. You might hit the little thing. Oh, not me, that Wabbles. And there's a main territory, Lord bless you. I wouldn't hurt the poor, pretty little bit of more not scare up a baby. She gets a laugh on that. See, I'll drop it far away on the, on the outside of the deer. It's not to get near her. Thus saying, he leaned over and held his arm out at full length and dropped the stone. It may be that there is some attractive force which draws lesser matters to greater. Or more probably that the wall was not straight but sloped to its base. And that we could not see the inclination from above. But the stone fell with a sickening thud that came up to us through the hot air right on the kitten's head. And shattered out its little brain then and there. The black cat cast a swift upward glance, and we saw her eyes like green fire, fixed an instant on Elias P. Hutchison. Then she turned to the kitten, which lay still with just a quiver of her tiny limbs, whilst the thin red stream trickled from a gaping wound. With a muffled cry, such as a human being might give, she bent over the kitten, licking its wounds and moaning. Suddenly she seemed to realize that it was dead, and again threw her eyes up at us. I shall never forget the sight, for she looked the perfect incarnation of hate. Her green eyes glazed with lurid fire, and the white sharp teeth seemed to almost shine through the blood which dabbled her mouth and whiskers. She gnashed her teeth, and her claws stood out stark at its full length on every paw. Then she made a wild rush up the wall as if to reach her. But when the momentum ended, fell back, and further added to her horrible appearance. She's fallen on the kitten. Oh, Richard, it's horrible. A black fur smeared with the kitten's blood. I can't bear the sight of it. I can't do it. Amelia turned quite faint and staggered away. I helped her to a stone seat across the walk and remained with her till she had composed herself somewhat. Then I went back to Hutchison, who stood without moving, looking down, transfixed, on the angry cat below him. Yeah. Well, I guess that of the savages beat out of you. Sit once. Once when an Apache squaw. Took it out on a half-breed named Splinter. Splinter. I named him that cause of the way he chopped up her papoon. Uh, the Apaches had put his own mother to the fire torture time before. To show his appreciation of that in a private way. And he got hold of his squaw's baby. And he hacked it to bits before her eyes. I saw the whole thing. Savage again, savage. War got that kind of look. Like that cat down there. On the face, so set that it just seemed to grow there. Now, she followed Splinter's more than three years. The last of Patsy Brace got him and handed him over to her. Yeah. They say that no man, white or Indian, it had been so long a dying under the tortures of your past. The only time I ever see that squaw smile was when I aimed my gun at her head. Yeah, we got there too late anyway. Splinter's already passed in his chips. He wasn't sorry to go easy to sit there. That squaw smiling at me. 
Thought she'd get me too, same way she could. So I got and tore her head apart. You'll see that look sometimes. Same look at that cat down there. Same look. Whilst he was speaking, the cat glared up at us, silent, listening fiercely to the story. Then suddenly, she continued her frantic efforts to get up the wall. She would take a run back and then charge up, sometimes reaching an incredible height. She did not seem to mind the heavy fall which she got each time, but started with renewed vigor, and at every tumble, her appearance became more horrible. Well, I declare that poor critter's really taken it to heart. Well, that poor thing was all really an accident, you know. I guess that won't bring your little one back to you, will it? Well, now, you know, I wouldn't have had such a thing happen if anything in the world. That just shows what a clumsy fool of a man can do when he tries to play. Say, Colonel, I, I hope your wife don't hold no grudge against me on account of this unpleasantness. But of course, Mr. Hutchison. I quite understand that it was an accident. I'm afraid, though, that it quite shook me for the moment. Then we all went back again to the wall and looked over. The cat had drawn back across the moat, sitting on her haunches as though ready to spring. Indeed, the very instant she saw Hutchison, she did spring, and with a blind and unreasoning fury which would have been grotesque, only that it was so frightfully real. Oh, Richard, that cat frightens me. She leaped just then as if hate and fury could lend her wings. Mr. Hutchison, you must be very careful. That animal would try to kill you if you were up here. Her eyes look like positive murder. Oh, excuse me, ma'am, but I can't help laughing. Imagine a man that has fought grizzly bears and Apache Indians being worried about a mad cat. Finally, we moved on our way around the city moat. Every now and then, we looked over the wall, and each time we saw the cat following us. At first, she was carrying the dead kitten in her mouth. After a while, however, she abandoned it, evidently hid the body somewhere, and was following us alone. We crossed the little wooden bridge, leading to the gateway, whence ran the steep paved roadway between the berg and the pentagonal torture tower. As we crossed the bridge, we saw the cat again, down below us. Thank God he can't follow us any further. Yes, I'm kind of relieved about that myself. Yeah. Now, goodbye, old girl. Really sorry about all this. But you'll get over it in time. You'll get over it. So long. And then we passed through the long, dim archway and came to the gate of the bird. During our survey of this most beautiful old Gothic place, we seem to have quite forgotten the unpleasant episode of the morning. The old lime tree, with its great trunk gnarled with the passing of nearly nine centuries. The deep well, cut through the heart of the rock by those captives of old. And the lovely view of the city, whence we heard the multitudinous chimes of Nuremberg, all helped to wipe out of our minds the incident of the slain kitten. Finally, we crossed the paved roadway again and entered the torture tower. Truly a grim place. The dust of ages seemed to have settled on it, and the darkness and the horror of its memory seemed to have become feminine. The lower chamber, where we entered, was seemingly in its normal state, filled with incarnate darkness. Even the hot sunlight streaming in through the door seemed to be lost in the vast thickness of the wall. The custodian, looking to us as the sole source of his gains for the day, was willing to meet our wishes in any way. You are the only difficult today. You see, you have the space all to yourself. And if you are interested, we can make a more minute and satisfactory survey than would otherwise be possible. Uh, your eyes will get used to the darkness in a few moments. Uh, please, 
if you will follow me. The walls were coated with dust and marked here and there with patches of dark stains, which, if walls could speak, could have given their own dread memories of fear and pain. We were glad to leave the hall, and when we came up through the open trap in the chamber overhead, Amelia held on to me so tight that I could actually hear her heart beat. I must say for my own part that I was not surprised at her fear, for this room was even more gruesome than that below. There were ranges of windows of medieval smallness, but so high up that from no part could the sky be seen through the thickness of the wall. Dim, at times hardly more than a shadow in this ancient light, the old custodian directed us about his deadly chamber. No black against the wall. No in them the door. The headsman's door. Great double-handed weapons with broad blade and keen edge. Nearby were several blocks where on the necks of the victims had lain. Ah, please, notice there the deep notches where the steel had bitten through the flesh and shot into the wood. And over here, the rat. The rat. And another smaller one over here. Here, the chair of spite. Here, here the iron boot. Ah, and, and here, here the steel basket in which the head of the victim can be slowly crushed to a pulp if necessary. Everywhere, racks, belts, boots, gloves, collars. All made for compression at will, implements of torture, all modeled upon the simplest common objects clothing, household furniture, objects which ordinarily bring some kind of comfort and protection. Here in this chamber of horror, molded as from a nightmare into objects which have turned savagely upon their pigs. Horrible. It's all horrible. In this dim light, I can only see the victims. They call she faces. Hear their cries. But it's all of another age, Amelia. Long, long past. These are only skeletons. Deadly remains. In mind. Yes, in that. In this twilight, they seem still to live. Biding their time. Waiting. There is about them a hushed, gruesome expectancy. Richard, where is Mr. Hutchison? He was with us just a moment ago. He had left us just a moment before, heading toward the center of the chamber. And we saw him there now, standing transfixed before a great dark object to which the custodian now led us. But... The central object of this whole chamber of horrors is this engine, known as the Iron Bird, which stands here in the center of the room. It is, you see, a rudely shaped figure of a woman, hardly recognizable as intended for a human figure at all, but not the founder, shaped on the forehead, a rude resemblance of a woman's face. The poor lady, so long abandoned, covered with crust outside, it is still, however, in working order. And here, let me show you. It is easy at the wall, fastened to the little iron ring at the base of the figure. And drawn through a pulley fastened on the wooden pillar over here. Now, I pull the rope. So, the front section of the version opens like a door. And see the thickness of the iron wall. 
of the dreadful machine. And inside, just enough room for one victim to be paid. The door was a great weight, but it took the custodian all the strength, aided though he was by the contrivance of the pulley, to open it. This weight was partly due to the fact that the door was of manifest purpose, hung so as to throw its weight downward, so that it might shut of its own accord when the strain was released. The inside was honeycombed with rust. Nay, more. The rust alone that comes through time would hardly have eaten so deep into the iron wall. The rust of the cruel stain was deep indeed. Oh, Richard, look. Look inside the door. Indeed, it was only when we looked there that the diabolical intention was manifest to the force. We see the long spike, broad at the base, sharp at the point, placed in such a position that when the door should close, the upper one would pierce the eyes of the victim, and the lower one his heart and abdomen. Hutchison, still obsessed by this iron virgin, finally gave us the benefit of his thought. Uh, well... I guess I've been learning something here. Now, we used to think out on the plane that the engine could teach us just about everything on how to make a man uncomfortable. Uh, from here, though, seems we were a long way behind the time. Yeah, old Splinters and his squaw could have learned a thing or two to play on each other from this old world. You know, uh, I wonder how it would be. Standing in there. Ooh, but just one. Kind of comfortable. Leaning back that way. Can you see the door and the spikes? <laughs> you know, I can't help it. I just gotta do that. See how it feels in there. Oh, no. No, it's too terrible. Oh, now, ma'am, nothing too terrible to the exploring mind. It's a danger that draws us to it. And I've been in some queer place in my time. Spent a night inside a dead buffalo once when the Comanches on a war path. Five days in a cave in the Billy Bronco gold mine of Mexico. No, I never yet walked me out on a crazy time. And I sure can't begin now, or can I? I could almost understand what Hutchison was trying to say. It was hard to draw one's eyes away from the terrible iron concussion. The hollow shape, fitting the human form, had a strange, compelling effect. If one was not forced to turn away in half, one was almost hypnotized, drawn into the dreadful mist to satisfy the lust of this iron woman. Why, I wonder, didn't I stop poor Hutchison while there still was a path? Instead, I urged him to get through with the experiment. At first, the custodian was reluctant. But a small bribe from Hutchison gained his full cooperation. Hutchison wanted no detail overlooked that would add to the original experience. Consequently, the custodian produced some thin frayed rope and proceeded to bind our companion with sufficient strictness for the purpose. Half bound, Hutchison backed into the opening which was just enough to hold him. Indeed, it was a close fit. And there, the custodian completed the task of binding the legs and feet together. The victim, now helplessly fit, had reached a state of almost macabre elation. Well, there now. This here little woman don't see much room to bust in. Well, you take our coffin more room than you back it out of here. Uh, now, Red, uh, you just begin to let this door down easy enough for me. I just want to see a walk those spikes that move toward their eyes. Richard, stop him. Stop this. It's too terrible. I can't bear to see it. I can't. But there was no stopping now. And Amelia, still holding tight to my arm, shivered. 
whilst the custodian began to slacken slowly inside into the rope that held back the iron door. Hutchison's face was positively raised as his eyes followed the first movement of the spot. Oh, man, this is really it. Really it. Find out a show for a real pleasure like this since I left New York. God brought a tied out old continent, no bars, no injuries. Hey, no there, George Jones, you rush I want a show for my money, I do. The custodian must have had in him some of the blood of his predecessors in that ghastly house. But he worked the engine with a deliberate and excruciating slowness. After five minutes, the outer edge of the door had not moved half as many inches. But my attention was suddenly drawn to Amelia. Her grip had tightened on my arm. I saw her lips had whitened. She was looking not at the instrument of torture, but to a spot beside him. There. The cat. The cat. It was crouching almost out of sight, beside the iron door. Her green eyes shone fiercely in the gloom of the cat, and their color was heightened by the blood which still smeared her coat and reddened her mouth. Her stare seemed to hold me silent for a moment. She looked like a triumphant demon. Her eyes blazed with wrath. Her hair bristled out till she seemed twice her normal size. Only when she turned for me to spring could I call out a warning. The cat! The cat! Look out for the cat! But at that point, with a sort of hellish scream, she hurled herself, not as we expected at such a thing, but straight at the face of the custodian. Her claws seemed to be tearing wildly. And as I looked, I saw one of them hit the poor man's eye and actually tear through it and down his cheek, leaving a wide band of red where the blood seemed to spurt from every vein. Amelia had fainted in my arms, and holding her, I could do nothing to halt the terrible events before me. The custodian leaped back, dropping as he did so the rope which held back the iron door. Ah, the cord ran like lightning through the pulley block, and the heavy mass fell forward from its own weight. As the door closed, I caught a glimpse of poor Hutchison's face. It was frozen with terror. His eyes stared with a horrible anguish, as if day, and no sound came from his lips. The sight had done their work. Happily, the end was quick, for when I wrenched open the door, they had pierced so deep that they had locked in the bones of the skull through which they had crushed, and actually tore him, it, out of his prison, and still bound as he was. He fell at full length with a sickly thud upon the floor, the face turning upward as he fell. I rushed to Amelia and carried her out, for I feared for her very reason that she should wake from her faint to such a thing. I laid her on the bench outside, and then I ran back, leaning against the wooden column with the custodian moaning in pain as he held his reddening handkerchief to his eyes. And sitting on the head, the poor heart was the cat, purring loudly as she licked the blood that trickled through the gashed bucket of his eyes. I think no one will call me cruel. But I seized one of the old executioner's swords and chucked her in two as she sat. That was The Squaw by Bram Stoker. On our next Black Mass program, two weeks from tonight, we will continue our summer rerun with The Rat in the Wall by H.P. Lovecraft. And here is a brief coming attraction. I, uh, I heard voices, echoes, but above all that insidious scurrying. I felt them all around me. I was one of them, part of the ravenous army that feasts on the living and the dead. 
Well, why shouldn't rats eat a de la power? As a de la power eats forbidden things. No. No, no, I am not that demon in the twilight grotto. It's not Nari's body I tear apart. It's not blood I feast upon and flesh. You faint and fear at what my family do. Can I learn you how to block? Why is this wine can be so white? Morgana Mata! Magna Mater! I can do that! I'll arrive! That's The Rats in the Wall by H. P. Lovecraft, two weeks from tonight. Welcome to the Black Mass. On this program, you will hear The Outsider by H.P. Lovecraft. The story was adapted and performed by Eric Bowerfeld. Here now is The Outsider by H.P. Lovecraft. of childhood bring only fear and sadness. I know not where I was born. I remember only this castle, infinitely old and infinitely horrible, full of dark passages and dismal high-ceilinged chambers. The stones in the crumbling corridor seemed always hideously damp. And the smell everywhere coming up out of the deeper passages from the remains there. The generations of bones had led endlessly down into the earth. The light was a dim and uniform gray, throwing no shadows. Outside in the forest, there was no sunlight able to come through the trees. The branches thickly interwove overhead, cutting out all sight of anything above. 
here, except there was one black tower of the castle that reached beyond the trees. It rose up inside into a dark and inaccessible height. There was no stairway. It could not be ascended save by an impossible climb up the sheer wall, stone by stone. I must have lived in this place all my childhood, but I cannot measure the time. Someone must have cared for my needs, yet I cannot recall any person except myself or anything else alive. I think that whoever nursed me must have been terribly aged. My first conception of a living person was of something distorted, shriveled, decaying. I remember there was such a corpse. I often went to it with a feeling of reverence and attachment. It was a woman, an ancient, lying as she had died partly eaten around the throat and chest, the terrible gesture of horror in her sprawled position and opened mouth. I would sometimes roam the passage where she lay. I seemed to be drawn there. I wanted to kneel before it, to lie my head against it. Once, once I recall, I, I reached I reached out to touch her, and, and she seemed to draw away in horror as if some instinct of recoil had penetrated to the very bones of the hideous thing. It fell off the ledge, breaking apart on the stones below. I dared not touch her again. Otherwise, to me, there was nothing grotesque in the bones and skeletons that populated my world. They were, to me, more natural than the colored pictures of living people I found in many of the ancient books that lined shelves and piled corners. From such books, I learned all that I know. No teacher urged or guided me. And I do not recall hearing any human voice in all those years not even my own. Although I read a speech, I had never thought to try speaking aloud myself. I felt conscious of youth because I remembered so little. I'd wander outside by the moat, filled with a thick and stagnant water. Imagined it to be the great seas I saw in the picture books. I even constructed a boat, a toy boat, with mast, and set it upon the water. But the slime held it. It couldn't sail. I watched it slip through the surface, sinking slowly, inch by inch, down. down till it disappeared. Across the moat, under the dark, mute trees, I would often lie and dream for hours about what I read in the books, and would longingly picture myself there in the sunny world beyond the forest. So long. And now nothing is separate. Nothing. The pictures would fade. They were not real. Oh, oh, I wanted to make them real. I'd, I'd try to escape the forest. I'd, I'd run. I'd, I'd run, but the, the farther I ran from the castle, the more dense became the shade. The thickness filled me with a terrible fear until I forgot my search and, and turned back. Back. So through endless twilights I dreamed and waited. 
for what? Only skulls looked up at me, their gaping jaws, their silence. In my madness, I'd, I'd crush them. Who? Who put me here? Why? Why? My longing for light grew so frantic I could rest no more. The tower, the tower that reached up into the dark absorbed me. I stood beneath it and raised my hands into the abyss. There must be a way. There must be. I stood flat against the stones, grasping them. Strange I could hold on to the stones more easily than I thought. I... 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 I Pulled myself up, stone by by stone, round the tower, and up, up. And I stopped and, and and looked above. There was no end to the darkness. Below, the dim light seemed to be fading. But I had no fear. Oh, no fear. No fear. Only great anticipation. Why hadn't I tried before? There, there were ledges in the rock. And places to hold... Places to hold. Hours later, I had reached the top. I clung to the stone, my head against the roof, the stone panel that would lift. Oh, the climb had strengthened, not weakened me. Oh, it took a mere effort now to brace my shoulders against it and push up and out from the wall. The effort, the strain, was pure joy. It felt as if something else was working, some other thing in me that drew me out. Ah! I was out. Stone had fallen shut, but I had reached the outside. was the radiant full moon. I had never seen it before except in dreams and in vague visions. Memory. Ah, oh, sweet light. It fell upon me like... But where was I? How high above the trees It seemed I was on a stone platform, but vast, vast, an observatory. But there were columns about, broken, and beyond the platform other stones, small ones with inscriptions and dates. Between the stones. Ah. Earth. Earth. There stretched around me nothing less than the solid earth. Housed with marble slabs and columns. 
and overshadowed by an ancient stone church whose ruined spires gleamed spectrally in the moonlight. The earth... <laughs> the earth... <laughs> Was this insanity? Or dreaming? Dreaming? There was a familiarity. Oh, but no, this was the world. And I would go forth to meet it. There were meadows with the smell of grass and trees that did not cover the sky. Oh, and houses, houses. And some ancient ruins that my mind tried to reconstruct. But others, others with lights. Ah, I could see figures inside. Lights. Oh, my mind played tricks. If I looked too long, the lights would fade. The figures melt away. The walls seem ancient, ruined. As if my own castle back there. No, no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I walked on. I almost knew the road. On. In a direction. Yes. Inevitably in a direction. A large lit house. Surrounded by a park. With great windows. A blaze with light and sound. There was a courtyard. Oh. Oh. This was the world. Oh, how brilliant it was. How merry. I had never heard human voices before. And it was familiar to me. Some of the faces seemed to hold expressions that, that brought up remote recollections. Oh, they, they smiled. They talked to each other. They laughed, laughed. Oh, world. Oh, the windows before me were, were two doors. I put my hands to each to enter and, and pushed open into the joyous room. And the people became silent. They all stared with a strange and, and familiar expression. I, I, I tried to speak to them, uh, but it, it was hard to speak. Uh, no! I, I walked toward them, but they fled. They fled, their every face distorted, screams, hands covering their eyes. Stumbling, stumbling away. Wait, wait, wait. L like, like mist, they faded before me. They seemed to melt into the walls, through doors, dragging each other. No, wait, wait, wait. They had all been gathered before a wall, which now stood there. With gilded designs bordering an archway, but the arch was black, reflecting the room. There was only one figure in it. Vague as I approached. Then more and more clearly I could see it. It! Compound of all that is unclean. Unwelcome, abnormal, and detestable. The ghoulish shade of decay, antiquity, and dissolution. 
dreading putrid eidolon of some unwholesome revelation. The awful bearing of that which the merciful earth should always hide. It was not or no longer of this world. Yet in its eaten away bony outlines I saw a leering abhorrent travesty on the human shape. Mine, no, no, no! The eyes as I approached held mine open. I couldn't turn away. But I would wipe out the sight. I'd reach out. Uh, I stretched out my fingers to the abomination. To touch a cold and unyielding surface of polished glass. But it would yield. It would yield. It would yield. At that last moment, I had recognized him. When I returned to the graveyard, the stone door was immovable. Now, now I ride with the mocking and friendly ghouls on the night wind and play by day in the catacomb. I know that light is not for me save that of the moon. Yet in my new wildness and freedom, I welcome the bitterness of alienage. For I know always that I am an outsider. An outsider. Stranger in this century. For a time. A stranger among those who are still men. That was The Outsider by H.P. Lovecraft. The story was adapted for radio and performed by Eric Bowersfeld with technical production by John Whiting. And now, good night. Tonight, we present The Death of Halpin Fraser, adapted from the story by Ambrose Bierce. One dark night in midsummer, a man waking from a dreamless sleep in a forest lifted his head from the earth and stared a few moments 
into the black. Catherine. Catherine. He said nothing more, for he was dead. The man was Halpin Fraser, and his body was discovered the following morning by Sam Holker, the deputy sheriff from Napa, and Jim Jarrelson, a detective from San Francisco. The two men left the town of St. Helena at the first glimmer of dawn and walked along the road northward up the valley toward Calistoga. They carried guns on their shoulders. Their business was man-hunting. How far is it? No, only a little ways yet. Uh, there's a turn ahead, and it's just beyond that. Don't see how we'll see anything when we get there. No. This fog. No, it'll thin out and blow off around noon, I expect. Then <clears throat> we'll wait around until he shows. Till he shows? Oh, he'll show all right. I've seen him three hmm. times. You say he's been hanging around the graveyard? Yeah, yeah. Where they buried his wife. Huh? Now, she was the weirdy. Ooh. Maybe you can't blame him for what he did to her. You... Then he sure had a lot of practice before her. You see, she was a widow when he met her, in fact. <clears throat> Came to California to look up some relative. Then you know all about that. Mm. <clears throat> Strange people. Strange people. Well, well, now, here we are, uh, over here. You can see the graveyard's not kept up, not used anymore. Weeds all grown over the stones. Look out, you don't uh, trip on them over there. What about Branscombe? Shouldn't we watch out if he's around? Oh, no, you don't show up till dark. Uh, I thought I'd show you the ground, uh, and we could make some sort of plan for later. A grave is over here. He'll come by it like I saw him before. Over here under this spruce. <clears throat> you know, it's still a mystery to me why... Uh... He there. Hmm? He there now. What? He there now. Look at this. What is it? <sighs> hmm. Well... <clears throat> Is it Branscombe? No, isn't him. <laughs> Don't know who it is. The body lay upon its back, the legs wide apart. One arm was thrust upward, the other outward. But the latter was bent acutely, and the hand was near the throat. Both hands were tightly clenched. The whole attitude was that of desperate but ineffectual resistance to... What? There's a shotgun over there. A game bag with, with birds in it. It's out game hunting. Mm. Looks like he put up a fight, too. Yeah. Oak shoots all bent over. Somebody bigger than him, it looks. Mm. See the knee marks in the earth beside his hips? <clears throat> yeah. Strangled, all right. Look at the face. Well, Miss Branscombe did it, sure enough. Sure enough. I, I had been all day in the hills west of the Napa Valley, looking for such small game as was in season. Late in the afternoon, it had come on to be cloudy, and the absence of trails had so impeded me that I was overtaken by night. Unable in the darkness to, to penetrate the thickets, I had lain down near the roots of a large tree and fallen into a sleep. 
dreamless. Dreamless until I heard the name pronounced. I couldn't imagine why from my own throat. Then I, I lay down and went to sleep, but, but this time no longer dreamless. I thought I was walking along a dusty road that showed white in the gathering darkness of a summer night. Why or where I traveled, I, I did not know, though it all seemed simple and natural as is the way in dreams. The side road left off. The appearance having been long abandoned because it seemed it, it, it led to something evil. Yet I turned into it without hesitation, impelled by some imperious necessity. As I, as I pressed forward, I, I became conscious that my way was haunted by invisible existences. From among the trees on, on either side, I, I caught broken and incoherent whispers. Whispers in a strange tongue, which yet I, I partly understood. They, they seemed to me fragmentary utterances of a, of a monstrous conspiracy against my body and my soul. A, a shallow pool in an old wheel rut caught my eye with a, with a crimson gleam. I stooped and, and plunged my hand into it. It stained my fingers. It was blood. It was blood. Blood was everywhere about me. The weed showed it in, in blots and splashes on their leaves. The file and the trunks of the trees were, were, were broad maculations of crimson. And, and blood dripped like dew from their foliage. Oh, all this I observed with a terror and an expectation. Seemed to be all in expiation of some crime. I was aware of my guilt, but I couldn't remember the crime. I tried to search it out by tracing my life backward to discover the moment of sin. Scenes, scenes and incidents came crowding. One picture of facing in confusion another. But nowhere, nowhere could I catch a glimpse of the crime. I will not submit unheard. I will not submit unheard. Oh, there may be powers that are not malignant traveling this accursed road. I shall leave them a record. I shall leave them a record and an appeal. I shall relate the wrongs, the persecutions that I endure. I'm a helpless mortal <coughs> and a penitent. <laughs> I, I, I found a memorandum in my pocket. But no pencil. I have no pencil. Uh, I, I, I broke it twig from a bush and, and dipped it into a pool of blood. And, and I began to write. I wrote rapidly. Rapidly, I, I wrote my appeal. My appeal. Oh, I, I don't know where the words came from, but I wrote, I wrote, I wrote. Yeah. But it seemed I had hardly touched the paper with the twig when I heard her. Huh? At first, from some measureless distance away, soulless, heartless, a curse, a strange sensation began to take possession of my my body and and my mind. Some overpowering presence, a malevolence, approaching me, approaching me. I could not tell from what direction, from everywhere. She was everywhere about me. I, I, I had to complete my, my record, my appeal. I wrote, I, I wrote with, with terrible rapidity. The twig rilling blood without renewal. My appeal, my appeal, my... But in the middle of a sentence, I could not move my hands. My arms fell to my sides. 
the paper to the earth. I was drawn about. I looked up. I looked up. Staring into a face. Sharply drawn face. Blank, dead eyes. Standing white and silent in the garments of the grave. Uh, 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 Kathy? Uh, Mother! Mother! was the youngest. He was more delicate than the rest, and perhaps a trifle spoiled. His father had little time for him. His father was what no southern man is not, a politician. It took a good deal of his time, and I suppose it saved us from the war. But then later, other children were at school, and I had helped him all of myself. I was very happy. We were both very happy. His father wanted him to study law. <laughs> oh, my law. Harpin was a dreamer, a romantic boy. I knew from the very beginning that he could be a poet. Well, well, it was in his blood. And he was the living image and character of his maternal grandfather, the late and great Myron Bain. That was my father, the famous poet, you know. He died just before Halpin was born, so they never knew each other. But I used to think that Halpin was the very incarnation, the very living image. It's true, you know, that before Halpin was born, mine was all I had. Well, that was really how it was. My husband was in politics, you know, and the children came and went with him all so fast. And it's true, I can hardly remember a one of them now. Sometimes I think there was only helping after all. And before him, Myron Bain. Oh, Myron, we always believed we'd be together again afterwards. But being alive was... All we had, after all, wasn't it? You see, my father and I were, were very close. I was his inspiration. I was all he had. The only one he ever really loved. We had a perfect sympathy that the world would never have understood. So we had to take care. We had to protect our beautiful weakness. Our guilt... Then suddenly he died, and I waited in all this dark world until Halpin was born. His father wanted him to study law. <laughs> oh, my. The Tennessee Frasers were a practical folk, having a contempt for any quality unfitting a man for the wholesome vocation of politics. Well, Halpin was going to disappoint them. And they could see it from the first. And what they said about him only showed their ignorance. They said he wasn't a very bright and he was a crazy like his grandfather, Myron Bean. Oh, my. Sometimes you just have to shut the whole world out, don't you? So I expect his mother spoiled him a little. And you can't go blaming her for that, can you? How happy we were, Halpin and I. <laughs> I. I was still young, you know, they'd say. Halpin and his beautiful mother. Of course, from his early childhood, Halpin called me Kathy. Halpin and Kathy. No one would have known to look. They were jealous. Yes, they were of us, as our attachment became yearly stronger, more. And by 
the time he was 25, Harpin was the most beautiful of God's creatures on this earth. I must say, he didn't turn out to be much of a poet by then. But I knew that it might just burst out of him at any moment. He had it all in him, of course. All waiting. I tried to help him a little with his writing and reading. He was a little slow at first. But he was a dreamer. A romantic dreamer. You know? The two of us were almost inseparable. And by strangers observing our manner, we weren't infrequently taken for lovers. Oh, Ma, in all their wild days, they'd never believed how right they were. And we laughed at them, Halpin. We laughed at them, at their outrage and envy. We knew they envied us. That element. That element in all the relations alive, strengthening, softening, and beautifying. Yes, beautifying. Even those of consanguinity. Oh, Halpin, do you remember? Do you remember even a single moment? Well, then, then there was that day you left me. Happened to take a job with a local lumber company. Oh, he wanted to do something. Didn't want to be so dependent on me, I suppose. And this friend of his talked him into working for the Talcott and Bleecker Lumber Company. Well, he hadn't been with them a month. And then that day he came into my boudoir. I knew. I suppose I knew, Halpin. By the way, you kissed me on the forehead. And toyed for a minute with a lock of my hair. Had you stopped loving me already, Halpin? We, we can't tell, can we, when someone really stops loving? Kathy. Kathy? Kathy? Well, Halpin, I have a distinct feeling that there's something on your mind. What is it, Halpin? Oh, Kathy, would you would you greatly mind if I were called away to California for a few weeks? To California? It's for the company, Kathy. Mr. Talcott himself asked me to do this. California is far away. How many weeks? Only a few, Kathy. Four. Maybe five. Well, help him. It is hardly needful for me to answer with my lips a, a question to which my telltale cheeks have already made reply. Evidently, I would greatly mind. Oh, Kathy, Kathy, don't feel that way. I, I want to do this for the company, you know. Yes, you want to get away, Halpin. No. I know. I know. Oh, my dear son, I should have known this was coming. Didn't I lie awake half the night weeping because during the other half, my and Bane, your grandfather, came to me in a dream and standing by his portrait, young too and handsome as that, he pointed to your portrait on the same wall. And when I looked, it seemed that I could not see the features. You have been painted with a cloth over your face. A cloth such as we put on the dead? Your father has laughed at me when I've told him about my dreams. But you and I, dear, we know that such things are not for nothing. And how been? I saw below the edge of the cloth the marks of hands on your throat. Oh, Halpin, forgive me, but we've not been used to keep such things from each other. Perhaps you have a different interpretation of my dream, Halpin. Perhaps it does not mean that you will go to California. Or, or maybe you take me with you. That's such a strange dream, Kathy. You dreamed all that before. Didn't tell me. Well, now you know, Halpin. I remember hearing that there are medicinal springs in California. Places where one recovers from rheumatism and neuralgia. 
Well, now, that might do me some good. M- my fingers have grown so stiff lately. You, you see how pin so stiff, especially in the morning. I'm almost sure they have been giving me great pain while I slept. Like they was grasping something and I just couldn't let go. Like a throat, Kathy. Like a throat when you hold them like that. Oh, but that's only in a dream, Alpin. And we don't want to mistake a dream for real life. No, Kathy. No. We don't ever want to take a chance of mistaking a dream that way. That was the last thing you ever said to me, Alpin. Seems I remember it as. You were gone next morning. Couldn't see you for dust. Oh, how... At first, I thought it was in a dream you left me. And I couldn't wake out of it hard as I tried. My poor hands never straightened out. They tried to find you in all their emptiness. You never wrote. You just vanished like you never was. Oh. Oh, my. I came all the way to California looking for you. A long while in San Francisco, someone said you'd gone to sea. So I watched the ships and the sailors. I thought each one was you, Halpin. I may believe they were because I, I wanted to wake up out of my dream. Then a, a very mean man, a very mean man indeed took me up here to the mountains and we lived a while torturing each other. <laughs> I hid all his stolen money in the graveyard. Still looking for it, I suppose. Oh, he was very mean to me, Halpin. He, he had a little knife which he kept sharp as a razor. Kathy. Look, Halpin. Kathy. Look at oh. me. See what he did? <laughs> he, he said he, he wanted to find the spot that hurt the most. <laughs> but nothing hurt, Halpin. Nothing hurt. Kathy. Nothing hurt anywhere. Only the memory. And he couldn't find the right spot for that. See. But he got very close one dark night. See, Halpin? My delicate white throat. See how he cut with his razor knife from this ear to that ear. It, it never stopped bleeding, Halpin. Oh, you, you'd never believe how much blood could be stored up in one soulless body. See it, Halpin? Keeps me strong enough to come to you. Keep away from bring me, these aching hands no. to your own no, warm, to no. your throat. Kathy, no. See no. me happen. Kathy. No. See what's gone out of me. No, Kathy. Get away. Kathy. Oh, my. Kathy, no. Oh, please. Oh, love. Gone out of me. To Jarrelson and Hulker, the nature of the struggle was made clear by a glance. The face and throat were purple, almost black. The shoulders lay upon a low mound, and the head was turned back at an angle otherwise impossible. From the froth filling the open mouth, the tongue protruded, black and swollen. 
The throat showed terrible contusions, not mere finger marks, but bruises and lacerations wrought by two strong hands that must have bedded themselves in the yielding flesh, maintaining their terrible grasp until long after death. Yeah, the work of a maniac, all right. Branscombe LaRue. Look here. Uh, looks like he was writing something in a memorandum pad. Uh, pretty scrawly. Well, I guess under the circumstances. Can you make it out? Uh, let's see. Uh, poetry, looks like. Uh, uh, the, the air was stagnant all. Silence was a living thing that breathed among trees. Mm -hmm. um, with blood, the trees were all a drip. Sounds like Bane. Uh, Bane? Who's Bane? Myron Bane. Poet half a century ago. Now, why would this poor fellow want to be copying down that dismal stuff? Mm. Dismal, all right. Well, in a way, I guess it figures. Everyone who has traveled over eastern England knows the smaller country houses with which it is studded. The rather dank buildings, usually in the Italian style surrounded with parks of some 80 to 100 acres. I have to tell you of a curious series of events which happened in such a house. It is Castringham Hall in Suffolk. I think a good deal has been done to the building since the period of my story. One feature that marked out the house from a score of others is gone. As you looked at it from the park, you saw on the right a great old ash tree growing within half a dozen yards of the wall and almost or quite touching the building with its branches. I suppose it had stood there ever since Castringham ceased to be a fortified place. At any rate, it had well nigh attained its full dimensions in the year 1690. In that year, the district in which the house is situated was the scene of a number of witch trials. Castringham contributed a victim to the extortions. Mrs. Mothersole was her name. And she differed from the ordinary run of village witches only in being rather better off and in a more influential position. Efforts were made to save her by several reputable farmers of the parish. But what seems to have been fatal to the woman was the evidence of the then proprietor of Castringham Hall, Sir Matthew Fell. Sir Matthew, will you tell the court, please, what you saw regarding Mrs. Mothersoul on the evenings that you mentioned? Uh, well... On three different occasions from my window, I watched her, uh, uh, Mrs. Mothersole, at the full of the moon, gathering sprigs from the ash tree near my house. Uh, she had climbed into the branches and was cutting off small twigs with a peculiarly curved knife. And uh, as she did so, she seemed to be talking to herself. On each occasion, I did my best to capture the woman. But she had always taken alarm at some accidental noise I had made. All I could see when I got down to the garden was a hare running across the path in the direction of the village. And on the third night, I followed her at what speed I could. Now, I went straight to Mrs. Mothersole's house. I had to wait a quarter of an hour battering at her door. And when she came out, she was very cross. And apparently very sleepy. 
as if just out of bed. And as I had no good explanation to offer, I had to apologize, rather embarrassingly. Mainly on this evidence, though there was much more of a less striking and unusual kind from other parishioners, Mrs. Mothersole was found guilty and condemned to die. She was hanged a week after the trial with five or six more unhappy creatures. The other victims were apathetic or broken down with misery. But Mrs. Mothersole was, as in life so in death, of a very different temper. Oh, her poisonous rage did so work upon the bystanders, yea, even upon the hangman, that it was constantly affirmed of all that saw her that she presented the very living aspect of a mad devil. Uh, yet she offered no resistance to the officers of the law. Mm, only she looked upon those that laid hands upon her with so direful and venomous an aspect. Aye, aye, the mere thought of it prayed inwardly upon my mind for six months after. However, all that Mrs. Mothersole is reported to have said were seemingly meaningless words. There will be guests at the hall. There will be guests at Castringham Hall, Sir Matthew. There will be guests at the hall. Sir Matthew Fell, then Deputy Sheriff, was present at the execution and was not unimpressed at the bearing of the woman. He shared certain misgivings over the whole business with the vicar of his parish as they rode from the scene of the gallows. I'll say it again, Mr. Crome. My evidence at the trial was not given willingly. I'm not at all specially infected with the witch-finding mania. But I declare that I could not give any other account of the matter than, than what I had given. And I could not possibly have been mistaken in what I saw. Ah, but the whole transaction has been repugnant to me. Now, I am a man who likes to be on pleasant terms with those about me. Yes, those are my sentiments, Mr. Crone. And the good vicar applauded them as any reasonable man would have done, and was easily persuaded to take a late supper at the hall. When Mr. Crome thought of starting for home about half past nine o'clock, Sir Matthew and he took a turn on the graveled walk at the back of the house. They were in sight of the ash tree, which I described as growing near the windows of the building. When Sir Matthew stopped, uh, Mr. Crome. Uh, look there a moment. Where, Sir Matthew? Um, at the ash tree there. Uh, look, what is that that runs up and down the trunk of it? It is never a squirrel. They will all be in their nests by now. Ah, oh, yes, I see some sort of, of moving creature. Uh, what can you make of it, Mr. Crome? Nothing of its color in this moonlight, Sir Matthew. Ah, but now it's gone. Uh, was it a squirrel? Oh, well, for an instant there was a sharp outline. And I could swear, though it sounds foolish, that squirrel or not, uh, it had more than four legs. Aye, more than four legs, Sir Matthew. <laughs> Next day, Sir Matthew Fell was not downstairs at six in the morning, as was his custom. Nor at seven. Nor yet at eight. Hereupon, the servants went and knocked at his chamber door. When the door was at last opened from the outside, they found their master dead and black. Mr. Crone came as quickly as he could to the hall and was shown to the room where the dead man lay. Many years later, Mr. Crome's notes regarding this incident were found among his papers. 
they showed how genuine a respect and sorrow he felt for Sir Matthew. And they also threw some light upon the common beliefs of the time. There was not any the least trace of an entrance having been forced to the chamber. But the casement stood open, as my poor friend would always have it in this season. He had his evening drink of small ale in a silver vessel of about a pint measure, and tonight had not drunk it out. This drink was examined by the physician from Berry, Mr. Hodgkins, who could not, however, as he afterward declared upon his oath before the coroner's quest, discover that any matter of a venomous kind was present in it. For, as was natural in the great swelling and blackness of the corpse, there was talk made among the neighbors of poison. The body was very much disordered as it lay in the bed being twisted after so extreme a sort has gave too probable a conjecture that my worthy friend and patron had expired in great pain and agony. And what is as yet unexplained, and to myself the argument of some horrid and artful design in the perpetrators of this barbarous murder, was this that the women which were entrusted with the laying out of the corpse and washing it, being both sad persons and very well respected in their mournful profession, came to me in great pain and distress, both of mind and body, saying what was indeed confirmed upon the first view. We had no sooner touched the breast of the corpse with our naked hands then we felt a violent smart and aching in our palms. I am the swelling, oh, the swelling from the palms to the elbows so immoderately. The pain still continuing that for many weeks afterwards we were forced to lay by the exercise of our calling. And yet no mark to be seen on the skin. No mark seen on the skin. Upon hearing this, I sent for the physician. And we made as careful a proof as we were able by the help of a small magnifying lens of the condition of the skin on this part of the body. But we could not detect any matter of importance beyond a couple of small punctures or pricks, which we then concluded were the spots by which the poison might be introduced. Remembering that ring of Pope Borgia, with other known specimens of the horrid art of the Italian poisoners of the last age. So much is to be said of the symptoms seen on the corpse. As to what I am to add, it is merely my own experiment, and to be left to posterity to judge whether there be anything of value therein. There was on the table by the bedside a Bible, of the small size in which my friend used nightly and upon his first rising to read a set portion. And I taking it up, not without a tear duly paid to him, it came into my thoughts to make trial of that old and by many accounted superstitious practice of drawing the swords. I must needs admit that by my trial not much assistance was afforded me. Yet, as the cause and origin of these dreadful events may hereafter be searched out, I set down the results. In the case, it may be found that they pointed the true quarter of the mischief to a quicker intelligence than my own. I made, then, three trials opening the book and placing my finger upon certain words, which gave in the first uh, these words from St. Luke, um, chapter 13, uh, verse 7. Cut it down. Cut it down. 
Under in the second, uh, Isaiah, uh, chapter 13, uh, verse 20. It shall never be inhabited. It shall never be inhabited. And upon the third experiment, uh, uh, Job, uh, chapter 39, uh, verse 30. My young ones also suck up blood. My young ones also suck up blood. <laughs> This is all that need be quoted from Mr. Crome's paper. Sir Matthew Fell was duly coffined and laid into the earth. His son, Sir Matthew II, succeeded to the title and estates. It is to be mentioned, though the fact is not surprising, that the new baronet did not occupy the room in which his father had died. Nor, indeed, was it slept in by anyone but an occasional visitor during the whole of his occupation. He died in 1735. And I do not find that anything particular marked his reign, save a curiously constant mortality among his cattle and livestock in general, which showed a tendency to increase as time went on. The second Sir Matthew was duly succeeded by his son, Sir Richard. It was in his time that the great family pew was built out on the north side of the parish church. So large were the squire's ideas that several of the graves on that unhallowed side of the building had to be disturbed to satisfy his requirements. Among them was that of Mrs. Mothersole. A certain amount of interest was excited in the village when it was known that the famous witch, still remembered by a few, was to be exhumed. And the feeling of surprise, and indeed disquiet, was very strong when it was found that though her coffin was fairly sound and unbroken, there was no trace whatever inside of it of body, bones, or dust. One morning, it was in 1754, Sir Richard woke after a night of discomfort. Uh, Mrs. Chiddock, I can certainly not sleep in that room again. Oh, sir? The chimney smoked persistently, and yet it was so cold that the fire had to be kept up. Furthermore, something had so rattled about the window in the wind that no man could get a moment's peace. No, I'll certainly not sleep in that room again, Mrs. Chiddock. I shall select a new room this morning. As you say, sir. There's the fine large study across the hall, if I may suggest. Uh, no. No, it has an eastern aspect. I must have a room with a western lookout so that the sun does not wake me early. And the room must be out of the way. I don't want servants forever passing the door. Well, Sir Richard, you know there is but one room like that in the house. Oh? Which may that be? Why, sir... That is Sir Matthew's room, the West Chamber. Well, put me in there. I lie there tonight. But no one has slept there these 40 years. The air has hardly been changed since Sir Matthew died there. Well, then it's time the air be changed. Come along, Mrs. Chiddock. I'll see the chamber at least. So it was opened. And indeed, the smell was very close and earthy. Sir Richard crossed to the window, threw the shutters back, and flung open the casement. The view was almost entirely blocked off by the ash tree. Oh, sir, the tree. It makes the room so oppressive, so dampish, sir. Well, we'll shortly take care of that. Air the room, Mrs. Chiddock, all today, and move my bed furniture in in the afternoon. When the Bishop of Kilmore arrives, you can put him in my old room. But, sir, there's a fearfulness about this room. 
It's the very room. Yes, yes, it is here my grandfather died. Make no difficulties about it, Mrs. Chiddock. I do not wish to listen to any more. Be about the airing. Be about the airing. In the afternoon, the Bishop of Kilmore arrived. He had risked the approaching storm in order to have an hour with Sir Richard before the arrival of the other guests. The bishop had brought with him a manuscript, come upon while exploring the papers and other remains of the once vicar of Castrinum. And for the first time, Sir Richard was confronted with the enigmatical sortes biblicae of Mr. Crome, which you have already heard. They amused him, a great deal. Well, my grandfather's Bible gave one prudent piece of advice. Cut it down. That stands for the ash tree. May rest assured I shall not neglect it. Such a nest of catars and agues was never seen. I was wondering, sir, uh, your parlor here contains the family books. Ah, yes, I wonder whether the old prophet is there yet. Now, let's see. Um, the Bibles are kept over here. And I know the one, the thick, dumpy... Ah, yes, here it is. Look here. Look here. Sure enough, the inscriptions... The inscriptions on the flyleaf. To Matthew Fell, from his loving godmother, Anne Aldis. The 2nd of September, 1659. <laughs> Well, well, your lordship, it would be no bad plan to test him again, eh? I'll wager we'll get several family names from the Chronicles. <laughs> uh, let's see now. Uh, see, what do we have here? Thou shalt seek me in the morning, and I shall not be. Thou shalt. Seek me in the morning, and I shall not be. Later came the other guests. Dinner at five, wine, cards, supper, and dispersal to bed. Next morning, Sir Richard is disinclined to take his gun with the rest. He talks instead with the Bishop of Kilmore. As the two were walking along the terrace and talking over certain alterations and improvements for the house, the bishop suddenly pointed to the window of the west room. Uh, you could never get one of my Irish flock to occupy that room, Sir Richard. Ah? Uh, why is that, my lord? It is, in fact, my own room. Uh, well, our Irish peasantry will always have it that it brings the worst of luck to sleep near an ash tree. And your fine growth of ash is not two yards from your chamber window. Perhaps it has given you a touch of its quality already. You do not seem, if I may say it, so much the fresher for your night's rest as your friends would like to see you. Yes, that or something else, it has true cost me my sleep from twelve to four, my lord. Ah, but the tree is to come down tomorrow, so I shall not hear much more from it. Ah, I applaud your determination. It can hardly be wholesome to have the air you breathe, strained as it were, through all that leafage. Your lordship is right there, I think. But I had not my window open last night. It was rather the noise that went on. No doubt from the twigs sweeping the glass that kept me open-eyed. Oh, I, I think that can hardly be Sir Richard. Here, uh, you, you can see from this point... None of those nearest branches can touch a casement. Unless there were a gale and there was none of that last night. Or they missed the panes by a foot. No such true. What then will it be, I wonder, that scratched and rustled so? Aye, and cover the dust on my sill uh, with lines and marks. Ah, oh, well, sir. Uh, uh, might it be uh, the rats? The rats that must have come up through the ivy. Of course, of course, the rats. It, it was the rats. So the day passed quietly, and night came, and the party dispersed to their rooms and wished Sir Richard a better night. And now we are in his bedroom, with the light out and the squire in bed. The night outside is still and warm, so the window stands open. There is very little light about the bedstead, 
But there is a strange movement there. It seems as if Sir Richard were moving his head rapidly, to and fro, with only the slightest possible sound. And now you would guess, so deceptive is the half-darkness, that he had several heads, round and brownish, which moved back and forward, even as low as his chest. It is a horrible illusion. Is it nothing more? Ah, there, something drops off the bed with a soft plump, like a kitten, and is out of the window in a flash. Another, four of them, and after that, there is quiet again. Thou shalt seek me in the morning, and I shall not be. Thou shalt seek me in the morning, and I shall not be. As with Sir Matthew, so with Sir Richard, dead and black in his bed. A pale and silent party of guests and servants gathered under the window when the news was known. Ominous guesses were hazarded. Italian poisoners, popish emissaries, infected the air. But the Bishop of Kilmore looked up at the ash tree. He noticed that a white tomcat was crouching in the lower boughs, looking down the hollow which years had gnawed in the trunk. It was watching something inside the tree with great interest. Suddenly it got up and crammed over the hole. Oh, well now, Kitty, what do you see there inside the ash? Oh, careful, oh, careful of the edge there. Careful now. But the bit of edge on which it stood gave way. And the cat went slithering in. Everyone looked up at the noise of the fall. It is known to most of us that a cat can cry. But few of us have heard, I hope, such a yell as came out of the trunk of the great ash. Two or three screams there were, and then the slight and muffled noise of some commotion or struggling was all that came. But Lady Mary Harvey fainted outright and the housekeeper stopped her ears and fled till she fell on the terrace. The Bishop of Kilmore and Sir William Kentfield stayed. There is something more than we know of in that tree, my lord. I'm for an instant search. I agree with you there, Sir William. We must get to the bottom of this. The secret of these terrible deaths is there, in the ash tree. A ladder was brought and one of the gardeners went up, and looking down the hollow could detect nothing but a few dim indications of something moving. They got a lantern, and the gardener let it down by a rope cautiously. They saw the yellow light upon his face as he bent over, and suddenly the face became struck with an incredulous terror and loathing. Oh! He fell back from the ladder, letting the lantern fall inside the tree. Oh, quick, Sir William, catch the man. Oh, oh, what has he seen? What has he seen? He's in a dead faint, my lord. It will be some time, I fear, before any word can be got from him. Oh, oh, but, but look to the tree. Look to the tree, my lord. It's a flame. The bystanders made a ring at some yard's distance, and Sir William and the bishop sent men to get what weapons and tools they could, for clearly whatever might be using the tree as its lair would be forced out by the fire. And so it was. 
Uh, first, at the fork, uh, we saw a round body uh, covered with fire the size of a man's head appear very suddenly. Uh, then uh, seem to collapse and fall back. Uh, uh, this five or six times. Uh, then a smaller ball leapt into the air and fell on the grass where after a moment uh, it lay still. Uh, we went as near as we dared to it and saw. Look, your lordship, it's an enormous spider. The remains, veinous and seared, of an enormous spider. And as the fire burned, more terrible bodies like that began to break out from the trunk. And it was seen that these were covered with grayish hair. There will be guests at the hall. There will be guests at Castringham Hall, Sir Matthew. There will be guests at the hall. All that day the ash burned, and until it fell to pieces the men stood about it and from time to time killed the brutes as they darted out. Uh, at last, there was a long interval when none appeared. And we cautiously moved in and examined the roots of the tree. We found below it a rounded hollow place in the earth, wherein were two or three bodies of these creatures. Oh, that had been plainly smothered by the smoke. And what is to me more curious, now at the side of this den, against the wall, was crouching the anatomy or skeleton of a human being, with the skin dried upon the bones, having some remains of black hair. It was pronounced by those that later examined it to be undoubtedly the body of a woman and clearly dead for a period of 50 years. Welcome to the Black Mass. Tonight, two stories about animals. First, here's a gentleman to tell you about a famous patent medicine known as Oil of Dog by Ambrose Bias. <coughs> My name is Buffer Beans. I was born of honest parents in one of the humbler walks of life. My father being a manufacturer of dog oil, and my mother having a small studio in the shadow of the village church, where she disposed of unwelcomed babies. In my boyhood, I was trained to the habits of industry, 
I not only assisted my father in procuring dogs for his vats, but was frequently employed by my mother to carry away the debris of her work in the studio. In performance of this duty, I sometimes had need of all my natural intelligence, for all the law offices in the vicinity were opposed to my mother's business. They were not elected on an opposition ticket, and the matter had never been made a political issue. Um, it just happened so. My father's business of making dog oil was naturally less unpopular, though the owners of missing dogs sometimes regarded him with suspicion, which was reflected to some extent upon me. My father had, as silent partners, all the physicians of the town, who seldom wrote a prescription which did not contain what they were pleased to designate as oil of canine. It is really the most valuable medicine ever discovered but most persons are unwilling to make personal sacrifices for the afflicted. And it was evident that many of the fattest dogs in town had been forbidden to play with me, a fact which pained my young sensibilities, and at one time came near to driving me to be a pirate. Looking back upon those days, I cannot but regret, at times, that by indirectly bringing my beloved parents to their death, I was the author of misfortunes profoundly affecting my future. One evening, while passing my father's oil factory with the body of a foundling from my mother's studio, I saw a constable who seemed to be closely watching my movements. Young as I was, I had learned that a constable's acts of whatever apparent character are prompted by the most reprehensible motives. And I avoided him by dodging into the oilery by a side door which happened to stand ajar. I locked it at once and was alone with my dead. My father had retired for the night. The only light in the place came from the furnace, which glowed a deep, rich crimson under one of the vats, casting ruddy reflections on the wall. Within the cauldron, the oil still rolled in indolent ebullition. Occasionally pushing to the surface a piece of dog. Seating myself to wait for the constable to go away, I held the naked body of the foundling in my lap and tenderly stroked its short silken hair. Ah, how beautiful it was. Even at that early age, I was passionately fond of children. And as I looked upon this cherub... I could almost find it in my heart to wish that the small red wound upon its breast, uh, the work of my dear mother, had not been mortal. It had been my custom to throw the babies into the river, uh, which nature had thoughtfully provided for the purpose. Uh, but that night, I did not dare to leave the oilery for fear of the constable. After all, I said to myself, it cannot greatly matter if I put it into this cauldron. My father will never know the bones from that of a puppy. And the few deaths which may result from administering another kind of oil for the incomparable oil of canine are not important in a population which increases so rapidly. In short, I took the first step in crime and brought myself untold sorrow by casting the baby into the cauldron. The next day, somewhat to my surprise, my father rubbed his hands with satisfaction as he reported to my dear mother. Amazing. Uh, simply amazing. What is it, dear? You're absolutely radiant. Don't tell us what has happened. Astounding. Uh, they said they never saw anything like it. Never saw anything like what, my dear Mr. Bean? Uh, the oil. Uh, this morning's vats produced the finest quality oil that was ever seen. They all said so. Oh, the physicians to whom I showed the samples pronounced it the finest ever. Well, dear, what did you do to improve it so? Don't tell us, for heaven's sake. Oh, but that's just it. I have no knowledge whatsoever as to how the result was obtained. Oh, the dogs were treated in all respects as usual. Oh, they were, in fact, of a very ordinary breed. Uh, was that not so, Buffer? Uh, Buffer! Buffer! I deemed it my duty uh, to explain, which I did, though palsied would have been my tongue 
if I could have foreseen the consequences. Mr. Bings, how very disconcerting that for so long we should have been ignorant of combining our industries. True, true, Mrs. Bings. And we must take immediate measures to repair our error. Certainly so, Mr. Bings, certainly so. First thing, we shall remove my studio to a wing of the factory building. Oh, this very evening. This very evening we shall begin. Oh, Buffer dear, what greater joy might a beloved son bring to his beloved parents than an enterprising mind? And my duties in connection with the business ceased. I was no longer required to dispose of the bodies of the small superfluous, and there was no need of alluring dogs to their doom. For my father discarded them altogether, though they still had an honorable place in the name of the oil. So, suddenly thrown into idleness, I might naturally have been expected to become vicious and dissolute. But I did not. I did not. The holy influence of my dear mother was ever about me to protect me from the temptations which beset you. And my father was a deacon in the church. Ah, alas, that through my fault these estimable persons should have come to so bad an end. To remove not only superfluous and unwelcome babies to order, but went out into the highways and byways, gathering in children of a larger growth, and even such adults as she could entice. My father, too, enamored of the superior quality of oil produced, pervade for his vats uh, with diligence and zeal. The conversion of their neighbors into dog oil became, in short, uh, the one passion of their lives. An absorbing and overwhelming greed took possession of their souls and served them in place of a hope in heaven. So enterprising have they now become that a public meeting was held. And we are resolved, Mr. and Mrs. Bing, that our censoring must needs be severe if your invasions upon the population continue. We assure you that further raids will be met in a spirit of hostility by one and all. My poor parents left the meeting broken-hearted, and, I believe, not altogether sane. Anyhow, I deemed it prudent not to enter the oilery with them that night, but slept outside in a stable. About midnight, some mysterious impulse caused me to sneak through an open window into the furnace room, where I knew my father slept now. The fires were burning as brightly as if the following day's harvest uh, was expected to be abundant. One of the large cauldrons was slowly walloping with a mysterious appearance of self-restraint, as if it bided its time to put forth its full energy. And my father was not in bed. He had risen in his night clothes and was preparing a noose in a strong cord. From the looks which he cast at the door of my mother's bedroom, I knew too well the purpose he had in mind. Speechless and motionless with terror, I could do nothing in prevention or warning. As suddenly, the door of my mother's apartment was opened, noiselessly, and the two confronted each other, both apparently surprised. The lady also was in her night clothes, and she held in her right hand the tool of her trade. A long, narrow-bladed dagger. For one instant, they looked into each other's blazing eyes, and then sprang together in indescribable fury. Round and round the room they struggled, the man cursing, the woman shrieking, both fighting like demons. She to strike him with the dagger, he to strangle her with his bare hands. I know not how long I had the unhappiness to observe this disagreeable instance of domestic infidelity. But at last, after a more than usual vigorous struggle, the combatants suddenly moved apart. My father's breast and my mother's weapon showed evidences of contact. For another instant, they glared at each other in the most unamiable way. Then, my poor wounded father, feeling the hand of death upon him, leaped forward, unmindful of resistance, grasped my dear mother in his arms, dragged her to the side of the boiling cauldron, collected all his failing energy, and sprang in with her. 
In a moment, both had disappeared and were adding their oil to that of the committee of citizens who had called the day before with an invitation to the public meeting. Convinced that these unhappy events closed to me every avenue of an honorable career in that town, I removed to the famous city of Atomwe, where these memoirs are written with a heart full of remorse for a heedless act entailing so dismal a commercial disaster. of Dog by Ambrose Bierce. And now, a story by Saki about two lady horsemen and a hyena. They say that all hunting stories are the same, but my hunting story isn't a bit like any you've ever heard. It happened... Quite a while ago, all the usual crowd were at the meet, especially Constance Broder. Constance is one of those strapping, florid girls that go well with autumn scenery or Christmas decorations in church. I have a presentiment that something dreadful is going to happen. Am, am I looking pale? Oh, you're looking nicer than usual. But that's so easy for you, dear. Constance and I were well mounted, and we had no difficulty in keeping ourselves in the first flight, though it was a fairly stiff run. Towards the finish, however, we must have held rather too independent a line, for we lost the hounds and found ourselves plodding aimlessly along miles from anywhere. It was fairly exasperating, and my temper was beginning to let itself go by inches when suddenly... Very good, lost. But what, what in heaven's name are they hunting? Well, apparently it's not a fox. No mortal fox. It's twice as high. And what an ugly small head. And its neck. Enormous and thick. It's a hyena. That's what it is. It must have escaped from Lord Pabham's park. A hyena? Yes, and it's probably tame. Look, the dogs don't know what to do about it. Oh, dear. They're running off. The hyena hailed our approach with unmistakable relief and demonstrations of friendliness. What are we to do? It's getting dark. What a person you are for questions, my dear. Well, well, we can't stay here all night with a hyena. I shouldn't think of staying here all night, even without a hyena. We had better make for that ridge of trees to the right. I imagine the highway is just beyond. I hope it is. What on earth are we to do with the hyena? What does one generally do with hyenas? Well, I, I've never had anything to do with one before. Well, neither have I. If we knew its sex, we might give it a name. Perhaps we might call it Esme. That would do in either case. Esme? Here, Esme. Come along. Come along. There, there must be a gypsy encampment nearby. Gypsies? Why do you say that? We just, just passed a baby, a half-naked gypsy brat. What was he doing there? Picking blackberries, obviously. There. Esme has probably frightened it. Esme? Esme? Come along here. Esme? What have you got there? Esme? Esme, put down that baby. 
Esme! Baronet, what on earth shall we do? What are we to do? Constance, I am perfectly certain that at the last judgment you will ask some more questions than the examining service. Esme, down! Down, Esme! Can't we do something? Esme! If you don't put that baby down, I'll thrash you with this whip. It's running off with the baby into the bushes. Esme! Esme! Horrible! Horrible! Well, Constance, I really don't know what more I can do. We'd best get along. Esme can catch up. Come along. Do you think the poor little thing suffered much? Well, the indications were all that way, my dear. Ah, oh, we are saved. There's the highway. Where? Up ahead. Didn't you hear the car? There. There. There's another. Ah, here comes Esme. There, Esme. Naughty. You're a naughty hyena. Can you let that ravening beast trot by your side? Oh, dear. What is it? What is it heading through his mouth? I can't quite tell, dear. Now, now, pay attention. There's the road ahead. Don't run ahead, Esme. The cars won't be able to see you at this hour. Esme, hold. Stay with us. Oh, oh the silly animal. Well, I don't think we should worry about that beast. No, I dare say he can fend for himself. Oh, oh. Esme, what did I tell you? What did I tell you? Ladies, ladies, is this... Was this your dog? I'm, I'm dreadfully oh, sorry. You, I'm you, you, you have killed my Esme. <laughs> I'm so awfully sorry. I, I, oh. I keep dogs myself, so, so I know what you must feel about it. I, I'll do anything I can in reparation, anything please, at all. Please bury him at once. That yes. much I think I may ask certainly, of you. Certainly, certainly. At, at once, madam. William, William, bring the spade. No, the spade, William. Uh, I saw. What a magnificent fellow. I'm afraid he must have been rather a valuable animal. Well, he took second in the puppy class at oh. Birmingham last year. Oh. oh, don't cry, dear. It was all over in a moment, I'm sure. He couldn't have suffered much. Oh, look here. You you simply must let me do something in, in, in reparation. I couldn't think oh, of but, it. Oh, but I insist. No, no, no I insist. I just... couldn't think of it. But as he persisted, I let him have my address. Lord Pebble never advertised the loss of his hyena when a strictly fruit-eating animal strayed from his park a, a year or two previously. He was called upon to give compensation in 11 cases of sheep worrying and practically to restock his neighbor's poultry guards. And an escaped hyena would have mounted up to something on the scale of a governmental grant the gypsies were equally unobtrusive over their missing offspring. I don't suppose in large encampments they really know to a child or two how many they've got. There was a sequel to the adventure, though. I got through the post a charming little diamond brooch with the name Esme set in a sprig of rosemary. Incidentally, too, I lost the friendship of Constance Brodel. You see, when I sold the brooch, I, I quite properly refused to give her any share of the proceeds. I pointed out that the Esme part of the affair was my own invention, and the hyena part of it belonged to Lord Pabham, if it really was his hyena, of which... Of course, I've no proof. That was Esme, 
by Saki. The part of the two ladies was played by Pat Franklin. The motorist was Bernard Mays. The hyena was played by himself. In Oil of Dog, the first of our two stories this evening, the family was variously performed by your host of the Black Mass, Eric Bowersfeld. The technical production was by John Whiting. And now, good night. Welcome to the Black Mass. Tonight, two stories about children and their elders. First, here is Auntie and her charge in a story by Nigel Neal called O oh, Mirror, Mirror. So, Judith, it's only your auntie. There. There. Lie back in the bed now and let me pull the covers round you against the draught. Oh. Oh, and a sip of water. Your forehead's hot, dear. Here. No, you're wrong, dearest. It's hot. It's not normal. Yes, I know it feels cool to you, dear. Oh, but then, never mind. Poor little Judy. Well, I'm going to sit with you for a while. There. My, what fine cane chairs you have in your room, haven't you? I think they are two of the coziest in the whole house. Age doesn't matter with really good articles. You know that, don't you? And funding repairs sometimes spoil things we've grown used to and fond of. Now I want you to lie quite still and restful. I'm going to talk to you, dear. Yes, it's about what happened yesterday afternoon. Won't you tell me why you did it, Judith? You may as well, because I know anyway, more than you do. No, no, don't hide your face like that. Oh, it hurts your auntie more than you can tell when her little girl won't speak to her. Yesterday I was arranging her tray and wondering what would please her most. I had found a bright, clean napkin for her tray. And I was cutting bread thin as thin and corner-wise, because that is how she likes it. And then, then I looked out of the window. Well, what I saw upset me very much. It was my little girl running, wasn't it? Running, running. Running far down the garden to where the wall joins the big door. And peeping behind her to see if I was. But I was behind the curtains and she couldn't see me, could she? Well, then I felt something inside me here. A tight, cold feeling all round my heart. Because of two things. One was that she should go so terribly against my wishes. So many times I have said since she was quite tiny. You mustn't go outside the garden, Judith. And you ought never to run. 
But there she was in spite of all I had said and done for her. It made your auntie extremely unhappy, Judith. But the second reason... The second reason was sadder still. As I ran out onto the lawn, I was saying to myself, now she will have to be told everything, and it may break her heart. Something wicked has made her do this, and she must know so that she can resist it. That's what I said to myself as I was running down the path. She will have to be told. You weren't going very fast, were you, dear? You were so young. And I am your old aunt, and yet I caught up with you among the pear trees. Now, I want you to take another sip of water. There. Are you quite comfortable? You must be very brave, dear. Give me your hand. Oh, such a frail little hand. Tight in mine. Very brave indeed, Judith. I'll have to tell you something that will be a very great shock. I'm going to be as gentle as I can, but it will still be a shock. Let me see. You remember that fairy tale from when you were very small? The Ugly Duckling. It looked so odd and different that the other ducks and everybody drove it away. And then it changed and grew into a beautiful swan. Do you know what beautiful is, Judy? You liked that story very much, didn't you? Now just think, dear, supposing... Just supposing that the duckling hadn't changed at all. Supposing it became still uglier. That wouldn't have made a very happy ending, would it? Oh, hold your auntie's hand very tightly, my love, and try to be ever such a brave girl. You see, Judith, I'm afraid you're that kind of a duckling. Oh, there, there. Ever since you came here, as a tiny tot with no mother and daddy, I've known some day I should have to tell you that you were that you were different from other people. Now you're understanding. You're understanding why nobody comes here. Why I have to have a high safe wall round the garden. And that you can never go outside. And why your auntie takes such care of you every minute of the day. I suppose you've often wondered why it was like that, haven't you? But you've always been so good and done as Auntie Pin, and Auntie loves you so very much. It would have been the same if your parents had lived. Your lovely mamma would have done just what I did. We understood each other so well, as sisters do. I knew everything she should have, every single thing that was best for her. Then, then she married your father. She had no right. She had no right. We, we'll not talk about that. It's only what I said before. He wasn't really for her, not for her. That's it, he wasn't, he wasn't good enough. And so they've both gone a long time. And poor old auntie's minding this little girl instead. And the little girl wants to know why she cannot go out and see the world at last. Because she's grown to 15 years old. Well now, just wait a minute. Here, here's the mirror down from its hook. I can rest it against the foot of the bed. Carefully does it when the frame is loose. Can you see into it, Judith? Now raise yourself a little, dear. See? There. See? See the precious duckling. See her? Oh, this is the part that's going to hurt. Even with her auntie's arm tight around her. I want you to look at that shape in the mirror, Judy. Such a slender, curvy body, isn't it? So pale and soft. Those swollen little breasts. Did you think that was right, did you? Oh, now look at me, dear. I'm not like that at all. See how strong and solid I am. Straight everywhere and every line. That's the way people are, Judith. People outside. 
That little face of yours, Judy, pale, nearly like the dead sheets, except for two pinky cheeks and red lips, and eyes as blue as, as copper rot. Mine are dark brown, and my skin is dark and tough, and hair. Look in the mirror, dear, see that soft, thin, shiny yellow, like fading grass. Not thick and black, like, like other people. Oh, oh, my little Judy is crying. Oh, what sobs. You just didn't know, did you, how different you were? I've always kept it from you. That is why there are no pictures of people in the rooms. I didn't want you to be hurt. Brown-skinned and hard they are, with strong black hair. And I'm one of them. I'm one of them. So I can go out and talk among them, and they don't know about you, these dark people. Only I think of my little girl at home. That's different. Now, Judy, do you know what would have happened if your old auntie hadn't cared for you yesterday and run to stop you and guide you back into this house? Do you know what would have happened if you had gone past the pear trees and the green water tank and up to the big door and if it hadn't been locked, but it always is, and you had opened and walked outside? Oh, something very horrible, Judith, something very horrible. You would have seen people like me, all like me, Judy, only not smiling, I'm afraid. You would have seen them halt in the distance and point and murmur to each other in their dry grey robes and move softly in the shadows. And presently as you walked, you would hear tiny shufflings and mutterings and you would glimpse a head of a person on the other side of a wall keeping pace with you or a grey hand signalling in a doorway. Then, then things would come quietly through the hot dust. They would be people, and they would be following you, because you were different. Remember how all the animals were unkind to the ugly duckling. People can be far crueler, Judy. People can be far crueler. You might speak to one of them, but your voice would be tiny with fright. His head would turn away with eyes remaining on you. And he would talk loudly and hard, not to you, to the others. You, you would feel the whisper run through, sealing them against you. And teeth and eyes would shine out from the whole band of them. And then they would be thrusting, jostling and screaming, and all the roads clattering with laughter. Look at the eyes! They would shout, look at the eye, see how it cries. There it is, running, running, running. And the shouts would become the echo of your own feet, beating along the middle of the lanes, and the stones ringing under them, running, running until you couldn't run any longer. And behind, they would be coming, closing in on you, getting closer and closer, like one of those dreams Auntie calls nightmares. But this time it would be true, Judy. Oh... Perhaps in your dreams you know. It's terrible, Judy. Oh, it's terrible to be different. Terrible, terrible. But your auntie's here. She understands. And there's a high wall and nothing to be afraid of that they don't see inside. Oh, and when you make that singing, or sit watching the clouds, and wondering or tremble at the thunder there's only auntie to know that you're doing what no one else does isn't there your auntie's your friend who understands oh my Judy is brave and she won't cry anymore now will she just one last look in the mirror at that strange little face so that she'll know finally what her auntie meant. Look, Judy. Look. Look into the mirror. Oh. Oh, my poor little girl. Can't she bear to look? Can't she then? 
Don't hide in the bedclothes, dear. You're never strange to me, you know. You're never strange to me. Take the mirror away. Oh, wait, Judith. Wait. Wait, wait. I've something for you. I knew what a horrible shock it would be, and I got something that might help my little girl to bear it. There, right in her little hand. Do you know what it is? Do you know what it is, dear? It's a bottle of stain. Yes, stain. Quite harmless brown stain. Here, look. Look, it smells rather sweet, doesn't it? Smell. Now, if she wants, she can put a little into her washing water to darken those hands and those pink and white cheeks. It may burn a little bit, dear. But when she looks into the mirror, she won't seem so different after all. She can pretend to be like me, can't she? And after that, we must simply be patient and anti-loving. Because we haven't so very long in this world, have we? No, not very long. Now... Now, if the little girl stops crying and lies quietly and still, she shall have a plate of bread and butter, cut just as she likes it, and some secret little treat. Her auntie will sit with her in this beautiful cozy room, and we shall have a game of Ludo. For I understand. I do, I do. I do understand my Judy. And she's my very own. She's my very own for always. Poor little Judy. My poor little Judy. My poor little Judy. That was O oh Mirror, Mirror by Nigel Neal. The part of Auntie was played by herself. The setting for our second story is deep in the earth. Here is Isaac Beshevet Singer's tale about a devil by the name of Sheeta and her baby devil called Kuziba. your medicine. Yes, and soon the fever will be all gone. Here now, copper juice and devil's dung, darkness of ditch, and droppings of red crow. There now. Just the way you like. And soon your fever will be all gone. Now, sleep, Kuziba. Sleep. <sighs> Little Kuziba. Oh, getting to look so much like your mother. Our bodies made entirely of cobwebs. Hair already nearly to your ankle bones. Lovely yellow chicken claw feet. And your wings, dear. Oh, they're 
are going to be great, beautiful bat wings, just like mine. <laughs> of course, you do have your father's donkey ears and wax horns, but then... No, no. What is it, Kuziba? A bat ring. Mm, tell me, child. Uh, I'm frightened, Mother. Frightened of what, dear? Of light. Of human beings. Oh, what are you saying, child? Here, let me spit over you. <coughs> to protect you from such evils. Oh, but we're safe here, Kuziba. We are far from light and far from human beings. It's as dark as Egypt here. And as silent as a cemetery. Nine yards of solid rock protects us from the surface. Men can break rock. Oh, old wives' tales. The power of man is only on the surface. The heights beyond the surface are for the angels. The depths below the surface are for us. The fate of mankind is to creep on the skin of the earth like a louse. We are safe here, Kuziba. Mm. What are human beings, Mother? Uh, tell me. What are they? Oh, they are the waste of creation, the rubbish, where sin is brewed in a kettle. Mankind is the foam. Man is the mistake of God. Oh, mistake? How can God, the Almighty, make a mistake? Ah, that is a secret that only we know. Ah. For when God created the last of all the worlds, the earth, his love for our mistress, Lilith, was stronger than ever. Only for a single instant did his gaze wander to look upon her. But in that instant, ah, man was produced. An evil mixture of flesh, love, dung, and lust. That man. He has a white skin, but inside he is red. He shouts as if he were strong, but throw a stone and he breaks. Use a thorn and he bleeds. In heat he melts, and cold he freezes. He has a bellows in his chest which has to expand and contract constantly. And a small sack which must throb and quiver all the time. He must constantly swallow a mildew that grows in the mud. And after it passes through his body, he must drop it out. He depends on a thousand accidents. And that's why he's so bitter and angry. Uh. But what do human beings do, Mother? Evil. Only evil. But that keeps them busy so that they leave us in peace. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Some of them even deny our existence. <laughs> they think life can only breed on their surface. Like all fools, they consider themselves clever. Imagine. They study wisdom on crushed wood pulp smeared with blotches of ink. Their ideas come from a slimy matter which they carry in a bony skull on their necks. One thing they do possess in great measure is insolence. If God, the omnipotent, did not have so much patience, he would have destroyed such rabble long ago. I'm, I'm afraid of them, Mother. I'm afraid. Oh, now, don't be afraid, Kuziba. They can't come down here. But, but, but I dream about them. There, there, don't tremble, so my darling little devil. Dreams are foolish. They, too, come from the surface, from the chaos. They, they look so fierce. They made a noise so loud. And there was a terrible blinding light. Oh, be still, my son. I will chant a spell for you. Lord of the depths, curse the evil surface. Lord of all silence, destroy the noise. Save us, great 
Farther from light, from words, from man's deceit, save us, Lord God. Now, Kuziba, where is Father? He's gone to Yeshiva, near the center of the earth, to, to study the secret of silence. No matter how quiet it is, it can even be quieter. But there is a final silence. A last point so small that it is nothing. It's so mighty that worlds can be created from it. There, all things are one. And this is God. But God keeps on penetrating deeper into himself. Investigating his own abyss. Sleep, Kuziba. Sleep and grow, Kuziba. Go to a great demon and bring me little ones to feed and wash and put to sleep and grow. Your father will teach them incantations and curses, those that Balaam should have used on the Israelites, and prophecies of the false prophets, the temptations of the primeval snake, the confusion of the tongues of Babel. He'll teach all the demons and devils become king over us all and sit on the throne a thousand miles away from the surface where no one had ever heard of man and his insanity. <gasps> oh! Hey, oh! Help! 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 Demon! Help! Oh! Help! Oh! You cannot see. <gasps> there! Man, <laughs> Men! Looking down. Oh! Idiots! Idiots! Monsters! Oh, oh, Satan, preserve us. Oh, as Lord, yes. Oh, let us bless and save us. Not because of me, but think of my husband, who will soon be your rabbi and great teacher of all your demons, and my child. Think of my child and save us, O oh, Lily. Oh, Asmodeus, oh, Satan. Oh. They are gone. Oh, oh, praise be, they are gone. Oh, only the ball of light and their stench remains. Kuziba, 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 wake up, quickly. We are in great danger. Come, wake up. Oh, mother. Mother, the light, the oh, light. There, there, oh, Kuziba, do not be frightened. We must find a way out. We cannot stay here. There, there. Make a down Well, well, there is a saying that if you cannot go down, you have to go up. We shall have to go up, Kuziba, up to the surface. We shall have to climb. Hold tight to me, Kuziba. I have heard that there are caves on the surface and marshes and graves and dark rocky crevices and dense forests and, and empty deserts. Man has not covered the whole surface. There are others like us, exiles from our world. 
demons, imps, goblins, shadows. The light, Mother. I, I am afraid of the light. There, there. Do not be afraid of the light. For we know that the last victory will be to darkness. Until then, we demons who were forsaken or driven out will have to suffer patience. The time will come when the light of the universe will be extinguished. All the stars will be snuffed out. All voices silenced. There will be no more surfaces. God and Satan will be one. The remembrance of man and his abominations will be nothing but a bad dream, which God had spun out for a while to distract himself in his eternal night. That was Shida and Kuziba by Isaac Beshavis Singer. The part of Shida was played by Pat Franklin. Technical production by John Whiting. And now, good night. the Black Mass. Tonight, a ghost story by Ambrose Bias. Here is The Moonlit Road. You haven't touched your tea, Mr. Stephen. Shall I warm it? Don't fuss, Ellen. Please don't fuss. Sherry, then. No, I have it here. Well, this pillow will be more comfortable. Oh, Ellen, stop. I'm not helpless yet. What you can do is close the terrace window. There's a draft again. Oh, Mr. Stephen, but the window's closed. There's no draft, not from here. Not open? Good I feel. Oh, yes, well, never mind, then. It's a chill you have, Mr. Stephen. And I'm going to have Billy fetch Dr. Benson. For God's sake, stop, Ellen. Stop it. Get Billy to stoke up the fire, and that's all. Now, let me alone. Yes, sir. No. Not a draft? Well, they'll have the house to themselves now, soon enough. As you can see, I am the most unfortunate of men. I am rich, and I am respected, and well-educated, and until just recently, of sound health. I'm the only child of Joel and Julia Hetman. My father was a well-to-do country gentleman. His wife, my mother, was a beautiful and obedient woman, to whom he was 
passionately attached with what I now can suspect was a jealous and exacting devotion. The details that I can relate hardly add up to a story. Indeed, they could fit together in any number of ways. I've imagined all sorts. With feelings so opposed that they've worn down finally to no feeling at all. Doesn't matter now. It ought never to have mattered. Briefly, then, I was a student at Yale. One day, I received a telegram from my father of such urgency that in compliance with its unexplained demand, I, I left at once for home. Father? Father? Uh, Stephen. Uh, Stephen, uh, this way. Uh, Stephen, uh, it's terrible to have to tell you this way. Well... Tell me, for God's sake, what is it? Uh, your mother. It's your mother, Stephen. What's happened? She's ill. Dying. Father, now what's happened? She's dead, Stephen. But how? Murdered. Barbarously murdered. Murdered? Why? For whom? We don't know. We don't know. We don't know anything. I had gone to, to Nashville. I didn't expect to be back before the following afternoon. Uh, well, there was a complication, and I returned home the same night. It was late, nearly nearly dawn. Uh, I found I had no latchkey. Uh, I didn't want to wake the servant, so I walked around to the back. I don't know why, the doors are always locked. Um... But to my surprise, the back door was open. It was standing open, as if someone had just used it. Uh, I entered and went upstairs to your mother's room. In the darkness, I stumbled over. I'll spare you the details, save to say that she was already dead. Strangulation. But why? Was anything taken from the house? No, uh, Nothing. So far as we could see. But what about the servants? Hadn't they heard any sound? No, no, nothing. And the assassin? Is there no trace of him? <laughs> no, nothing. But those uh, terrible finger marks on her throat. Dear God, that I may forget them. I gave up my studies and remained with my father. He was greatly changed. He had always been of a sedate, taciturn disposition. Now he had fallen into so deep a dejection that nothing could hold his attention. Yet anything could arouse him to a fitful interest, a footfall, a sudden entrance. One might have called it an apprehension. Hey, uh, who's there? Who, who is it? It's only me, Father. Oh, Oh, come in. Uh, well, don't stand there in the dark that way. Uh, shall we take our walk this evening? No. No, the garden's chilly, and I'm tired. I think I'll go to my room directly. I'll worry about you, Father. Uh, I know that this whole thing has been terrible for you, but you've become too melancholy... Have you taken to sleepwalking as well? Sleepwalking? Why? Last night, didn't you enter my room? I heard steps along the hall, and then my door opened. <clears throat> Someone stood there in the doorway. I thought it was you, and I called out. When I turned on the light, you'd gone. Got to the door only soon enough to see your door closing down the hall. Wasn't it you, Father? Can you remember... No. No, no, it, it wasn't me. It must have been your mother. She worries if you come in. Yes, yes, I, I remember. She got up during the night and then came back. 
Well, she couldn't have. Stephen, what are you trying to do? Do? Isn't it bad enough for me now? Must you make things worse with your, your fantasies, your, your imagining? Well, it might have been a servant. Uh, it must have been Ellen. Uh, she's always doting over you. Well, I only wondered that it... Well, if it wasn't you, it might have been... Uh, what do you mean? Well, I mean that the assassin might have returned, might still be in the house. That, that's n nonsense. Uh, nonsense. Why? He's never been found. He's still uh, somewhere. Uh, yes, I suppose. Father, have you told me everything that happened that night? Of course. Well, what else? Well, why do you ask? Because it doesn't make sense. Mother was adored by everyone. She was the kindest woman who ever walked the earth. No sane creature could possibly want to hurt her. Sane? Well, why do you say sane? Father, did she have a love? Stephen! Was that it? Uh, Is that who opened the back door that night you came back from uh, Asheville? Are you hiding that from me to save her memory? Oh, stop! He might have done it. I could imagine that. Mother loved you... I know that. She was devoted to you. She'd never have been unfaithful. But she was kind to everyone. I can imagine his jealousy. His fury at her refusing him. Stephen, stop this. Well, what did happen? She was murdered. Isn't that enough? Enough? Yes. But is it enough for her? Uh. Is she still here in this house? Does she haunt us, searching for her lover or her murderer? Does she blame us, Father? Stephen, let it alone. For God's sake, let it alone. I never saw her, but I was convinced that her ghost walked the house. The terrible cold of the presence of the dead was everywhere. Perhaps he saw her. I could not. But there were moments at night. Stephen. Oh, Stephen. Mother? Stephen. The iciness of the grave. The smell of decay. No. I won't see your cat. I imagined. I saw her face hideous, quiet with hate, rotting, rotting. No, no, go away. I am not your assassin. I am not your assassin. One night, a few months later, my father and I were returning home from our evening's walk. A full moon was high above the horizon, and the road, save for the black shadows of the bordering trees, was a ghostly white. As we approached the gate of our dwelling, my father suddenly stopped. Uh, uh, he clutched my arm. Uh, father, what's the matter? There. Uh, there. Uh, what is that? I see nothing, Father. There. There at the gate. Directly ahead. There's there. nothing, Father. Come on now. We'd better go in. No. You're ill. No, go away. Oh, go away. Father, what do you see? No, Julia, no. No. I tried to follow him, but for some reason couldn't move from the spot. Go away. The chill had touched my face. Julia. It was all about me. Julia. I couldn't turn my head. No, no, leave me alone. Leave me alone. When I turned to look for my father, he was gone. And in all the years that have passed, no whisper of his fate has reached me. I remained here. My youth of brilliant parts and promise faded. Its life blood drained. 
sifted into the darkness and the silence of this house. Voices seek me out. Ah, hear them not. But only doubt. 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 And emptiness. say I was alive. Alive. Ah. And tomorrow. Well, there's no tomorrow. No yesterday. Ah. There's nothing beyond that forest. Those trees. That's all I can remember back to. Forest. Twenty years ago, I, I came out of a forest. Made my way across the country. All the way to this place. Well, that was something. That was something. I didn't even know my name. I, I called myself... I called myself Casper. Casper. Every, everyone wants to know, what's your name? What's your name? In this world, everyone must have a name. It, it prevents confusion, even when it does not establish our identity. Casper prevented confusion and spent 20 years trying to find a, a comfortable way to die. There, there, there's some small light, though, of a past. I don't believe it. I can't believe it. That's the only thing that seems like a recollection. Even if it's wrong or confused. The only thing I have of that life. Two scenes that play over and over. First, there, there's a house. A big house. Owned by a prosperous planter. And there's a, there's a woman, a beautiful woman, like a child. And a boy, their son. And he's a vague figure, never clear, usually not there at all. The father loves the wife terribly, but he's tortured by, by a fear that she doesn't belong to him. He, he, he can seem to believe her devotion, her love. And, and, and he's reduced to vulgar and commonplace ways of testing her. Uh, one day, one day, he goes to the city. He tells her, I'll be gone till the next afternoon. But, but I'll come back. I'll come back that night. And go to a rear door that I had left unlocked. It's dark all around the house. But, but as I approach, I, I hear something. The door is open. And a figure. A man. A 
thought it was a man. I feared it was a man. Sometimes now I can't even believe it was human. He he headed straight for me, then just disappeared in the dark. I didn't know where to chase him. So intensely did my 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 jealousy and rage fill me. I didn't search. I rushed into the house and up the stairs, up the stairs to her room, and I pushed open her door. I saw the bed vaguely, the covers tossed about. I went to it. Empty. She was gone. Escaped. Or oh, hiding. Hiding. I looked, I looked about in the darkness. I walked straight to a corner where she knelt against the wall. I could see her face. The terror in her eyes. The guilt. The guilt. Ah, her hands were at her throat. I, I kneeled on her struggling body. And there, there in the darkness, I strangled. Strangled her. Till... She was dead. 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 No. No, it never happened. It never happened. I don't believe it. Oh, I was possessed. Uh, possessed by something or someone. But it's all I have. It's all that comes from me. And I go over it again and again. Now, there's another scene. Another dream. Another vision of the night. I stand among shadows along a moonlit road. Someone is with me, but I cannot see who. But there's another presence. Head. Where the road ends at a gate, in the shadow of the large house. I catch the gleam of white garments. Then the figure of a woman before me on the road. Her. Her, my wife. Julia, murdered, death in the face, marks, marks on the throat, eyes are fixed on man with an, an infinite sadness, sadness, not hate, not menace, but the apparition terrifies me, terrifies me, still terrifies me. She still reaches out to me here. No. No. Drink up. Drink up. This does it. Wipes it out. Wipes it out. For a little while. For a little while. confuses me why he's so fearful. He doesn't see me. He never saw me. I can't imagine what he would see now. But fear has no sense at all. It's crazy. Just crazy. It makes horrible things out of those who want only kindness and some peace. 
I keep wandering among these scenes, these rooms, in search of something that just doesn't matter anymore, what really happened. No one seems to know. Joel's gone, and there's only Stephen left for a little while. Stephen's my son. He wasn't here at the time. He was away at college. Joel wasn't here either. He'd gone to Nashville on some business and was staying the night. I'd retired early and fallen into a peaceful sleep, but then I awoke. The house seemed more than usually quiet. I had a strange sense of danger, of something. Well, not that I was afraid of being alone. I was often alone. But this was different. There was a chill. As one waits for a thing long imagined or feared. And the feeling grew as I lay there. I felt as if I were lying straight and cold in my coffin. The white satin around my head. The smell of dried flowers. A little bouquet I held in my hand. I wanted to pull my fingers apart. But couldn't, as in a dream. No. No. I strained for some sign of life in me. And then... Oh. I could feel my heart pounding. It was a dream. I sat up in the dark and listened. My own heart was the only sound at first. I listened and after a while I wondered if the beating came from inside me or somewhere else. I tried to hear which. And then as if my own fears had decided, had reached out into the dark house and began to assemble some figure, something... I heard it first on the stairway from the back entrance just below my room. A soft, irregular sound of footfalls on the stairs. It was slow, hesitant, uncertain, as of something that did not see its way. To my disordered reason, all the more terrifying for that, as the approach of some blind and mindless malevolence to which there is no appeal. I said that he has no brains. It's an idiot. But this had a growing purpose. Taking shape as it approached. It approached my door. And then... Stood there. I heard the breath. He hesitated. His hand on the door. Then it... It turned... And went away, down the stairs, hurriedly, as if in sudden fear. I rose to call for help. But hardly had my shaken hand found the door knob when... I heard it returning. It ran up the stairs, shaking the house. I fled to a corner of the room and crouched on the floor. I, I tried to cry out. I tried to call Joel, my husband, but suddenly it was in the room, searching me out. Oh, it had gone to the bed and stopped there and turned and came directly to me. I felt a strength of clutch upon my throat. I beat Came against something that bombed backwards. I felt my tongue crush itself. And then I passed into this life. No, I have no knowledge of what it was. The sum of what we know at death is the measure of what we know afterwards. No new light falls upon any page of it. In memory is written all that we can read. 
We hide in the dark and peer out into the dim light of the present and the fading past. But there is one more scene. A night. We know when it is night. For then you retire to your houses. And we can venture from our places of concealment to move unafraid about our old home. To look in at the windows. Even to enter rooms and gaze upon your faces as you sleep. I could see my husband Joel and Stephen. How strange they looked. How alone. Had they loved me after all. They were saddened and aged by my departure. I tried so often to make them see me. Some way to let them know I was here. And send them my great love and pity. But always if I dared approach, awake them in their sleep, they would turn toward me the terrible eyes of the living, frightening me. And I would hesitate. As if my hand was now upon the door and turn away. On this night I had searched for them, but they were nowhere in the house. I looked about the moonlit lawn and then moved in the white light along the path to the gate. Suddenly I saw them on the road. They had stopped walking and were looking toward the house. I heard their voices. They stood in the shadow of a group of trees. They stood near, so near. Their faces were turned toward me. And Joel, Joel's eyes were fixed on mine. He saw me. At last he saw me. All my terror and hesitation was gone. He sees. He sees he will understand. I moved forward. Smiling and consciously beautiful to offer myself to his arms, to comfort him, to speak words that would restore the broken bonds between the living and the dead. Joel. 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 But his face went white with fear. His eyes were those of a hunted animal. Leave me alone. He backed away and ran. No. Ran no, right no into the way. woods. No. Oh. He never returned. Maybe he died. Wanders about some other places I do here. And Stephen. Poor Stephen is left even more alone. You haven't touched your teeth. I've never been able to make him know that I'm here. Watching him. Longing to care for him as a mother should. But soon he too must pass to this life invisible. And be lost to me. Lost. Oh, Lost. Mr. Stephen, but the window's closed. There's no draft, not for That was The Moonlit Road by Ambrose Bierce. The part of Julia was played by Norma Jean Wanvick. Stefan was Martin Punch. Ellen was played by Nancy Punch. And Joel was played by your host of the Black Mass, Eric Bowersfeld. The technical production was by John Whiting. And now, good night. Black Mass.
Tonight, a story about a tower, and an old favorite about a heart. Both tales by Edgar Allan Poe. First, here is Pat Franklin to tell you about a predicament. It was a quiet and still afternoon when I strolled forth in the goodly city of Edina. The confusion and bustle in the city streets were terrible. Men were talking, women were screaming, children choking, pigs whistling, carts rattling, bulls bellowing, horses neighing, dogs danced. Danced! Could it then be possible? Danced! Alas, thought I, my dancing days are over. Thus it is ever. What a host of gloomy recollections will ever and anon be awakened in the midst of genius and imaginative contemplation, especially of a genius doomed to the everlasting and eternal and continue and, as one may say, the continued, yes, the continued and continuous bitter, harassing, disturbing, and, if I may be allowed the expression, the very disturbing influence of the serene and godlike and heavenly and exalting and elevated and purifying effect of what may rightly be termed the most enviable, the most truly enviable, nay, the most benignly beautiful, the most, the most deliciously ethereal, and, as it were, the most pretty, thing in the world. Oh, but I am always led away by my feelings. In such a mind, I repeat, what a host of recollections are stirred up by a trifle. The dogs danced. I, I could not. They frisked. I wept. They capered. I sobbed. In my solitary walk through the city, I had two humble but faithful companions. Diana, my poodle, sweetest of creatures, and Pompey, my negro. Sweet Pompey, how shall I ever forget thee? I had taken Pompey's arm. He was three feet in height and about seventy or perhaps eighty years of age. He had bow legs and was corpulent. Nature had endowed him with no neck. I am Signora Psyche Zenobia. I formed the third of the party. On a sudden, there presented itself to view a church, a Gothic cathedral, vast, venerable, with a tall steeple which towered into the sky. What madness now possessed me? Why did I rush upon my fate? I was seized with an uncontrollable desire to ascend the giddy pinnacle. The door of the cathedral stood invitingly open. My destiny prevailed. I entered the ominous archway. I thought the staircase would never have an end. Round? Yes, they went round and up, and round and up, and round and up, and until I could not help surmising that, that the upper end of the spiral ladder had been removed. <sighs> We climbed until only one step remained. One step. Oh, 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 one little step. Upon one such little step in the great staircase of human life, how vast a sum of human happiness or misery depends. I abandoned the arm of Pompey and surmounted the one remaining step, followed immediately by Diana. 
Pompey alone remained behind, stretching forth his hand to me. Then, in helping him up, he stumbled and fell forward, his accursed head striking me full in, in the breast, precipitating me headlong, together with himself, upon the hard, filthy, detestable floor of the belfry. My revenge was sure, sudden and complete. Seizing him furiously by the wool with both hands, I tore out vast quantities of black, crisp, curly material. Oh, Pompey. Oh, oh that sigh. It, it sunk into my heart. Oh. And our quarrel was quickly made up. We, we looked about the room for an aperture through which we could survey the city. Windows? There were none. The sole light admitted into the gloomy chamber proceeded from a, a square opening about a foot in diameter and about seven feet from the floor. I called Pompey to my side. Pompey? Pompey! I wish to look through that aperture. Here, stand here, just beneath it. Good. Now, now, hold out one of your hands. Good. I, I, I step up. Oh, oh. <laughs> now, now, now the other hand, so I can get on your shoulder. Good, good. Now, I, I can easily pass my head through the... Ah, what a view. Edinburgh, the classic Edina. Oh, just look. The aperture through which I thrust my head was an opening in the dial plate of a gigantic clock. The hands of the clock were immense. The longest could not have been less than ten feet in length. They were of solid steel, apparently, and their edges appeared to be sharp. But what a view! Lovely! Lovely! might have been half an hour that I was absorbed in the heavenly scenery beneath me when suddenly I was startled by something very cool which pressed with a gentle pressure upon the back of my neck. I felt alarmed. What could it be? Not Pompey. He was beneath my feet. Not Diana. She was sitting according to my explicit directions in the farthest corner of the room. What could it be? Alas, I but too soon discovered the huge glittering scimitar-like minute hand of the clock had, in the course of its hourly revolution, descended upon my neck. I pulled back at once, but it was too late. I couldn't get my head back through the mouth of that terrible trap, which grew narrower and, and narrower. I, I threw up my hands and endeavored with all my strength to force upward the ponderous iron bar. I might as well have tried to lift the cathedral itself. Down, down, down it came. Closer and closer. Pompey! of time, for I now discovered the literal import of that classical phrase, continued down, down, it had already buried its sharp edge of full inch in my flesh. My sensations were growing indistinct and confused. <laughs> the, the ticking of the machinery began to amuse me, amused me. My sensations soon bordered on perfect happiness. 
when the bar buried itself two inches in my neck, I was aroused to a sense of exquisite pain. But a new horror presented itself. My eyes, from the cruel pressure of the machine, were absolutely starting from their sockets. One actually tumbled out of my head, and rolling down the steep side of the steeple, lodged in the rain gutter which ran along the eaves of the building. There it lay, just under my nose, and the air as it gave itself, disgusting and inconvenient. On account of the sympathy which always exists between two eyes of the same head, however far apart, my other eye was forced to act in concert with the scoundrel one below. Oh! What relief when the other eye dropped out. Both rolled out of the gutter together. Down. Down. The bar, now four inches and a half deep, only a little skin left to cut through. Sensations of entire happiness, relief in a matter of minutes. minutes past five in the afternoon precisely the huge minute hand had proceeded sufficiently far on its terrible revolution to sever the small remainder of my neck Ah, I was not sorry to see the head which had occasioned me so much embarrassment at length make a final separation from my body it first rolled down the side of the steeple then, then lodged for a few seconds in the gutter and then made its way with a plunge into the middle of the street. <laughs> there was nothing now to prevent my getting down from my elevation, and I did so. <coughs> well, hello there, Pompey. <coughs> Pompey, Pompey, what's the stairs? Oh, oh, oh. oh, Pompey, dear Pompey. What it was that Pompey saw so very peculiar in my appearance, I have never yet been able to find out. Then I turned to Diana, the darling of my heart. <gasps> Alas, what a horrible vision affronted me. Was that a rat sulking in his hole? Are these the pick bones of the little angel, cruelly devoured by the monster? God. Sweet creature, she too has sacrificed herself in my behalf. Ah, dogless, niggerless, headless. What now remains for the unhappy Signora Psyche Zenobia? Alas, nothing. Nothing. I have done. That was Pat Franklin in A Predicament by Edgar Allan Poe. And now, a story that most of our listeners know by heart. Two. 
nervous. Very, very dreadfully nervous. I had been and am. But why will you say that I am mad? The disease had sharpened my senses, not destroyed, not dulled them. Above all was the sense of hearing acute. I heard all things in the heaven and in the earth. I heard many things in hell. How then am I mad? Hearken, hearken and observe how healthily, how calmly I can tell you the whole story. It is impossible to say how first the idea entered my brain. But once conceived, it haunted me day and night. Object there was none. Passion there was none. I loved the old man. He had never wronged me. He had never given me insult. For his gold, I had no desire. I think it was his eye. Yes, it was this. One of his eyes resembled that of a vulture. A pale blue eye with a film over it. Whenever it fell upon me, my blood ran cold. And so by degrees, very gradually, I made up my mind to take the life of the old man and thus rid myself of the eye forever. Uh, Madmen know nothing, but you should have seen me. You should have seen how wisely I proceeded, with what caution, with what foresight, with what dissimulation I went to work. I was never kinder to the old man than during the whole week before I killed him. And every night, about midnight, I, I turned the latch of his door and opened it, oh, so gently. And then when I had made an opening sufficient for my head... I put in a dark lantern, all closed. Closed so that no light shone out. And then I thrust in my head. Oh, you would have laughed to see how cunningly I thrust it in. I moved it slowly. Very, very slowly, so that I might not disturb the old man's sleep. It took me an hour to place my whole head within the opening so far that I could see him as he lay upon his bed. <laughs> would a madman have been so wise as this? And then when my head was well in the room, I undid the lantern cautiously. Oh, so cautiously. <laughs> cautiously, for the hinges creaked. I undid it just so much that a single thin ray fell upon the vulture. And this I did for seven long nights. Every night, just at midnight. But I found the eye always closed, and so it was impossible to do the work. But it was not the old man who vexed me, but his evil eye. And every morning when the day broke, I went boldly into the chamber and spoke courageously to him, calling him by name in a hearty tone and inquiring how he had passed the night. So you see, he would have had to be a very profound old man indeed to suspect that every night just at twelve I looked in upon him while he slept. Upon the eighth night, I was more than usually cautious in opening the door. A watch's minute hand moves more quickly than did mine. And never before that night had I felt the extent of my own powers. I could scarcely contain my feelings of triumph to think that there I was, opening the door. And little by little, and he not even to dream of my secret deeds or thoughts. <laughs> I fairly chuckled at the idea. And perhaps he heard me, for he moved on the bed suddenly as if startled. Now, now you may think that I drew back. His room was as black as pitch with the thick darkness. For the shutters were close fastened for fear of robbers. And so I knew that he could not see the opening of the door. And I kept pushing it on. Steadily. Steadily. I had my head in and was about to open the lantern when my thumb slipped upon the tin fastening and the old man sprang up in the bed crying out, Who's there? did not move a muscle. And in the meantime, I did not hear him lie down. He was still sitting up in the bed, listening, just as I have done night after night, hearkening to the death watches in the wall. Presently, I heard a slight groan. And 
I knew it was the groan of mortal terror. It was not a groan of pain or of grief. Oh, no, it was the slow, stifled sound that rises from the bottom of the soul when overcharged with awe. I knew the sound well. And then in I... Just at midnight, when all the world slept, it has welled up in my own bosom, deepening with its dreadful echo the terrors that distracted me. I say, I knew it well. I knew what the old man felt and pitied him. Though I chuckled at heart. <laughs> I, I knew he had been lying awake ever since the first slight noise when he had turned in the bed. His fears had been ever since growing upon him. He had been trying to fancy them causeless, but he could not. It is nothing but the wind in the chimney. It is only a mouse crossing the floor. It is merely a cricket which has made a single chirp. Yes, he has been trying to comfort himself with these suppositions, but he had found all in vain, all in vain, because death in approaching him had stalked with his black shadow before him and enveloped the victim. And it was the mournful influence of the unperceived shadow that caused him to feel, though he neither saw nor heard, to feel the presence of my head within the room. When I had waited a long time, very patiently, without hearing him lie down, I resolved to open a little, a very, very little crevice in the lantern. So I opened it. You cannot imagine how stealthily, stealthily, until at length a single dim ray like the thread of the spider shot out from the crevice and full upon the vulture eye. It was open, wide, wide open, and I grew furious as I gazed upon it. I saw it with perfect distinctness, all a dull blue with a hideous veil over it that chilled the very marrow of my bones. I could see nothing else. Nothing else of the old man's face or person, for I had directed the ray as if by instinct precisely upon the damned spot. And now have I not told you that what you mistake for madness is but over-acuteness of the senses? Now I say there came to my ears a low, dull, quick sound, such as a watch makes when enveloped in cotton. I know that sound well, too. It was the beating of the old man's heart. It increased my fury as the beating of a drum stimulates the soldier into courage. But even yet, I refrained and kept still. I scarcely breathed. I held the lantern motionless. I tried to see how steadily I could maintain the ray upon the eye. Meanwhile, the hellish tattoo of the heart increased. It grew quicker and quicker and louder and louder every instant. The old man's terror must have been extreme. It grew louder. I say louder every moment. Do you mark me well? I have told you that I am a nervous man. So I am. Now, at the dead hour of the night, amid the dreadful silence of that old house, so strange a noise as this excited me into uncontrollable terror. It was a moment longer I refrained and stood still. But the beating grew louder, louder. I thought the heart must burst. Now a new anxiety seized me. The sound would be heard by a neighbor. Ah, ah, the old man's hour had come. With a loud yell, I threw open the lantern and leaped into the room. He shrieked once. Ah, ah. Once only. In an instant, I dragged him to the floor and pulled the heavy bed over him. I then smiled gaily to find the deed so far done. But for many minutes, the heart beat on with a muffled sound. This, however, did not vex me. It would not be heard to the walls. The old man was dead. I removed the bed and examined the corpse. Yes, he was stone, stone dead. I placed my hand upon the heart and held it there many minutes. There was no pulsation. He was stone dead. His eye would trouble me no more. 
If still you think me mad, you will think so no longer when I describe the wise precautions I took for the concealment of the body. First of all, I dismembered the corpse. I cut off the head and the arms and the legs. I then took up three planks from the flooring of the chamber and deposited all between the scantlings. I then replaced the boards. Oh, clever. So cunningly that no human eye, not even his, could have detected anything wrong. There was nothing to wash out, no stain of any kind, no blood spot, whatever. I had been too wary for that. Uh, that tub had caught all. Ah, ah. When I had made an end of these labors, it was four o'clock. Still dark as midnight. As the bell sounded the hour, there came a knocking at the street door. <laughs> I went down to open it with a light heart, for what had I now to fear? There entered three men, who introduced themselves with perfect suavity as officers of the police. A shriek had been heard by a neighbor during the night. Suspicion of foul play had been aroused. Information had been lodged at the police office. And they, the officers, had been deputed to search the premises. I smiled, for what had I to fear? I bade the gentlemen welcome. The shriek, I said, was my own in a dream. Uh, the old man, I mentioned, was uh, absent in the country. Uh, I took my visitors all over the house. I bade them search. Search well, search well. Uh, I led them at length to his chamber. I showed them his treasure, secure, undisturbed. In the enthusiasm of my confidence, I brought chairs into the room and desired them here to rest from their fatigues. While I myself, in the wild audacity of my perfect triumph, placed my own seat upon the very spot beneath which reposed the corpse of the victim. <laughs> the, the, the officers were satisfied. My manner had convinced them. I was singularly at ease. They, they sat... And while I answered cheerily, they chatted familiar things. But ere long, I felt myself getting pale and wished them gone. My head ached, and I fancied a ringing in my ears. But still they sat and still chatted. The ringing became more distinct. It continued and became more distinct. I talked more freely to get rid of the feeling, but it continued and gained definitiveness. Till at length I found that the noise was not within my ears. No doubt I now grew very pale. But I talked more fluently and with a heightened voice. Yet the sound increased. And what could I do? It was a low, dull, quick sound. Much such a sound as a watch makes when enveloped in cotton. <laughs> I gasped for breath. And yet the officers heard it not. I talked more quickly, more vehemently. But the noise steadily increased. I arose and, and argued about trifles in a high key with violent gesticulations, but the noise steadily increased. Why would they not be gone? I paced the floor to and fro with heavy strides, as if excited to fury by the observation of the men, but the noise steadily increased. Oh, God, what could I do? I foamed, I raved, I swore. I swung the chair upon which I had been sitting and grated it upon the boards. But the noise rose over all and gradually increased. It grew louder, louder, louder. And still the men chatted pleasantly and smiled. Was it possible they heard not? Almighty God, no, no. They heard. They suspected. They knew. Oh, they were making a mockery of my horror. This I thought. And this I think. But anything was better than this agony. Anything was more tolerable than this delusion. I could bear those hypocritical smiles no longer. I felt that I must scream or die. <sighs> now again, hark. Louder, 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 louder. Ah, villains. Villains dissemble no more. I admit the deed. Here, here. Tear up the planks. Here, here, here. Yeah. Oh, it is the feeling of his hideous heart. And that was A Telltale Heart by Edgar Allan Poe. Technical production was by Fred Seiden, and the story was performed by your host of the Black Mass, Eric Bowersfeld. The technical production for our first story this evening, A Predicament, 
was by John Whiting. And now, good night. First production in our Black Mass series, a story by Walter de la Mer about a haunted cathedral called All Hallows. about half past three on an August afternoon when I found myself for the first time looking down upon all Hallow. And the glimpse of it, the teeth and vexation passed away. I stood at gaze, as the old phrase goes, like the two children of Israel sent in to spy out the promised land. How often the imagined transcends the real. Not so all Hallow. Having at last reached the end of my journey, flies, dust, heat, wind, having at last come limping out upon the green sea bluff beneath which lay its wall, I confess, the actuality excelled my feeble dreams of it. What most astonished me, perhaps, was a sense not so much of its age, its austerity, or even its solitude but its air of abandonment. It lay couched there as if in hiding in its narrow sea bay. Nor the roof, not even a chimney was in sight. Only the dark blue arch of the sky, the narrow snow line of the ebbing tide, and that gaunt coast fading away into a haze of a west over which were already gathering the veils of sunset. At this moment of the afternoon, the great church almost cheated one into the belief that it was possessed of a life of its own. It lay like some half fossilized monster that might at any moment stir and waken. Walls so ancient and so sparsely adorned and decorated could not but be inhospitable in effect. From my vantage place on the hill that dominated, I continued for a while to watch all hallows to spy upon it. Those gigantic statues which flank the base of the unfinished tower. Images of angels and of saints as I had learned of old from my guidebook. Only six of them at most could be visible, of course, from where I sat, and yet I found myself counting them again and yet again as if doubting my own arithmetic. My first impression had been that there were seven in view. Ah, but then the lights even of day may be deceitful, and fantasy plays strange tricks with one's eyes. In the midst of my prolonged scrutiny, the hypnotic air, the heat, must suddenly have overcome me. I fell asleep up there in my grove's scanty shade, 
and remained asleep long enough to dream an immense panoramic dream. On waking, I could recall only the faintest vestiges of it, and found that the hand of my watch had crept on. It was eight minutes past four. I scrambled up, numbed and inert with that peculiar sense of panic that sometimes follows an uneasy sleep. What folly to have been frittering time away within sight of my goal at an hour when no doubt the cathedral would soon be closed to visitors and abandoned for the night to its own secret ruminations. I hastened down the steep incline of the hill and once more came within sight of the sea. A sea so near that I could hear its enormous sallies and murmuring. Indeed, I had not realized till that moment how closely the great western doors of the cathedral abutted on the beach. It was as if its hospitality had been deliberately designed not for a people to whom the faith of which it was the shrine had become a weariness and a commonplace, but for the solace of pilgrims from over the ocean. And so at last I found my way into All Hallows, entering by a rounded dwarfish side door with zigzag molding. There hung for Corbel to its dripstone a curious, leering face with its forked tongue out to give me welcome and an appropriate one, too, for the figure I made. Ah, but once beneath that prodigious roof tree, I forgot myself and everything that was mine. The hush, the coolness, the unfathomable twilight drifted in on my small human consciousness. Where was I? What demon of what romantic chasm had swept my poor drowsy body into this immense haunt? Then, at one and the same moment, a sense of utter dismay at earthly surroundings no longer serene but grim and forbidding flooded my mind. I became aware that I was no longer alone. Twenty or thirty paces away, an old man was standing. To judge from the black and purple velvet and tassel-tagged gown he wore, he was a verger. He had not yet realized, it seemed, that a visitor shared his solitude, and yet he was listening. His head crammed forward and leaned sideways on his rusty shoulders. As I steadily watched him, he raised his eyes and with a peculiar stealthy deliberation scanned the complete upper region of the northern transept. Not the faintest rumor of any sound that may have attracted his attention reached me. He continued so long in the same position that at last I determined to break in on his reverie. At the sound of my footsteps, his head sunk cautiously back upon his shoulders. I must apologize for the lateness of my arrival. It's been a far walk from town. Um, uh, until I caught sight of you, I hadn't ventured very far inside the cathedral. Otherwise, I might have found myself a prisoner for the night. Uh, it must be dark in here when there is no moon. I, I, it, as a matter of fact, sir, uh, the cathedral is closed to visitors at four. At such times, that is, when there is no afternoon service. Services are not as frequent as they were. But a visit is a rare, too. I thought perhaps I might be able to find a room for the night and really explore the cathedral tomorrow morning. It was a tiring journey. It is a fatiguing journey, sir, taken on foot. Carriage parties occasionally make their way here, but uh, not so much as once. We are far too out of the hurly burly to be much intruded on. Uh, not that them who come to make their worship here are intruders, far from it, but um, most that come uh, are mere sightseers. Uh, and the fewer of them, I say, uh, in the circumstances, the better. Well, I cannot claim to be a regular churchgoer. I myself am mere sightseer. And yet, even to sit here for a few minutes is to be reconciled. Ah, reconciled, sir. 
Oh, I can well imagine it after that journey on a day such as this. Uh, but to live here uh, is another matter. Yes, I can imagine it's desolate enough here in the winter. I, we have our storms, sir. The bad and the good. And our position is specially prolific of what they call a sea fog. Comes driving in from the sea for days and nights together. Gale and mist. So that you can scarcely see your open hand in front of your eyes, even in broad daylight. And the noise of it, sir. The noise of it. Sweeping across overhead in that woolliness of mist. Uh, if you take me, it is most peculiar. Shocking to a stranger. No, sir, we are left pretty much to ourselves when the fine weather birds are flown. Well, I don't want to detain you at this late hour, but you were saying that services are infrequent now. Why is that? Oh, pray don't think of keeping this, sir. It's a part of my duties. Um, uh, you may have seen something that appeared in the newspapers not many months ago. Uh, well, we lost our dean, Dean Pomfrey, last November. Uh, to all intents and purposes, I mean. And his office has not yet been filled. Ah, uh, they are greedy monsters, those newspapers. No respect, no discretion, no decency in my view. And they copy each other like cats in a car. Oh, we have never wanted to be a notoriety here, sir. And not of late of all time. We must face our own troubles. You'd be astonished how callous the mere sightseer can be. And not only them from over the water whom our particular troubles cannot concern, but far worse, parties as English as you or me. They ask you questions you wouldn't believe possible in a civilized country. Not that they care what becomes of us, not one iota, sir. And we talk of them, masked up inquisitors in olden times. Ah, but there's many a human being on our own would enjoy seeing a fellow creature on the rack if he could get the opportunity. Ah, it's a heartless age, sir. A heartless age. Ah, ah but... But would you care to see any particular part of the building? Uh, the light is smalling, but still, if we keep to the ground level, there'll be a, a few minutes to spare. Uh, and we shall not be interrupted if we go quietly on our way. For a moment, the reverend saluted me. I could only thank him for the suggestion, and once more beg him not to put himself to any inconvenience. He led me off gently down the aisle once more coming to a standstill beneath the roof of the tower. I had no personal acquaintance with Dr. Pomfrey, but I had read of his illness in the newspapers. Isn't he the author of The Church and the Folk? If so, he must have been an exceedingly learned and delightful man. Aye, sir, aye. Uh, you may well say it. A saint if ever there was one. Uh, but it's worse than illness, sir. Uh, it's oblivion. Our dean, sir, was a man who was all things to all men. No pride of place, no vauntingness. None of that apron and god of high and mightiness whatsoever, sir. Uh, and then that. And to come on us without warning. Or at least without warning that could be taken as such. I followed his eyes into the darkening stony spaces above us. A light like tarnished silver lay over the sound of walking. Nothing moved up there. He was found, sir, late that night up there in what they call the trophy room. Sitting in a corner there, weeping. A child. Not a word of what had persuaded him to go or misled him there. Not a word of sorrow or sadness, thank God. Uh, he 
didn't know us, sir. He didn't know me. Just a simple, harmless memory all gone. Ah, simple, sir. Ah. But were there no premonitory symptoms? Now, had he been failing for long? And if you will just follow me, uh, there's a little place where I make my ablution that might be of service, sir. No, we would converse there in better comfort. He turned and led the way with surprising celerity and came to a pause outside a nail-studded door. He opened it with a huge key and admitted me to a recess under the central tower. We mounted a spiral stone staircase and passed along a corridor hardly more than two feet wide and so dark that now and again I thrust out my fingertips in search of his black velveted gown to make sure of my guide. This corridor at length conducted us into a little room whose only illumination, I gathered, was that of the ebbing dusk from within the cathedral. The old man, with trembling rheumatic fingers, lit a candle and, thrusting its stick into the middle of an old oak table, pushed open yet another thick oaken door. Uh, you will find a basin and a towel in there, sir, if you will be so kind. I entered. A print of the crucifixion was tin tacked to the paneled wall, and beneath it stood a tin basin and a jug on a stand. Ah, never was water sweeter. I laved my face and hands and drank deep, my throat like a parched river course after a drought. When I returned, the old man was standing motionless before the spike-barred grill of the window, peering out and down. Uh, you asked me, sir, or was there anything that had occurred previous that would explain what I've been telling you? Aye, uh, they meet and they meet. They have now one expert, now another down from London, and even from the continent, and I don't say they are not knowledgeable gentlemen either, nor are proud to their profession. But why not tell all? Why keep back the very secret of what we know? That's what I am asking. Uh, and what's the answer? Why, simply that they don't want to believe what runs counter to their hopes and wishes and credibilities and comfort in this world. That's what they keep out of sight as long as decency permits. But what is wrong here? Wrong, sir. Uh, uh, take me your situation. Uh, as far as my knowledge tells me, there is no sacred edifice in the whole kingdom. Of a peace, that is, with all hallows. Not only in mere size and age, uh, but what I might call sanctity and tradition. That is so open... Open, I mean, sir, to attack of this peculiar and terrifying nature. Terrifying? Terrifying, sir. Though I hold fast to what which my maker has bestowed upon me. Where else, may I ask, or would you expect the powers of darkness to congregate in open besiegement than in this narrow valley? As we stand now, we are above a mile from traces of the nearest human habitation. Then merely the relics of a burnt-out old farmstead. I warrant that if, and which God forbid, uh, you had been shot up here during the coming night, and it was a near thing what you warrant, I warrant you might have shouted yourself dumb out of the nearest window, if window you could reach, and not a human soul to heed or help you. Well, I, I hope I should not have displaced my nerves to such an extreme as that. As a small boy, one of my particular fancies was to spend the night in a pulpit. Uh, there's a cushion, you know. Ah, uh, but I take it, sir. If you had ventured to give out a text up there in the dark hours, your jocular young mind uh, would not have been prepared for any kind of a congregation. You mean that the place is haunted? I mean, sir, that there are devilish agencies at work here. 
Don't I entreat you dismiss what I'm saying as the wanderings of a foolish old man. I have heard them with these ears. I have seen them with these eyes. Though whether they have any positive substance, sir, is beyond my small knowledge to declare. Devils are creatures made by God. And that for vengeance. Why, I ask, does every expert that comes here leave in haste and in dismay? They go off with their tails between their legs. They see, they, they grope in. But they don't believe. They invent reasons, and they hasten to leave us. Why? Why, because the experience is beyond their knowledge, son. Ah, but uh, surely every old building is bound in time to show symptoms of decay. Why should you suppose mere wear and tear should be caused by any other agency, then? No, no, sir. No, I must apologize. No, I'm a poor mouth at explanations, sir. A decay. Stress. Strain. Settling. Dissolution. I have heard those words bandied from lip to lip like a game at cop and ball. They fill me with nausea. Why? I am not speaking of dissolution, sir, but of repairs, restorations, not decay, strengthening, not a corroding loss, an awful progress. I could show you places where stones, lately as rotten as pumice and discredited as a sponge, have been replaced by others fresh quarry. And nothing of their kind within 20 miles. There are spots where massive blocks, a yard or more square, have been pushed into place by sheer force. All hollows is safer at this moment than it has been for 300 years. But if you ask me, for what purpose are such doings are afoot? Uh, I have no answer. None. Ah, did you hear? Now, sir, you'll see for yourself. Uh, uh, on the other hand, we can leave the building at once if you're so minded. No, no. Uh, lead on. I'll follow you. Well, then, sir, let us be gone at once. There's no time to waste. Um, what I would suggest, if you have no objection, is you're kindly grasping my gown. Uh, there, there's a kind of streamer here, you see, it's made for the purpose. Uh, uh, there, there will be a good deal of up and down. But I know the building blindfold, as you might say, inch by inch. Uh, and, and now that the bell ringers have given up ringing, it is more in my charge than ever. He opened the door, grasped the candlestick, and then blew out the light. We were instantly marooned in an impenetrable darkness. A uh, please... Talk at the streamer if you need attention, sir. In a few minutes, the blackness will be less intense. I have endured too often the nightmare of being lost and abandoned in the stony bowels of some strange and prodigious building to take such an adventure lightly. Uh, I clung, I confess, desperately tight to my lifeline, and we groped forward. I found myself steadily ascending, and then in a while feeling my way down flights of hollowly worn stone steps, and anon brushing along a gallery or corkscrewing up a new staircase so narrow that my shoulders all but touched the walls on either side. In spite of the sepulchral chill in these bowels of the cathedral, I was soon suffocatingly hot, and the effort to see became intolerably fatiguing. Once to recover our breath, we paused opposite a slit in the thickness of the masonry, at which to breathe the tepid sweetness of the outer air. Ah, it was faint with the scent of wildflowers and the cool of the sea. We then turned inward once more, ascending yet another spiral staircase. And now the intense darkness had thinned a little, the groin roof above us becoming faintly discernible. Dead still here, sir. If you please, that's still here. Uh, there's a drop of some 60 or 70 feet a few paces on. I peered out across the abyss. A 
accomplices as it seemed of the huge superincumbent weight of the noble fretted roof. Only a small space now immediately above our heads. How long we stayed in this position I cannot say. But minutes sometimes seem like hours. And then without the slightest warning, I became aware of a peculiar and incessant vibration. It is impossible to give a name to it. It suggested the remote worrying of an enormous millstone. Or that, though without definite causation of revolving wings. Or even the spinning of an immense top. Ah, uh, did you see that, sir? I gazed and gazed and saw nothing. Indeed, even in what I had seen to hear, I might have been deceived. No time was given me to make sure. The old man had hastily withdrawn me into the opening of the wall through which we had issued. And we made no pause in our retreat until we had come again to the narrow slit of window and could refresh ourselves with a less stagnant air. There we stood here, resting a while. Well, sir. Do you ever pass along here uh, alone? Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I make it a habit to be the last to leave. And often the first to come. But I am usually gone by this hour. Uh, it is so difficult to be sure of oneself. Have you ever actually encountered anything? Um, near at hand, I mean? I, I keep a sharp lookout, sir. Maybe they don't think me of enough importance to molest. But have you encountered anything? Have you? Well, yes, sir. And in this very gallery. They nearly had me, sir. But by good fortune, there's a recess a little farther on. I had had my warning and managed to let in there and conceal myself. But only just in time. Uh, indeed, sir, I confess. I was in such a condition of terror and horror. Uh, I turned my back. You mean you heard, but you didn't look? And something came? Yes, sir. Uh, I seem to be reduced to no bigger than a child, huddled up there in that corner. Uh, there, there was a sound, like crying metal. It, it drew near at a furious speed, then passed me, making a filthy gust of wind. For some instance, I, I couldn't breathe. The air was gone. A and no other sound? No other sir. Uh, Except out of the distance, a noise, like the sounding of a, a stupendous kind of, of gibberish, a call, a voice, no human sound. You see, sir, I myself wasn't of any consequence, I take it, unless a mere obstruction in the way. Ah, but I have heard it said somewhere. That a rarity of these happenings is only because it is a pain and a torment, and not any sort of a pleasure for such beings. Such apparitions are good or bad to visit our outward world. And if I may be forgiven the boast, sir, uh, I seem to have almost forgotten how to be afraid since that time. What is anybody's life, sir? Come past the gaiety of youth, but marking time. Oh, oh, uh, did you hear anything then, sir? No, no. I hear nothing. Uh, but please don't think I am doubting what you say uh, from it. You must remember that I am a stranger and that, uh, therefore, the influence of the place cannot but be uh, less apparent to the eye, sir. Uh, now, if you are sufficiently rested, would you perhaps follow me onto the roof? It is the last visit I make. We had not far to go. The old man drew open a squat, heavily iron door at the head of a flight of wooden steps and admitted us at once to the leaden roof of the building and to the immense amphitheater of evening. We edged softly along then paused once more to find ourselves now all but tete-a-tete -tete with the gigantic figures that stood sentinel at the base of the buttresses to the unfinished tower. The mere sense of that abysmal space, 
the mere presence of the stony Leviathan on whose back we two humans now stood dwarfed it into insignificance beside these gesturing images of stone. They're enough of themselves to excite the imagination. And whether matter of fact or pure delusion, this old verger's insinuation that the cathedral was now menaced by some inconceivable danger and assault uh, had set my nerves on edge. My feet were numb as the lead they stood upon, while the tips of my fingers tingled as if a powerful electric discharge were coursing through my body. So we moved gently on. Once with a hasty gesture, the old man drew me back and fixed his eyes for a full minute on a figure. A forbidding thing enough, viewed in this vague luminosity, which seemed in spite of the unmoving stare that I fixed upon it to be perceptibly stirring on its wind-worn pedestal. Uh, no, sir. All's well, all's well. Uh, uh, the night is uncommonly quiet. They seem to leave us at peace on nights of quiet. Uh, but we must turn in again and be getting home. You were saying that even the experts were perplexed by what they had discovered. Uh, what did they actually say? Say, sir. Uh, I... Look, examine that balustrade. Look at that gnawing and fretting. That following above the lead there. All that is honest wear and tear. Constant weathering of the mere elements, sir. Now, now compare it, if you please, with the same mark over here. I stoop close under the huge gray creature of stone. And unless the moon deceived me, I confess I could not find the slightest trace of breath or friction. Far from it. The stone had been grotesquely decorated in low relief with a gaping crocodile. A two-headed crocodile. And the angles, nubs, and undulations of the creature were cut as sharp as with a knife in cheese. I drew back. I now, cast your glance upward, sir. Is that what you would call a saintly shape and gesture? What appeared to represent an eagle was perched on the image's lifted wrist. An eagle resembling a vulture. The head beneath it was poised at an angle of defiance. Its ears abnormally erected on the skull. A lean right forearm extended with pointed forefinger as if in derision. Its stony gaze was fixed upon the stars. Its whole aspect was hostile, sinister, and intimidating. I drew back, horrified, I sir, and so with one or two of the rest of them. There are other wills than the Almighty. I, I can for the life of me understand what you are saying. One doesn't repair in order to destroy. No, sir. But say you so. And why not? Are there not two kinds of change in this world? A building up and a breaking down. To give strength and endurance for evil or misguided purposes. Would that be power wasted if such was your aim? Why, sir? Isn't that true even of the human mind and heart? Uh, we are on the outskirts, I grant. But where would you expect the enemy to show himself unless in the outer defenses? An institution may be beyond saving, sir. It may be being restored for a worse destruction. And a hundred trumpeting voices would make no difference when the faith and life within is tottering to its fall. At that instant, a dull, enormous rumble reverberated from within the building as if a huge boulder or block of stone had been shifted or dislodged in the fabric. A peculiar, grinding, nerve-wracking sound. And for the fraction of a second, the flags on which we stood seemed to tremble beneath our feet. Come, sir. Come, sir. Keep close. 
ourselves. We must be gone at once. We have stayed too long. We emerged into the night at last without mishap. The little western door, above which the grinning head had welcomed me on my arrival, admitted us to terra firma again, and we made our way up a deep sandy bank. We turned when we reached the summit and looked back. All hallows, vague and enormous, lay beneath us in its hollow, resembling some natural prehistoric outcrop of that sea-worn, rock-bound coast. But strangely human and saturnine. Uh, you'll forgive me, sir, for mentioning it. But I'd make it a rule as far as possible uh, to leave all my troubles and misgivings outside when I come home. My daughter is a widow, uh, not long in that sad condition. So uh, I keep as happy a face as I can on things. On my way to bed that night, the old man led me in on tiptoe to show me his grandson. He was of that fairness which almost suggests the unreal. He had flung back his bedclothes, as if innocence in this world needed no covering or defense, and lay at ease. The dews of sleep on lip, cheek, and forehead. He was breathing so quietly that not the least movement was perceptible. The lovely thing. Where is he now, I wonder? And from out of the distance, there came the first prolonged whisper of a wind from over the sea. It was eleven by my watch. The storm after the long heat of the day seemed to be drifting inland. But all hallows, apparently, had forgotten to wind its clock. Walter Delamere. ...to some of our Berkeley student listeners, for he is one of the most outstanding and extreme instances in literature of fit-in, passive resistance. Here now is Bartleby the Scrivener by Herman Melville. my avocation for the last 30 years has brought me into more than ordinary contact with what would seem an interesting and somewhat singular set of men. Um, I mean the law copyists or, or scribblers. I have known very many of them professionally and privately, but a scribbler the strangest I ever saw or heard of it was Bartleby. I believe that no materials exist for a full and satisfactory biography of this man. He was one of those beings of whom nothing is ascertainable except from the original sources. And in this case, those were very small. What my own astonished eyes saw at Bartleby is that is all I know. Except, indeed, one vague report with which I will later conclude. At the period just preceding the advent of Bartleby, I had in my second floor chambers on Wall Street two curtains of copyists in my employment. But since the now extinct office of Master in Chancery had been conferred upon me, my avocations had been largely increased. There was now great work for Scrivener, and I had advertised for a signal help. Sir, anything of this, um, what is it? The young man is here, sir. What young man? Who answered your advertisement? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. There in the doorway, sir. Oh, Oh, yes. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Yes, sir. I can see that figure now. Pallidly neat. Pitiably respectable. Incurably forlorn. 
My name is Bartleby. Uh, come in. Uh, come right in. I sent my statement of qualification. Uh, yes, I'm, I have it here. And, and very satisfactory. Very satisfactory. I'm prepared to begin work immediately. Sir? Uh, well, it's mid-morning now. Uh, suppose we start right afternoon lunch, eh? I would prefer to begin work immediately if I may be shown my desk. Well, uh, well very well. Uh, as you see, uh, the office is divided by the, the glass folding doors over here. My, my scriveners occupy the other half. Uh, but I need someone with an easy call. So, Bartleby, you, you will occupy the desk here. And, uh, and we will separate yours from mine by this folding screen. Uh, you see, I've placed your desk close up to that small side window. Um, it affords no view at all, I'm afraid, except the brick wall across the shaft. Um, but some light comes down. Uh, well, what do you think? The arrangement will be entirely satisfactory. Uh, well, well, I think so, I think so. Uh, the screen will isolate you enough for privacy, uh, but still within my voice. <clears throat> um, uh, Mr. Nippers, uh, Mr. Nippers, will you come here and, and bring a portion of the testimony? We're in the midst of an important suit at the moment. I'll start you off with a portion of that. Um, we'll need it in triplicate. Uh, later we can check your copies and Nippers all together. Ah, uh, Nippers, Nippers, uh, this is Bartleby. Uh, how do you do, Bartleby? Uh, and Nippers will be more than pleased with the relief of your assistance, Bartleby. He's been working well beyond his chair lately. Um, uh, have you the testimony, Nippers? Uh, yes, here, sir. Ah, well, thank you, Nippers. Um, uh, that will be all. Yes, sir. Welcome to the office, Bartleby. I can begin with the copying immediately. Uh, that will be all, Nippers. Uh, very well, Bartleby. Here are the documents. Here. <clears throat> uh, there's the paper and, and the ink. Uh, there are the quills. Uh, you can start here. Here. Um, Mr. Watts. Mr. Watts. My client has requested... Uh, 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 and so on. Hmm. Uh, yeah, fine hand, Bartleby. Uh, fine hand. He began as if famished for something to copy. He seemed to, to gorge himself on my documents. I, I should have been delighted with his application had he, had he been cheerfully industrious. But he wrote on silently, palely, mm -hmm. mechanically. On the third day of his being with us, Mr. Nippers had joined me to, to examine the triplicate copy and I had called Bartleby to join us. Uh, but when he failed to appear from behind the screen, I became impatient. Uh, Bartleby, uh, Bartleby, quick, we are waiting. What was it? The copies, the copies. We're going to examine them. Uh, there, here is one for you. Now, do let's get started. <laughs> oh, the copies. I would prefer not to. <laughs> prefer not to? What do you mean? Are you moonstruck? I want you to help us to compare these copies. Yes, but I would prefer not to. Oh, really? <coughs> Bartleby, these are your own copies we are about to examine. It is labor-saving to you. One, one examination will answer for all three. It's common usage. Every copyist is bound to help examine his copies. Is that not so? Or will you speak? Yes. Answer. I prefer not to. I never heard. Yes, you are decided then not to comply with my request. A request made according to common usage and then common sense. Yes, my decision is irreversible. Well, I never. I never. Yes. Hey, Mr. Nippers, what do you think of this? Pardon my saying, sir, but I think I should kick him out of the office. I've never in my life. It's my opinion, sir, that the man is a little loony. A battle be. Uh, listen here. Uh, come forth and do your duty. I'm sorry. I prefer not to. I just march in there and chuck that loony out of the office, sir. Yes. Well, well, we must examine the papers anyway. We'll have to do without them for the present. Stop them. Oh, well, let's get started, Mrs. And I can tell you, sir, this is the first and last time I'll do another man's work without pay. All right, all right, Mrs. Let's get started. <clears throat> he's, a, he's a good worker, nevertheless. I, I can't say he hasn't been uh, useful to me. Very methodical, very methodical. <clears throat> and just now. Just now, it's plain he intends no incident. I say he's a loony. Well, he may be excellent. I say he's a loony. I see him, sir. No. This morning, he was in the office before myself, and I saw him standing behind his screen, just staring at the wall. He never answered me, just staring like a loony. 
Well, Nippers, I, I think he means no mischief. Uh, let's get out. This incident was, of course, only the beginning. But the tone of my struggle with Bartleby had been set. The battle and the war had been lost in that moment when my initial outrage had given way uh, to a second thought. It was his attitude that had stopped me. Not a wrinkle of agitation rippled him, but the least uneasiness, uh, anger, impatience, or impertinence in his life. Yes, sir. Uh, Bartleby, when those uh, papers are all copied, I will compare them with you. I would prefer not to. What? Surely you do not need to persist in that mulish vagary. Oh. Mm. Um. Mm. Bartleby, the office boy is away. Um, to step around to the post office, won't you, and see if there is anything for me? I would prefer not to. <laughs> you, you will not. I prefer not. It was his passiveness that irritated me. Nothing so aggravates an earnest person as a passive resistance. I felt strangely goaded on to encounter him in ever new opposition. Bartleby, uh, Bartleby, uh, Bartleby. Yes, sir. Uh, go to the next room and tell Mister Nichols to come to me. I prefer not to. Uh, not very good, very good, Bartleby. Very good. If you prefer not to, very good indeed. A wonderful business, just really wonderful. I have a young scrivener occupying a desk in my own office. The copy is for me uh, at the usual rate of four cents a hundred words, but permanently, permanently exempt from examining the work done by himself. <laughs> Moreover, he is never on any account to be dispatched on the most trivial errand of any sort. And even if entreated to take upon him such a matter, it is generally understood uh, that he will prefer not to. <laughs> yes, very good, Bartleby. <laughs> very good indeed. <laughs> very good indeed. Hey, Bartleby! Yes, sir? Help me with this package. Uh, I, I want you to, 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 to put your finger on the knot here so that I can try it. Do you hear me? Uh, do you hear me? Yes, I hear you. Well? I prefer not to. Don't you see that I need your assistance? Yes, I see you need assistance. Am I not paying you a salary for your assistance? Yes, you are paying me a salary for my assistance. Well, then assist me! I prefer not to. You prefer not to? Yes, I prefer not to. You prefer? You prefer? <laughs> you prefer? Barnaby! Barnaby! But as the days passed on, I became considerably reconciled to Barnaby. His, his steadiness. His incessant industry, his great stillness. One prime thing was this. He was always there, first in the morning, continually through the day, and the last at night. I had a singular confidence in his honesty. I felt my most precious papers perfectly safe in his hands. Now, one Sunday morning, on my way to Trinity Church, and finding myself rather early, I decided to walk around to my chambers for a while. On Sunday, Wall Street is deserted. This building, which on weekdays hums with industry and life, echoes in sheer vacancy. Well, you can imagine my surprise, therefore, when upon applying my key to the door. The door itself opened and startled me. What in the world are you doing at the office on a Sunday morning? And in your shirt sleeve. I'm sorry, but I'm deeply engaged just now. I prefer not admitting you at present. What? Thought to be in my own office. Well, we shall see. But when I entered, he had retreated behind his screen. Well, I surmise, Bartleby, that you have been making your home in my office. I would have preferred that you do not enter the office at present. If you walk around the block two or three times, I will probably, by that time, have concluded my affair. I am not angry, Bartleby. Won't you please come out from behind your screen? I prefer not to at present. I'm not angry. I, I don't know what to think about this. How can you sleep on that rickety old sofa? There are no mirrors or, or utensils. How can you dress or eat properly? Is your poverty so great, Bartleby? It's Bartleby. <laughs> this place itself, oh, my door, Sunday. It's depressing. Poor old. 
and here you make your home. Miserable friendlessness and loneliness. What a horrible solitude. Miss Bartleby, Bartleby, will you come here? I'm not going to ask you to do anything you would prefer not to do. I simply wish to speak to you. Yes. Will you tell me, Bartleby, uh, where you were born? I would prefer not to. Will you tell me anything about yourself? I would prefer not to. But what reasonable objection can you have to speak to me? I feel friendly towards you. And what is your answer, Bartleby? At present, I'd prefer to give no answer. Well, then, never mind about revealing your history, but let me entreat you, as a friend, to comply as far as may be with the usages of this office. And say now uh, that you will help to examine papers tomorrow uh, or the next day. See, in short, say now that in a day or two uh, you will begin to be a little reasonable. Uh, say so, Bartleby. At present, I would prefer not to be a little reasonable. Uh, Bartleby, you mustn't stay here. Have you no friends or relatives? No one? What a strange fellow you are. Never speaks but to answer. I've never seen you read anything but my dreary document. Not a newspaper. What do you eat? I see some shells here. Ginger nuts. Is that what you eat? And Bartleby, come out from behind that screen. What are you doing there? Just staring out that window. Just standing motionless. And then staring out that window. At the stone wall across the shaft. Bartleby. What will be this is too depressing. Come away from there. I prefer not to. What I saw that morning persuaded me that the scrivener was the victim of innate and incurable disorder. His body did not pain him. It was his soul that suffered. And his soul I could not Several days later, I arrived at the office after a morning at the courts to find Nippers in a state. I prefer him. You don't mind my saying, sir. I give him preference. Hey, what's the matter, Nippers? Sir, his lordship prefers to do no copying today. What? I brought the transcripts to him as usual, but as you can see, he prefers to stand at his window in his dead wall reverie. <sighs> All right, Nippers, I'll attend to it. I, I prefer him if you don't mind my saying. I prefer him right out on his ear. And it is, I prefer that you withdraw for the present. Yes, sir. What next, Barclay? Is it true that you have decided to do no writing? No more. And what is the reason? I have given up copying. Ah. I am sorry for you, Bartleby, but the time has come. You must quit this place. I shall see that you go away not entirely unprovided. I prefer not to be. No, you must. Uh, I owe you twelve dollars on account. Here are thirty-two. The odd twenty are yours. Uh, will you take it? I prefer not to. I will leave the money here on your desk. I must return to the court. Now, when I arrive here tomorrow morning, I will expect that you will have left the trunk. But of course, he preferred not to leave. I arrived early the next morning, fully expecting what was to be. But my temper erupted when I found the door locked from the inside. Bartleby! Bartleby! Open the door and see me! Not yet. I'm occupied. Bartleby! What did I say? Bartleby! Will you all please not quit me? I would prefer not to quit you. Uh, what earthly right do you have to stay here? Do you pay any rent? Do you pay my taxes? Is this property yours? Is it? Is it? No, I don't pay your rent. I don't pay your taxes. This property is not mine. Nothing is mine. All right. All right. All right. I, I will persecute you no longer. Ah, perhaps this is my mission in the world. There's a purpose of my life. To furnish you with office room for such periods as you may see fit to remain. Well, I could be content with that property. Others may have lost the omission. You at least are harmless. <laughs> Noiseless. And I never feel so private as when I know you are here. Ah, there are other things, Bartleby. 
My colleagues are remarking about their visits here. You baffle them. They are not kindly amused at your preferences. And I cannot explain this to them. In the end, Bartleby, this counts some more. And so, I find these chambers really too far from the city hall. The air is unwholesome. In a word, I propose to remove my offices next week. I tell you this now, Bartleby, so that you may seek another place. Careful with the filing cabinet. That's it. No, no, it won't make the door that way. Over, over. Ah, that's it. Uh, take the screen next. Ah, yes. Uh, no, no, not yet, Nippers. Uh, but you can't hide him from the movers, sir. Uh, they've already taken the desk out around him. They wanted to know, if you don't mind my saying, if he was part of the furniture. <laughs> Very amusing, Mr. Nippers. Uh, take that cabinet first. It will be lighter if you remove the drawers. We could move him along with everything else. Uh, I don't see why not. You've made a permanent fixture of him. Uh, you will see that the screen around Bartleby is the last thing to be removed from this office, Mr. Nipper. Yes, sir. When the screen was finally withdrawn, it left Bartleby standing motionless in the naked room. Well, Bartleby, are you just going to remain standing there? Bartleby, are you aware that you are the cause of great tribulation to me? Well, now, one of two things must take place. Either you must do something or something must be done to you. Would you like to re-engage in copying for someone? No, I would prefer not to make any change. Would you, would you like a clerkship in a dry goods store? There's too much confinement about that. Yeah? No, I, I wouldn't like a clerkship. But I'm not particular. Too much confinement. That's why you keep yourself confined all the time. I would prefer not to take a clerkship. Mm. How would a bartender's business suit you? I wouldn't like that at all. So as I said before, I'm not particular. Well then, would you like to travel through the country collecting uh, bills for merchants? That would improve your health. I'm not particular about my health. <laughs> to be a traveling companion? You could tour Europe with, with some young gentleman, entertaining him with your uh, conversation. How would that suit you? Not at all. It doesn't strike me that there's anything definite about that. I like to be stationary. But I'm not particular. Stationary. <laughs> stationary. Ah. Bartleby. Will you come home with me now? Not to my office, but to my dwelling. Remain there until we can conclude upon some convenient arrangement for you. No. At present, I would prefer not to make any change at all. Well. Well. Goodbye, Bartleby. I am going. Goodbye. And God, in some way, bless you. I was convinced that I had done all that I possibly could to benefit Bartleby and shield him from persecution. Now I decided to put the matter completely out of mind. Several irate notes from the landlord of my previous offices followed in quick succession, which I ignored. The final one was, of course, inevitable. It informed me that the writer had sent for the police. Bartleby had been removed to the tomb as a baby. Oh, yes, yes. The gentleman you described is here with us. Uh, well, uh, I'm here to assure you that he's a perfectly honest man. Now, however eccentric he may appear, he is altogether harmless. We can believe that, sir. He offered no resistance at all when we arrested him. Uh, he is ill. Uh, a deep illness that needs a compassionate hand. Now, I submit that he'd be allowed to remain here in as indulgent confinement as possible till something uh, less harsh might be done. Uh, though I hardly know what. May I ask if you're offering to take responsibility for him? Uh, no, I cannot do that. I cannot. Uh, but I will do whatever else can be done for him. Well, if nothing else can be decided, it'll be the almshouse for him. Uh, uh, 
May I see him now? Oh, yes. Come along this way. Uh, he's in the prison yard, I expect. As you say, he seemed quite harmless. We've permitted him to wander about the yard, so he spends most of his time just standing by himself in the corner. You'll probably find him there now, staring at the wall. Here. Uh, who here? Yeah, uh, there he is. Over there. Oh, oh thank you, officer. I, I would like to speak with him alone briefly. Uh, you would do us a favor, sir, if yes. you could get him to eat a little. He's refused his meals. He's that frail as it is. And, well, if he doesn't get a bit of nourishment, he, he won't be standing for long. Uh, yes. Yes, I, I'll see what I can do, officer. Well, thank you if you can help a little. Bartleby? Bartleby, won't you turn around and, and speak to me? I know you and I want nothing to say to you. It was not I that brought you here, Bartleby. And to you, this should not be so vile a place. Nothing reproachful attaches to you by being here. And then see, it is not so sad a place as one might think. Look, look, there is the sky. And here, here, here is the grass. I know where I am. Bartleby, the officer says you refuse to eat. Now, there's no reason for that. You must get some nourishment. I prefer not to dine. It would disagree with me. I'm unused to dinner. Bartleby, why do you do this? Why? I prefer... Some few days later... I was called to the truth. I'm afraid the man is too deranged for us to care for him. He'll be removed tomorrow. There's no serious charge against him, but he needs attention. As you see, there he lies, sleeping in the corner. I saw him lie down some 20 minutes ago. I doubt he had the strength to stand any longer. Wait here. Let me go to him alone. His dinner is ready if you can get him to eat some of it. Strangely huddled at the base of the wall, his knees drawn up and lying on his side, I saw the wasted Bartleby. The thick Egyptian character of the wall seemed to weigh upon him in its gloom. But nothing stirred. His dim eyes were open. Otherwise, he seemed profoundly sleepy. Will he eat? Or does he live without eating? Lives without eating. Is he asleep then? Yes. Yes, he sleeps. The king and counselor. There would seem to be little need to proceed further in this history those of you who are curious as to who Bartleby was and what manner of life he led prior to the acquaintance I have narrated, I can only reply that in such curiosity I fully share, but am wholly unable to gratify it. There is, however, one vague report which has not been without a certain strange suggestive interest to me. The report was that Bartleby had been a subordinate clerk in the dead letter office at Washington from which he had been suddenly removed by a change in the administration. When I think over this rumor, I cannot adequately express the emotions which seize me. It's dead letters. Does it not sound like the dead men? Conceive a man, by nature and misfortune, prone to a pallid hopelessness. Can any business be more fitted to heighten it than that of continually handling these dead letters? and assorting them for the flame. By the cartload they are annually burned. Sometimes from out the folded paper, the pale clerk takes a ring, the finger it was meant for, perhaps moulded in the grave. A banknote sent in swiftest charity. He whom it would relieve nor eat nor hunger any more. Pardon for those who died despairing. Hope for those who died unhappy. Good tidings to those who died stifled by unrelieved calamity. On errands of life, 
these letters speed to death. Bartleby. Ah, humanity. by Montague Rhodes James, an evening's entertainment. Nothing is more common form in old-fashioned books than the description of the winter fireside where the aged grandam narrates to the circle of children that hangs on her lips story after story of ghosts and fairies and inspires her audience with a pleasing terror. But we're never allowed to know what the stories were. Here then is a problem which has long obsessed me, but I see no way of solving it finally. The aged grandams are gone and the collectors of folklore began their work too late to save most of the actual stories which the grandams told. Yet such things don't easily die quite out. And imagination working on scattered hints may be able to devise a picture of just such an evening's entertainment. Let's see now. There's the fire burning brightly in the large stone fireplace. On the one side sits the squire, exhausted by a long day after the partridges and replete with food and drink. On the other side, his old mother sits with her knitting and the children, Charles and Fanny, are gathered about her knee. Oh, I want to wind Granny's yarn. You did it last time. No, you did it twice before that. Well, that doesn't count because... Now, now, my dears. You must be very good and quiet or you'll wake your father. And you know what will happen then. Oh, yes, I know. He will be cross-tempered and send us off to bed. What? That? Fie on you, Charles. That's not a way to speak. Now, I was to have told you a story. But if you use such like words, I shall. Oh, oh Granny, please. Granny. Oh, please, Granny. Oh, please, Granny. Oh, please, Granny. Shh, 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 shh. Oh, now I do believe you have woken your father. Uh, hey, look there, Mother. You, you can't keep them brass quiet. Yes, John. Yes, yes, it's too bad. I've been telling them if it happens again, off to bed they shall go. There now. You see, children, what did I tell you? You must be good and sit still. And I'll tell you what. Tomorrow you shall go a blackberry. <gasps> and, and, and if you bring home a nice basket full, I'll make you some jam. Oh, yes, Granny, do. And, and I know where the best blackberries are. I, I saw them today. Oh, and where's that, Charles, dear? Uh, I know too, Granny. It's, it's in the little lane. Well, it's, it's in the little lane I'm going to pass Collins Cottage. Charles? Granny, whatever you do, don't you dare to pick one single blackberry in that lane. Don't you know? There, how should you? What was I thinking of? 
Well, anyway, you both mind what I say. Oh, they must be. Why, 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 why shouldn't we pick them? Why shouldn't we pick them? Shh. Remember what I told your father. But, 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 why, why? Very well, then. I'll tell you about it. Only you mustn't interrupt. Here, Fanny, you can take the knots out of this skein for Granny. Uh, now, let me see. Oh, my, sounds like a storm blowing up outside, doesn't it, children? Well, no matter. We're safe and warm inside, aren't we? Well, now, that lane. All oh, this, mind you, happened when I was quite a little girl. That lane was feared even then, and as far back as anyone can remember. And if something had happened to your granny on that lane is any indication, I've often wondered if there was any connection between what I saw and all that about Mr. Davis and his friend that I'm about to tell you. What did you see, Granny? What did you see, Granny? What did you see? Well, you know that lane passes near to the top of that hill uh, where you've seen that old figure cut out in the crag. Well, I was passing along there one evening. I was already late getting home for my supper. But I remember seeing the currant and gooseberry bushes along the side leading to the top of the hill. The berries were ever so ripe and delicious. And before I realized, I had followed them, tasting one bush. Then another, near to the top of the hill. Then I stopped for a moment. I was sure I heard something. Voices, I thought. But I, I couldn't make out plainly because of the wind. I couldn't make out whether they were coming from the top of the hill or from inside. Somewhere inside the hill itself, voices singing or calling or something. I wasn't frightened at all at first, and I remember walking farther up to see where the sounds were coming from, and the farther up I went, the more it seemed the voices were coming from all around me, from below as well as above. strange old rocks around the top of that hill. Beside one of those rocks. No one believed me when I told the story later, or no doubt they didn't believe me. Well, what I saw was a hand, a whole arm reaching up from out of the earth. Now, they say that the hill had once been a burial ancient times, and that a skeleton arm could very well be unearthed by the rain. <laughs> but that was no skeleton arm. There was flesh on it, dark and old, and long nails, all I told. Now you can believe me or not, but I see, I saw that arm reaching up out of the earth. And it wasn't a dead arm. When I came nearer, I saw its fingers moving like it was in pain, like it was beckoning me to help it. The rest of it, out of the earth. Now, I, I told you that I wasn't afraid, and that's true, until I got so close. Then, then suddenly, a terrible fear overcame me, and I ran, ran all the way down the hill. And I have never once set foot on that place since. Well, now, it was only a short while after that that the events I was going to tell you about began. Uh, careful, Fanny, not too close to the fire of that yarn. That's better. 
Well, now, I'll put the far end of that name. Let, let me see. Is it on, is it on the right or the left-hand side as you go up? Oh, yes, the left-hand side. You'll find a little patch of bushes and rough ground in the field. And something like a broken old hedge round about. And the kind of gooseberry and currant bushes I told you about growing among it. Well, that means there was a cottage stood there, of course. And in that cottage, there lived a man named Davis. This Mr. Davis lived very much to himself. He didn't work for any of the farmers, having, as it seemed, enough money of his own to get along. But he'd go to town on market days. And one day he came back from market and brought a young man with him. And this young man and he lived together for some long time and, and went about together. And whether he just did the work of the house for Mr. Davis or whether Mr. Davis was his teacher in some way, nobody seemed to know. He was a dear young man and hadn't much to say for himself. Well, now, what did those two men do with themselves? <laughs> of course, I can't tell you half the foolish things that the people got into their heads. And we know, don't we, that you mustn't speak evil when you aren't sure it's true, even when people are dead and gone. But as I say, those two were always about together, late and early, and there's one walk that they take regularly to the place on the hill that I just told you about. And it was noticed that in the summertime, they'd camp out there all night. I remember once my father, that's your great-grandfather, told me he had spoken to Mr. Davis and his young friend one evening when he met them on the road. He asked them why they were so fond of going up there. Why? Why, sir, it's a wonderful old place, and I've always been fond of the old-fashioned things. And when him, my boy here and me are together there, it seems to bring back the old times of playing. Well, it may suit you, but I shouldn't like to be in a lonely place like that in the middle of the night. Oh, sir, we don't want the company at such times. That is to say, Mr. Davies and me is company enough for each other. Ain't it so, Master? Aye. It is a beautiful area there of a summer night. And you can see all the country round under the moon. Oh, it looks so different, seemingly, from what it do in the daytime. The bars there. And the mounds. All over up there. Now, yeah, what would you think was the purpose of them, sir? Why, I've heard, Mr. Davies, that they're all graves. And I know when I've had occasion to plow up one, there's always been some old bones and pots turned up. But whose graves they are, I don't know. People say the ancient Romans were all about this country at one time. But whether they buried the people like that, I can't tell. Ah, oh, to be sure. Well, they look to me to be older like the more ancient Romans. And just different. Uh, that's to say, according to the pictures the Romans was in Ireland. And you didn't never find no armor, did you, sir? And not by what you said. Well, I don't know that I mentioned anything about armor. But it's true, I don't remember to have found any. But you talk as if you'd seen them, Mr. Davis. Seen them, sir? That would be a difficult matter after all these years. Not but what I should like well enough to know more about them old times and people. And what they worship and all. Worship? Well... I dare say I've heard and read about them heathens and their worship. Torture and dances, behavior lewd and ungodly, sacrifices. How oh, torture and dances, you say? Sacrifices, you say. Oh. Lewd and ungodly behavior. What manner do you suppose? Read about them, you say. Hasten, you say. Oh. That was the only time my father had much talk with Mr. Davis. It was around that time that people believed some sort of meetings went on at night time on that hill. 
and that those who went there were up to no good, and there was known to be others besides Mr. Davis and his young man, I mean, and it was only guessed what really went on. Yarn, Fanny dear. Now mind what I say, else you find yourself going up in flames. Oh, don't stretch that skein so, Charles. Hold it loosely. That's it. Well, now. Well, I suppose it was a matter of three years that Mr. Davis and this young man went on living together. And then, all of a sudden, a dreadful thing happened. I don't know if I ought to tell you what it was. Oh, yes, but please, can you just me? Well, then, you must promise not to get frightened and go screaming out into the middle of the night. No, we won't. We won't. Of course we will. One morning, very early, towards the turn of the year, I think it was in September, one of the woodmen had gone up to his work near the hillside just as it was getting light. And what he saw nearly drove the poor man out of his wits. He dropped everything he was carrying and and ran as hard as ever he could straight down to the parsonage and woke up old Mr. White. Uh, Parson, uh, Parson White, Uh, Parson White. What is this man? Quiet glory be, what's the matter with you? Oh, Parson, sir, come with me quickly. No, it's horrible. Oh, but you must come with me to see what it's been. Come, what's I found this really kind, Terry. Tell me what it is, man. What have you oh, seen? Oh, oh in, in the little woods near the hill. Yes, oh, yes. Oh, so I was going up to my work, and, and I saw it in a clearing. A, a white thing, what, what looked like uh, through the mist. Oh, like a man. Uh, like a man, sir. And when I came near, I saw it was a man. Mr. Davies, young man, sir. What? Oh, he, he, he was dressed in a sort of white gown, sir. Oh, and, he was, was it? and he was hanging by his neck to the limb of the biggest oak. Quite, quite dead, sir. No, he be. But, but, but the real horrible thing, sir, was his hands. Uh, oh, oh, I don't think there were any hands. What? No, I, I couldn't rightly see for, for the blood, sir. Oh, the blood. May the Lord bless us and save us. What a sight to behold! A demon's work, if ever I saw on himself before us! His left hand chopped clean off. Oh, if clean we can call it. Maybe cleansed would be the word for it. Cleansed. But for the right. Blood! Blood! Uh, uh, there, Parson, oh. there, just below. I hadn't seen before. Look, sir. What? Oh! The hatchet! Oh. The hatchet on the ground the here! Stuck with blood and bits of flesh. Horrible. Huh? Some flies on it already. Oh, don't touch it. Don't touch it. Do you think, sir, that this is a murder? It's an abomination. Oh. An abomination, but I think it's his own act. I think so. You see here, the rock over here. Huh? He, he could have jumped from it and... Oh. Yes, it must have been. You can see the saints, the blood. The hand. Aye, sir, tis the hand where he chopped it off. And there it lies. Oh, a sight, sir. Such a thing. Oh, and do you see, sir? Do you see it is grasping something? So it is. What with all the blood can you make it out? It seems, it seems flesh. It seems part of a living body. Oh, sir. What do you think? God's mercy. I think it's no living body whose part this be. This is Mr. Davis's man, you say, on the tree. Ah, oh, yes. I think we'd best, best find uh, what we can of of Mr. Davis himself. Oh, yes, sir. We'd better hurry up. Come now. Come on, sir. The cottage is down there. Oh, on the hill, you see, in the, in the field. Well, now, the door of the cottage stood wide open. 
and the two men rushed in, not knowing what horrors to expect. Mr. Davis! Uh, Mr. Davis! Mr. Davis! When they came to the little room which served as a parlor... Oh! Bless us and save us! What oh, they look! Oh, oh, look! Oh, they would not forget oh, the sight for the rest oh, of their oh, lives. In the very darkest well, there, in the center of the room... The work of the devil's own devil! ...was a table that had been set up as a kind of altar or place of torture and stretched across his feet in clamps attached to the foot and his wrists held at the corners above his head, spread out, naked, facing upward, lay Mr. Davis, his body almost in shreds from a whip which lay beside him, a tangle of blood and flesh. But the worst of it, oh, the worst of it, the work of the axe. Just below the breastbone, the body had been sliced. As far down and torn open, and inside the axe had hacked and slashed away. A part of the spine stuck up, but nothing else was recognizable except the blood. Oh, the blood everywhere. And the strangest thing of all. Do you see that? The face, Woodman. Oh, I, sir. The most horrible part. The mark on it. The eyes staring up. Oh. The mouth open into a terrible grin. Oh. oh. Did you see that twitch? Yes. The man. The man can't still be alive. Oh, no. Really? And, and, and trying to speak, it seemed. Oh. Both men leaned close to hear and swore later what they heard. Though no one could make sense of it. They swore, they saw the mouth move, and the words barely audible come forth. <sighs> Again. Again. More. More. <sighs> Now, Fanny, you're shivering, dear, and so close to the fire. Uh, you should fetch your woolly from upstairs, dear. No, no, Granny. I'm not cold. Well, here, you put Granny's shawl around you anyway. That's it. Now, well, did, did they bury Mr. Davis? Did, did they bury Mr. Davis? Oh, that they did. And his young man together. That very night, but not in hallowed ground, as Parson White would have none of that, but up on the hill. And it was no proper burial either. Some of the men just dug a hole large enough and gathered rocks. Oh, only those few men needed for the task were there. They heard the bell. It's not coming from the church, Parson. No, we can all hear. It's coming from inside the hill. For the coming of them of their own. Aye, Parson. And when we dug the grave, we could swear but for the darkness and only the candles lighting. We struck things that screamed and pulled themselves deeper into the earth. Oh, we, we've no place here. This isn't the Lord's ground. Quickly now, throw the bodies in. Come on, we talk, Sovereign. Let me away now, come on. And they did. But it wasn't exactly the end of the story. What, what happened then, Granny? What's that sound, Granny? Do you hear it? Ah, the sound. I'm coming to that. Well, next morning, some of the town folks passing by saw those strange black patches on the road leading up the hill like a trail. 
They look to be alive, like. Oh, how could they be? But they sure so. And when they went closer. Oh, God preserve us. Flies. Thousands of huge flies. Oh, look what they've been feeding on. Patches of blood filling with bodies that were rolled out now. Why? Where did they come from? Well, there's never been so many flies about. Oh, look. Lift it up all along. Oh, the sky is black. Oh, 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 They found the women, swollen beyond recognition, almost changed in shape, you might say, looking more like them horrible half-animal monsters you see pictures of in ancient books. But almost as fast as they came, they were gone, the blood clean from the road, and as some folks swore, taken back. By the flies into the hill. Now, Charles. Yes, Granny. And Fanny. Yes, Granny. Now, I want you to pay special attention to what I'm going to tell you. You remember my saying about them blackberry bushes? Not to pick a single blackberry? Yes, yes, Mm. Granny. Well, from what I'm going to tell you now, you can judge for yourself. Now, I said those flies went back into the hill, or wherever they came from. But that wasn't the end of it. Some of them is always seen about up there. And it was one day, while I was courting your grandfather, we were walking up there among those very bushes, and one of them berries, at least I thought it was, I felt the sting that couldn't open my hand. Now I can only say what I know. A numbness went over me. I heard sounds. Then something like a terrible whip. I can't remember all that happened. But your grandfather says he had to hold me from doing things. And it was his own words that the very devil had gotten into me. Open my hand and wipe the awful insect away. I couldn't tell whether the blood had come from me or the demon itself. So you don't mind what I say and find your blackberries down in the hollow near the creek. Oh, but, but look at the time. Off with you. Off with you to bed. Oh, oh Granny. Granny. Off with you now. Granny, can can we have a candle tonight? A candle? Certainly not. Now, off with you and, and Granny will come and tuck you in later. Go on. Oh, oh Granny. And Charles. Charles, Charles, don't you frighten your sister up there in the dark or there'll be no more stories for you. Tonight, a tale about a common household. 
household pet in a very pestilent household. The events were related to us by an old gentleman picked up in a London street near Holborn. He seemed to have suffered a fall, and as he lay close to death, he couldn't get the story out of his mind. Listen now as our gentleman lives Anthony Verco's adventure of the fly one last time. It was sickening weather. A typical English summer. All day long, the rain had padded on the rooftops and poured in a gurgling stream into the street gutters of the city. The dome of St. Paul's lay enveloped in a great black cloud. The whole sky to the west was angry and dark. The foreboding... Uh, towards the dusk, the rain was east for a while, and I crept out in the crude shelter of an arch to find some more tempting spot in which to spend the night. Uh, not that it was cold. Far from it, the atmosphere was almost tropically oppressive and grew worse as still the thunder held off. Uh, but I was sick and faint from want of food, and longed with all the fever of despair for a clean, soft bed and a palatable fare for a finely had in the checks. It was while I dragged myself painfully in the direction of High Holborn that I first saw the house. Would that I had been mercifully obliterated at that moment by some passing glory rather than live to repeat this tale. It was a little old-fashioned dwelling but many that are to be seen in the district. Relics of the living in the time. It snapped at my misery through its diamond pain windows, challenging me. The unnoticed was plastered across the signboard between from the portal, bearing the heaven sent words to let. To let. The hour was late. The street practically deserted. My head seemed to reel under the weight of the unexploded storm. As if to aid me in making up my mind, a large splash of rain as big as a penny fell with a soft plop onto my forehead. As warm and sticky like the night outside. And, and I hesitated no longer. Within that smirking, self-satisfied, wise old house lay refuge from the deluge which threatened me. Cautiously. I approached the door. It was locked, of course. I examined the window fastenings on the ground floor window and cursed my usual bad luck. Then a weakness in the lead round one of the diamonds caught my attention. I glanced quickly to the right and left. The policeman at the corner of his back to me. Two couples hurried by. Another quick look. I was unobserved. A tinkle of breaking glass, a thrust of the arm, a turn of the wrist, and the window was open. Open. And beckoning. I scrabbled with my hands on the window ledge and painfully drew myself up. The effort cost me what little strength I'd left. But at last, I lay exhausted, though triumphant inside. Uh, I don't know how long I remained there, gasping on the floor, my heart hammering, my breast, my temples knocking. It may have been an hour. Only a few moments, maybe I fainted. Remember, I had had no food for three days. Uh, but at last I rose, to closed the window again to avoid suspicion, and felt in my pockets for an odd match. I struck it. Then, at what its light revealed, I nearly dropped it. Uh, the room was furnished. I 
splendidly furnished, but in a style three centuries old. A seventh old candelabra gleamed in the metallic on the mantel, and I hurried to apply my wavering match to it that I might see better. Oh. I held my hand over the flame, thinking that my weakness was playing tricks with me. Uh, oh, but no, it was true, it was true. I, a hungry, homeless vagabond, had found sanctuary in a home beyond my wildest dreams. An antiquary's paradise. And um, carrying my candelabra, uh, I advanced to the door. Then, uh, then on the threshold I halted. A uh, sudden fear had shaken me. The house I had seen from outside had looked bare and empty. There had been that toilet sign to confirm its appearance. This house, on the contrary, was comfortably, even sumptuously furnished. And it had the feel of a house that is lived in. Uh, suppose I made a mistake. Suppose in my feeble and overwrought state I had broken into the wrong house. Uh, I could expect little mercy at the hands of the occupants. Uh, there was a policeman at the corner, and I, I was virtually a burglar. Uh, I realized how tame my excuses would sound as they hauled me off of them to the station. A uh, prison, yeah. Yeah, there was always shelter there. But my old pride had always forbidden me to avail myself of it. Uh, pride. <laughs> pride in my condition. Uh, and then. And then I first heard it. Uh, it seemed to come from within my brain. Low pitched, buzzing. And I began to wonder what new trick my failing strength was playing me. But the sound rolled on, sometimes increasing, sometimes decreasing. Now I became conscious that the room was growing warmer. I, I swayed a little and stretched out my hand to the door. It opened easily. And a moment later, I stood in the hall. Almost immediately, I realized that the buzzing had stopped. By, by the light of my candles, I marked a little door in the passage, which presumably led to the kitchen, and staggered towards it. Uh, there might food lie. And the long flight of oak stairs, trembling upwards, I disregarded the fear of, of, of waking the householder. Cautiously, I pushed open the little door. And stepped through. I, I was in a kind of parlor. And beyond, and through another door, I could see the kitchen. And I lifted my candelabra and gazed about me. To my right, a second door showed me where the, where the housekeeper slept. I looked to my left. Ah, spread on a small oak table was the most delicious meal. I could have hoped for food, food, oh, food. I, I, I stumbled towards it and setting down the light, began to eat the uh, uh, ravenous meat. Uh, oh, oh, all moral scruples vanished at the sight of food. Uh, uh, I, I was a man. I was starving, so none would deny me the means to stay these gnawing pangs. Uh, 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 and then it came again. A low, continuous buzzing. But not in the head this time. It was clear. The sound seemed to come from the housekeeper's room. I went to the house and, and approaching the door, I bent my head to the crack. It's the buzz. Buzzing. Yes, unmistakably it came from within. I put my eye to the keyhole. The room was in darkness. A queer temptation came to me to trace the sound to a source. And at risk of waking anyone who might be sleeping inside, I, I placed my hand on the knob and cautiously turned it. Almost immediately, the sound of buzzing stopped. Slowly, very slowly, I opened the door and peeped inside. Uh, uh, oh, then I think my heart froze. 
uh, stepped all the way across two chairs with a long wooden box whose shape filled me with an unnameable dread. Uh, two three branch candelabra stood with their fuel gutted out upon the floor. The lid of the coffin was off. At first, by my candlelight, I thought that the occupant of the coffin was a black man. Then, as I peered, horror stricken by my gruesome discovery, as the ghastly buzzing recommenced, it seemed as though a veil was stuck simultaneously from the corpse's face, leaving what had been mercifully hidden bare and all its festering corruption without a moment to gain. Ah, ah, I stepped back before the door, shutting my eyes to the white boldness of that beautifying thing in the coffin. But I held my breath to a stand, the stench that arose from it. Uh, then something got in the way, my foot was stumbled. The door down, flew out of my head, and I heard the door slam behind me. Uh, well, in the next instant, I was battling frenziedly with a monstrous, groaning, buzzing cloud of low eyes. It was a diseasing on the corpse. Madly, I figured it was not this. The whole room seemed alive with little hairy legs, with tiny stinky meat by the settle of my skin. <laughs> and all the time they kept up that hideous buzzing sound, and they were with their wings on the flashing. One of the birds, larger than the rest of the bus, which set up my lips, and now she saw two inserted leprous bodies in my mouth. <laughs> All of a sudden, I was beating on flashes in my mind, nauseating me. I struck savagely with my bare hands. Oh, it's a huge fat body, skulls in my cheeks and dropped. Uh, uh, <laughs> somehow, I gained the door. Uh, I opened it. Uh, I dropped my candelabra in my panic, and now panting uh, and sweating with fear. I called that road into the parlor. Oh. Uh, uh, as I heard the door of the bedroom slam to after me, I breathed a prayer of relief for my escape. Now, there had been something unnatural in the behavior of those flies. Something almost wickedly intelligent in the way they had attacked me. Their assault and ugly appearance of being carefully organized by a superior brain. By the mind of some great leader or, or, or general. Uh, the part of my light had broke in the darkness for the, for the little door which led to the hall. Oh, my, my fingers closed on the knob and turned it round, round, round at once, leaving uh, no resistance from the lock. Uh, while, while all the time it still fear crept up a spine, paralyzing the very thoughts. Something had happened to the cat. The knob was useless. I was locked in. Ah, madly, I, I shook and rattled with the doorknob. The time and again, I flung the pit of the weight of my waist. Body against the sturdy oak of that small, relentless door. Exhausting my newly gained strength and useless effort. Then, when all hope had nearly left me. Oh, then I in a flash out of the kitchen. Fool! I cursed my stupidity and, and stumblingly, I, I fumbled across the pitch dark parlor to the kitchen door. Oh, he, he assured me it would be a way of escape. I turned and, and shook my fist in the direction of those half human flies buzzing maddeningly behind that shut door. That other door. The door of death. Oh, oh, it was my body they wanted to drink live blood and taste live flesh. I felt it, I felt it. I'd known it there in that room when I fought them. Oh, well, but I would cheat them, I'd cheat them yet. Uh, I staggered across the threshold into the kitchen and made my way to the back door. Well, a big window yawned to the right of it. Flooding the place with a clear white moonlight. I tried the latch. Oh, blessed virgin, it turned, it turned. <laughs> but I ceased to laugh. Not, not, not a fraction of an inch with the door move either way. I strained and tugged and pulled. At last I felt round the edges of the door, and the mystery stood revealed. Sharp points of nails, placed at regular intervals, touched my fingers. My exit had been nailed up from the outside. But why? Why? Uh, even as I wondered, I heard the clanging of a bell somewhere in the street. I peered through the window. Uh, queer how different London looks by moonlight. Uh, 
I, I realized I, I was dating in a part of the city I, I had not known it existed. The houses opposite seemed almost to invade those on my side of the road. So narrow was the thoroughfare between. Decorated, too, they were. The black beams ornamented here and there with fantastic designs. While, while their gables lowered menacingly over my head, leaving but a strip of sky. Uh, again, that bell. Uh, near that this time. And with it, I, I could fancy I heard the scrape and bump of the heavy wheels over the cobbles. Uh, and a voice was calling something. Hoarse, melancholy voice. But the words eluded me. Uh, who could be selling things in Holborn at this time of night? Uh, but at least he might render the assistance if only I could attract his attention. Uh, yeah, I clambered on to a table which stood by the window and looked down. Uh, here, here, the street was on a lower level than in the front of the house. The jump would be difficult, uh, even dangerous. Uh, uh, the cart, the cart it was, rolled into view, drawn by a great black horse. A man was leading it, uh, and occasionally shouting his melancholy cry. Now uh, behind him on the car itself, another man was sitting, queerly silent, in uh, his whole attitude indicative of the deepest despair. Uh, there was a lantern on the table beside me, and finding another match, I lit it, moving it slowly from side to side in front of the window. Uh, so soon they would see it. They would stop their cart below me. And let me jump to the clean comfort of the open street. Oh, or anything rather than stay for the moment in the evil silence of this uncanny house. Ah, oh, he had seen me. He, he was looking up at the window. What was that he was calling? I smiled and I nodded, beckoning him nearer. And now his words came clearer. Bring out your dead. Bring out your dead. Uh, he, he pointed to the back of his great ponderous cart. It was full, heaped high with, with what? Oh, oh, shuddering, I saw that the tangled, torturous mass in the back of the cart was human freight, and the shaft of moonlight fell for an instant across them. But some were not dead. And yet, scarce understanding even then what it meant, I looked across at the darkened doorway of the houses opposite and gasped. Each door was marked with a large cross. The cross of despair. The cross of humanity. It was a cross of the plague. The car crumbled on, and I let it go. Uh, I was dazed with the meaning of it all. Uh, and I stepped back through three hundred years when I broke through the window of the house in Holborn. And I died outside when I lay under the arch in the pouring rain. And could this be my hell? Uh, uh, and even while I clasped my tortured head in my hands, I heard again that dread buzzing of the flies. Uh, the I tripped up to the kitchen door and held my lantern aloft. The groaning from the death chamber swelled louder than a swarm of bees. They were angry at being bought of their prey. The living prey that was so much rarer than the dead. The atmosphere in the parlor was stifling. And I longed for something to drink. I thought of the wine and food on the table in the corner. Uh, and then seeing it recoiled. Oh, had I really eaten that rising mass of great white worms? Oh, 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 had the food putrefied during the few minutes I had been out of the room? Oh, oh. Then something hummed triumphantly round my head, and out of reach. I turned and stared, hypnotized at what I saw. Watching me from its perch on a piece of rotten meat on the table was an enormous fat blowfly. 
There seemed to be something malevolent about its very immovability. And as I looked, it was joined by another and yet another. And now the burning became apparent within the parlor itself. Ah, I turned my head and stared at the bedroom door. Ah, but under a crack at the bottom of the door came an endless wriggling stream of fat, black bodies as big as nothing. One by one, they spread their wings and hung clumsily up to the table where they settled and fixed me. A ah, motionless dark mass behind the three leaders. Uh, there's a noise and the buzzing fills the thick atmosphere of the room. I looked what crept the room out. I out, almost in exultation, the fiendish delight at the way they had outwitted me. Uh, they formed up in companies, awaiting the signal to charge when I could only stare, stare, held spellbound by their uncanny discipline. <laughs> For a moment, there was a complete stillness. As the last of them joined the watching army. Then, then in a mass they rose. Ah, ah, and the room echoed to the shrill, savage beat of their wings. Ah, ah, I dropped the lantern and pan, fled into the kitchen while all about me the disease carrying vermin and buzzed and worms. Settling on my face, my neck, my ears. Ah, ah, I fought them off blindly. I by the window. Drop at least out of the street, but I did not hesitate. The plague was in the house. The bride carried the plague. The food I had eaten had been infected. I could feel a lump on my arm. And a curious feeling of nausea overcame me. Now, with my fair arm, I smashed the glass of the window. The tearing and beating down that led to be the pain by the maniac. I had the dread curse. I cheat the buzzing head. There they might feast on my body, but never whilst I drew breath. And I crashed headlong down into the Bring out your dead. Bring out your does cross the site of one of the many pits which harbor the bodies of the victims who died as a result of the great plague. But now it's time to break up our little gathering for this evening. We'll meet again real soon. Join us. Bring a friend. second story about a house is about a haunted house, written by Virginia Woolf.
looking for it. They're drawing the curtains, one might say, and so read on a page or two. Yeah. Now they've found it. One would be certain, stopping the pencil on the margin. And then, tired of reading, one might rise and see for oneself. Whisper. 
spring not to wake us. The ghostly couple seek their joy. Here we slept. This is without number. Waking in the morning. Silver between the trees. Upstairs. In the garden. When summer came. In winter snow time. Shutting far in the distance, gently knocking like the pulse of a heart. Nearer they come. Cease at the doorway. The wind falls. The rain slides silver down the glass. Our eyes darken. We hear no steps beside us. We see no lady spread her ghostly cloak. His hands shield the lantern. Look, sound asleep, love upon their lips. Stooping, holding that silver lamp above us. composed by Peter Winkler and technical production by John Whiting. In The Boarded Window, the first story you heard this evening by Ambrose Bierce, you heard Ben Jacopetti as the narrator, Amanda Folger as Janus, Eric Bowersfeld played Murlock, the music was performed by Carl Schrager, and the technical production was by John Whiting. And now... Good night.